Well, friend, in just a second. Complete Prime Minister's questions. There you go. Order! Order! Before I call the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I remind honourable members that copies of the budget resolutions will be available to them from the vote office in members' lobby and online at the end of the Chancellor's statement. I also remind honourable members that interventions are not taken during the Chancellor's statement, nor during the replies of the Leader of the Opposition or indeed of the spokesman for the Scottish National Party. I'm hoping that the hubbub on my right here is going to, going to die down and some politeness will prevail before I call the Chancellor. Mr Chancellor of the Exchequer. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, as we mourn the tragic loss of life in Israel and Gaza, the Prime Minister reminded us last week of the need to fight extremism and heal divisions. So I start today by remembering the Muslims who died in two world wars in the service of freedom and democracy. We need a memorial to honour them, so following representations from the Right Honourable Member for Bromsgrove and others, I have decided to allocate £1 million towards the cost of building one. Whatever your faith or colour or class, this country will never forget the sacrifices made for our future. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, in recent times the UK and the UK economy has dealt with a financial crisis, a pandemic and an energy shock caused by war in Europe. Yet despite the most challenging economic headwinds in modern history, under Conservative government since 2010, Growth has been higher than every large European economy. <laughs> Unemployment has halved. Absolute poverty has gone down. And there are 800, and there are 800 more people in jobs for every single day that we have been in office. Of course. Of course, interest rates remain high as we bring down inflation. But because of the progress we have made, because we are delivering the Prime Minister's economic priorities, we can now help families, we can now help families not just with temporary cost of living support, but with permanent cuts in taxation. We do this. We do this to give much needed help in challenging times, but also because Conservatives know lower taxes mean higher growth. And higher growth, and higher growth means more opportunity, more prosperity, and more funding for our precious public services. But if we want, if we want that growth, uh, the Chancellor has hardly said anything. <laughs> order! Order! You can't get excited yet. Now, no. other people want to hear what the Chancellor has to say, yeah. and it's matters. So, we'll have a bit of good behaviour, please. Chancellor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. If we want that growth, to lead to higher wages and higher living standards for every family in every corner of the country. It cannot come from unlimited migration. It can only come by building a high-wage, high-skill economy, not just higher GDP, but higher GDP per head. And that is the difference with the party opposite. Their plans destroy jobs, reduce opportunities, and risk family finances with spending that pushes up taxes. Instead of going back to square one, the policies I announce today mean more investment, more jobs, better public services and lower taxes in a budget for long-term growth. And Madam Deputy Speaker, I start with the updated forecasts from the OBR 
for which I thank Richard Hughes and his team. First, inflation. When the Prime Minister and I came to office, it was 11 per cent. The latest figures show. I know the party opposite struck. No, this is not amusing anymore. We need to hear what the Chancellor has to say. Uh, I can tell who's making the noise, and you simply won't get a chance to speak later. So that's the end of it. <laughs> Chancellor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. When the Prime Minister and I came to office, inflation was 11 per cent, but the latest figures show it is now 4 per cent, more than meeting our pledge to halve it last year. And today's forecasts from the OBR show it falling below the 2 per cent target in just a few months' time, nearly a whole year earlier than forecast in the autumn statement. That didn't happen by accident. Whatever the pressures and whatever the politics, a Conservative government working with the Bank of England will always put sound money first. But, but we, also, we also understand that tackling inflation, while necessary, is painful. It means higher interest rates and a period of lower growth. So we've given the average household £3,400 in cost of living support over the last two years. Doing so makes economic as well as moral sense. The OBR predicted real household disposable income per person would fall by 2% in the last year. Instead, after this support, it is on track to rise by 0.8%. And today I take further steps to help families with cost of living pressures starting with measures to help the poorest families. We've already abolished higher charges for electricity paid by those on prepayment meters, increased the local housing allowance, and raised benefits by double expected inflation. Today I focus on those falling into debt. Nearly one million households on universal credit take out budgeting advance loans to pay for more expensive emergencies like boiler repairs or help getting a job. To help make such loans more affordable, I have today decided to increase the repayment period for new loans from 12 months to 24 months. <laughs> for some people, I thought they cared about people on the lowest income. the Labour Party not to want to hear about debt. For some people, the best way to resolve debt is through a debt relief order. But getting one costs £90, which can deter the very people who need them the most. So having listened carefully to representations from Citizens Advice, I today relieve pressure on around 40,000 families every year by abolishing the £90 charge completely. Yeah. Next, the Household Support Fund. It was set up on a temporary basis and due to conclude at the end of this month. Having listened carefully to representations from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, the Trussell Trust, and honourable members from East Ham, Colchester, Ryslip, Northwood and Pinner, and Suffolk Coastal, amongst others, I have decided that with the battle infl against inflation still not over, now is not the time to stop the targeted help it offers. We will therefore continue it at current levels for another six months. Yeah. Next, I turn to a measure that will help businesses and households more broadly. In the autumn statement, I froze alcohol duty until August of this year. Without any action today, it would have been due to rise by 3%. But I've listened carefully to my right hon. friends from Altrincham and Sale West, the Vale of Glamorgan, and my right honourable friend from Murray, who is a formidable champion of the Scottish whisky industry. I also listened to Councillor John Tonks from Ash, a strong supporter of the wonderful Admiral pub, who pointed out the pressures facing the industry. So today I have decided to extend the alcohol duty freeze until February 2025. This benefits 38,000 pubs across the UK, and on top of the £13,000 saving a typical pub will get 
from the 75 percent business rates discount I announced in the autumn. We value our hospitality industry and are backing the great British pub. Another cost that families and businesses worry about is fuel. Now, the Shadow Chancellor complained about the freeze on fuel duty, and Labour has opposed it at every opportunity. The Labour Mayor of London wants to punish motorists even more with his ULES plans, but lots of families and sole traders depend on their car. If I did nothing, fuel duty would increase by 13 per cent this month. So instead, I've listened to my right honourable friends for Stoke-on-Trent North, Dudley North, Witham and others, as well as the Sun newspaper's Keep It Down campaign. I have, as a result, decided to maintain the 5 PE cut and freeze fuel duty for another 12 months. This will save the average car driver £50 next year and bring total savings since the 5p cut was introduced to around £250. Taken together with the alcohol duty freeze, this decision also reduces headline inflation by 0.2 percentage points in 24-5, allowing us to make faster progress towards the Bank of England's 2% target. Madam Deputy Speaker, there can be no solid growth without solid finances. An economy based on sound money does not pass its bills to the next generation. When it comes to borrowing, some believe there is a trade-off between compassion and fiscal responsibility. They are wrong. It is only because we responsibly reduce the deficit by 80 per cent between 2010 and 2019 that we could provide £370 billion to help businesses and families in the pandemic. The party opposite opposed our plans to reduce the deficit every single step of the way. But in fairness, in fairness they were consistent. The Lib Dems supported controlling spending in coalition but now say they would prop up a party that will turn on the spending tax. It's the difference between no plan and no principles. And I'm delighted the right honourable gentleman from the Lib Dems was here to hear it for once. Today, we say something different. There is nothing compassionate about running out of money. With the pandemic behind us, we must once again be responsible and build up our resilience to future shocks. That means bringing down borrowing so we can start to reduce our debt. And today's figures confirm that is happening. Ahead of my first autumn statement in 22, the OBR forecast headline debt would rise to above 100% of GDP. Today, they will say it will fall in every year to just 94% by 28-29. Underlying debt, which excludes Bank of England debt, will be 91.7% in 24-5, according to the OBR, then 92.8%, 93.2%, 93.2% .2 before falling to 92.9% in 28-29, with final year headroom against debt falling of £8.9 billion. Our underlying debt is therefore on track to fall as a share of GDP, meeting our fiscal rule. And we continue to have the second lowest level of government debt in the G7, lower than Japan, France or the United States. We also meet our second fiscal rule for public sector borrowing to be below 3% of GDP three years early. Borrowing falls from 4.2% of GDP in 2023-4 to 3.1%, 2.7%, 2.3%, 1.6% 1.2% and 1.2% in 2028-29. By the end of the forecast, borrowing is at its lowest level of GDP since 2001. None of that, of course, 
would be possible if Labour implemented their pledge to decarbonise the grid five years early by 2030. By their own calculations, that costs £28 billion a year to do. But last month, after flip-flopping for months, they said they said they're not going to spend the £28 billion after all, but somehow they'll meet their pledge. Somehow, Madam Deputy Speaker, can only mean one thing. Tax rises on working families. Same old Labour. Today, in contrast, a Conservative government brings down taxes with borrowing broadly unchanged. In fact, borrowing is slightly lower than the autumn statement. And the fact that we are bringing borrowing down is something of particular importance to one very special person. Sir Robert Stayman is the outgoing Chief Executive of the Government's Debt Management Office, and after 20 years of exceptional public service, he is in the gallery. Thank you, Sir Robert. I now turn to growth. Just after I became Chancellor, the OBR expected GDP to fall by 1.4 per cent in the following year. In fact, it grew, albeit slowly. Now the OBR expects the economy to grow by 0.8 per cent this year and 1.9 per cent next year, 0.5 per cent higher than their autumn forecast. After that, growth rises to 2.2 per cent, 1.8 per cent and 1.7 per cent in 2028. Since 2010, they don't want to hear this, but these are the facts. Since 2010, we have grown faster than Germany, France or Italy, the three largest European economies. And according to the IMF, we will continue to grow faster than all three of them in the five years ahead. Surveys by Lloyds and Deloitte show business confidence is returning. In other words, because we have turned the corner on inflation, we will soon turn the corner on growth. And today's OBR forecasts also show that we have made good progress on the Prime Minister's three economic priorities. Compared to when the three pledges were made, inflation has halved, debt is falling in line with our fiscal rules, and growth is fully one and a half percentage points higher than predicted. And as growth returns, they don't have a growth plan, so they might as well listen to ours. As growth returns, our plan is for economic growth not sustained through migration, but one that raises wages and living standards for families, not just higher GDP, but higher GDP per head, and that means sticking to our plan with a budget for long-term growth, more investment, more jobs, better public services and lower taxes. And I start with investment. Economists say that stimulating investment is the most effective way to raise productivity and therefore wages and living standards. Since 2010, we've been doing just that. Business, well, you might want to listen to what I'm about to say because, because, because business investment has risen from an average of 9.3% of GDP under Labour to 9.9% under the Conservatives. And this year it will be 10.6% of GDP. That is £30 billion more business investment than if it had continued at Labour levels. And it's still going up. In the short period since the autumn statement, Nissan have announced they'll build two new electric car models in the UK. Microsoft and Google have announced data centres worth over £3 billion. Thanks to my right hon. Friend, the Business Secretary, the Global Investment Summit unlocked £30 billion of investment. In fact, since 2010, Greenfield Foreign Direct Investment has been higher than anywhere else in Europe. And for the last three years, we have been the third highest in the world after the United States and China. And we're not stopping there. In the autumn statement, I announced we would introduce permanent full expensing, a £10 billion tax cut for businesses that gives the UK the most attractive investment tax regime of any large European or G7 country. It was welcomed by over 200 business leaders, with the CBI saying it was a game-changer 
and the single most transformational thing we could do to fire up the British economy. And today I take further steps to boost investment. Having listened to calls from the CBI, Make UK and the BCC, we'll shortly publish draft legislation for full expensing to apply to leased assets, a change I intend to bring in as soon as it's affordable. We'll also help small businesses, something close to my own heart, as well as the business rate support and work on prompt payments I announced in the autumn, I'll provide £200 million of funding to extend the recovery loan scheme as it transitions to the growth guarantee scheme, helping 11,000 SMEs access the finance they need. And following representations from the Federation of Small Business, as well as honourable members for Loughborough, South End West and Rother Valley, I will reduce... I will reduce the administrative and financial impact of VAT by increasing the VAT registration threshold from £85,000 to £90,000 from April 1st, the, the first increase in seven years. That will bring tens of thousands of businesses out of paying VAT altogether and encourage many more to invest and grow. I now move to measures to address historic underinvestment in our nations and regions. Since we started levelling up since we started levelling up in 2019, two thirds of all new salaried jobs have been created outside London and the South East. We have announced 13 investment zones and 12 free ports which continue to attract investment, including recently, thanks to the efforts of Mayor Ben Houchen from the from the NUMA Group, who are investing £15 million into the Tees Valley Investment Zone. Today, working with the Leveling Up Secretary, I devolve further power to local leaders who are best placed to promote growth in their areas. I can announce the North East Trailblazer devolution deal, providing a package of support for the region potentially worth over £100 million. I'll devolve powers to Buckinghamshire, Warwickshire and to the most beautiful county in England, Surrey. Uh, I see the Leader of the Opposition smiling because, like me, he is a Surrey boy. I know he's been, I know he's been taking advice from Lord Mandelson, who yesterday rather uncharitably <laughs> said he needed to shed a few pounds. Ordinary families will shed more than a few pounds if that lot get in. Today, today if, he, if he wants to join me on my marathon training, he's most welcome as well. Today, we continue to spread opportunity throughout the country by allocating £100 million of levelling up funding to areas including High Peak, Dundee, Conway, Erewash, Redditch and Coventry to support cultural projects in these communities. <laughs> alongside support for capital projects across the country, including in Bingley. We are expanding the long-term plan for towns to 20 new places, including Darlington, home of the Treasury's fantastic Darlington Economic Campus, Coleraine, Peterhead, Runcorn, Harlow, Eastbourne, Arbroath and Rill, providing each with £20 million of funding to invest in community regeneration over the next decade. We will provide £15 million in new funding to the West Midlands Combined Authority to support culture, heritage and investment projects on the recommendation of our go-getting Mayor Andy Street. And we will allocate £5 million to renovate hundreds of local village halls across England so they can remain at the heart of their communities. And because this is a Conservative and Unionist government, we will also set aside funding to support the Saxevoord Spaceport in Shetland, an agri-food launch pad in Mid Wales, and funding to support Northern Ireland's businesses to expand global trade and investment opportunities. As a result of the decisions we take today, the Scottish Government will receive nearly £300 million in Barnet consequentials, with nearly £170 million for the Welsh Government and £100 million for the Northern Ireland Executive. I, I do appreciate that a tax cutting budget is very uncomfortable for the biggest tax risers in the United Kingdom. 
we also, we also want to level up opportunity across the generations, including building more houses for young people. And we're on track to deliver over a million homes in this Parliament. Last week, the Leveling Up Secretary allocated £188 million to support projects in Sheffield, Blackpool and Liverpool. And today I go further, allocating £242 million of investments in Barking Riverside and Canary Wharf, which together will build nearly 8,000 houses, as well as transforming Canary Wharf into a new hub for life science companies. We're launching a new £20 million community-led housing scheme supporting local communities to deliver the developments they want and need. And I'm pleased to announce the next steps for Cambridge to reach its potential to be the world's leading scientific powerhouse. I confirm there will be a long-term funding settlement for the Future Development Corporation in Cambridge at the next spending review, with over £10 million invested in the coming year to unlock delivery of crucial local transport and health infrastructure. The final levelling up measures I announced today support North Wales, where I have many happy childhood memories, in mould, following representations from the Honourable Member for the Vale of Clwyd. We will help fund the renovation of Theatre Clwyd. And I can announce this week the Government has reached agreement on a £160 million deal with Hitachi to purchase the Wilfer site in Innes Marne and the Olbu site in South Gloucestershire. Innes Marne has a vital role in delivering our nuclear ambitions, and no one should take more credit for today's announcement than my tireless, tenacious, and turbocharged honourable friend. More investment by large businesses, more support for small businesses, promoting investment in our nations and regions, all part of a budget for long-term growth that sticks to our plan to deliver more jobs, better public services and lower taxes. I now turn to one of the most powerful ways to attract investment, namely supporting our most innovative industries. Outside the US, we have the most respected universities, the biggest financial services sector, and the largest tech ecosystem in Europe. We have double the AI startups of anywhere in Europe, double the venture capital investment, and a tech economy now double the size of Germany and three times the size of France. We're on track to become the world's next Silicon Valley. In today's budget for long-term growth, I take further steps to attract investment into our technology-related industries. I want our brilliant tech entrepreneurs not just to start here, but to stay here, including when the time comes for a stock market listing. So we'll build on the Edinburgh and Mansion House reforms to unlock more pension fund capital. We'll give new powers to the Pensions Regulator and Financial Conduct Authority to ensure better value from defined contribution schemes by judging performance on overall returns, not cost. We'll make sure there are vehicles to make it easier for pension funds to invest in UK growth opportunities. So I'm today publishing the names of the winners of the Lifts competition. But I remain concerned that other markets, such as Australia, generate better returns for pension savers with more effective investment strategies and more investment in high-quality domestic growth stocks. So I will introduce new requirements for DC and local government pension funds to disclose publicly their level of international and UK equity investment. And I'll then consider what further action should be taken if we're not on a positive trajectory towards international best practice. I also want to create opportunities for a new generation of retail investors to engage with public markets. So we'll proceed with the retail sale for part of the government's remaining NatWest shares this summer at the earliest opportunity, subject to supportive market conditions and value for money. We'll continue to explore how savers could be allowed to take their pension pots with them when they change job. We'll make it easier for people to save for the long term with a new British savings bond delivered through National Savings and Investment, offering savings, savers a guaranteed rate fixed for three years. And today, following calls from over 200 representatives of the city and our high growth sectors, I will reform the ISA system 
to encourage more people to invest in UK assets. After a consultation on its implementation, I will introduce a brand new British ISA, which will allow an additional £5,000 annual investment for investments in UK equity with all the tax advantages of other ISAs. And this will be on top of the existing ISA allowances, ensure British savers can benefit from the growth of the most promising UK businesses, as well as supporting those businesses with the capital to expand. I turn now to our other growth industries, starting with clean energy. We want nuclear to provide up to a quarter of our electricity by 2050. And as part of that, I want the UK to lead the global race in developing cutting-edge nuclear technologies. I can therefore announce that Great British Nuclear will begin the next phase of the small modular reactor selection process, with companies now having until June to submit their initial tender responses. Our brilliant Energy Security and Net Zero Secretary will also allocate up to £120 million more to the green industry's growth accelerator to build supply chains for new technology, ranging from offshore wind to carbon capture and storage. By January of next year, as promised in the autumn statement, we'll have a new faster connections process to the grid up and running. In advanced manufacturing, we've announced a further £270 million of investment into innovative new automotive and aerospace R&D projects, building the UK's capabilities in zero emission vehicle and clean aviation technologies. And I now turn to our creative industries. We have become Europe's largest film and TV production centre, with Idris Elba, Keira Knightley and Orlando Bloom all filming their latest productions here. Studio space in the UK has doubled in the last three years, and at the current rate of expansion, next year we'll, we will be second only to Hollywood globally. In the autumn statement, I committed to providing more tax relief for visual effects in film and high-end TV. I can today confirm that we will increase the rate of tax credit by 5% and remove the 80% cap for visual effects costs in the audiovisual expenditure credit. Having worked closely with the Culture Secretary and listened carefully to representations from companies like Pinewood, Warner Brothers and Sky Studios, we will provide eligible film studios in England with a 40% relief on their gross business rates until 2034. And having heard representations from the British film industry PACT and indeed the Prime Minister, we will introduce a new tax credit for UK independent films with a budget of less than £15 million. For our creative industries more broadly, we will provide £26 million of funding to our preeminent theatre, the National Theatre, to upgrade its stages. And today, I particularly want to recognise the contribution of our creative industries and the tourism that comes from orchestras, museums, galleries and theatres. In the pandemic, we introduced higher 45% and 50% levels of tax relief, which were due to end in March 25. They have been a lifeline for performing arts across the country. Today, in recognition of their vital importance to our national life, I can announce I am making those tax reliefs permanent at 45% for touring and orchestral productions and 40% for non-touring productions. Lord Lloyd Webber says this will be a once-in-a-generation transformational change that will ensure Britain remains the global capital of creativity. I suspect the new theatre release may be of particular interest to the Shadow Chancellor, who seems to fancy her thespian skills when it comes to acting like a Tory. The, the trouble is, we all know how her show ends. Higher taxes, like every Labour government in history. I am delighted they are cheering the fact that Labour governments always put up taxes. They're right. Um, and I also want to mention, I want to mention, I want to mention our life sciences sector, where we will support research by medical charities into diseases such as 
cancer, dementia and epilepsy with an additional £45 million, including £3 million for Cancer Research UK. But I have long believed we should be manufacturing medicines as well as developing them. So I can today also announce a brand new investment by one of our greatest life science companies, AstraZeneca, led by mon ami, the irrepressible Sir Pascal Soirio. AstraZeneca made their COVID vaccine available to developing countries at cost, as a result saving over six million lives. And today, because of the government's support for the life sciences sector, they announced plans to invest £650 million in the UK to expand their footprint on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus and fund the building of a vaccine manufacturing hub in Speak in Liverpool. More investment, better jobs in every corner of the country in a long-term budget for growth from a Conservative government. One of the biggest barriers to investment is businesses not being able to hire the staff they need. The economy today has around 900,000 vacancies. It would be easy to fill them with higher migration, but with over 10 million adults of working age who are not in work, that would be economically and morally wrong. Those who can work should. And this is an issue that I have tackled in every budget and autumn statement I have delivered. A year ago, I abolished the Pensions Lifetime Allowance, which pushed doctors and others to take early retirement. Ask any doctor what they think about Labour's plans to bring it back, and they will say, don't go back to square one. In the autumn, in the autumn with the help of our superb Work and Pensions Secretary, we announced the Back to Work Plan, which will support one million adults with medical conditions and reduce the number of people assessed as not needing to work by two-thirds. A year ago, I also announced the biggest ever expansion of childcare, extending the 30-hour free childcare offer. Uh, just listen. Extending the 30-hour free, the free childcare offer to all children of working parents from nine months. We've not had a childcare plan from Labour, so you might want to listen to ours. Our plan, our plan will mean an extra 60,000 parents enter the workforce in the next four years, a tremendous achievement for the Education Secretary, who I think is doing an effing good job. And today, following representations from many people, including the CBI, uh, I announce measures to support the childcare sector make the new investments it now needs to. So I am guaranteeing the rates that will be paid to childcare providers to deliver our landmark offer for children over nine months old for the next two years. That is more people in work, more jobs, sticking to our plan in a long-term budget for growth. And I now turn to public services. I thought they were supposed to be interested in public services. I can wait. A little bit of murmuring is normal. I shouldn't be able to hear what you're saying over there. That is clearly out of order. Now, let's have some courtesy. <laughs> Chancellor. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Good public services need a strong economy to pay for them. But a strong economy also needs good public services. In 2010, Schools in the UK were behind Germany, France and Sweden in the OECD's PISA education rankings for reading and maths. Now, after Conservative reforms, we are ahead of them. Burglaries and violent crime have halved in the last 14 years after we invested in 20,000 more police officers. Our armed forces remain the most professional and best funded in Europe, 
With defence spending already more than 2% of GDP, we are providing more military support to Ukraine than nearly any other country, and our spending will rise to 2.5% as soon as economic conditions allow. The NHS is still recovering from the pandemic, but has 42,000 more doctors and 71,000 more nurses than it did under Labour. That is, that is 250 more doctors and 400 more nurses for every single month that we've been in office. Now, resources matter, of course. Which is why, despite all the economic shocks we have faced, overall spending on public services has gone up since 2010, in the case of the NHS by more than a third in real terms. But although spending has continued to rise every year, public sector productivity still remains below pre pandemic levels by nearly 6%. This demonstrates that the way to improve public services is not always more money or more people. We also need to run them more efficiently. We need, we need a more productive state, not a bigger state. In autumn 2022, I set day-to-day -day spending to increase by 1% a year in real terms over the next Parliament. Some say that is not enough and we should raise spending by more. Others say it is too much and we should cut it to improve efficiency. Neither are right. It is not fair to ask taxpayers to pay for more when public service productivity has fallen, nor would it be wise to reduce that funding given the pressures public services face. So I am keeping the planned growth in day-to-day -day spending at 1 per cent in real terms, but we are going to spend it better. So today, today, they don't have a plan for public services, like everything else. So why not listen to ours? Today, today I am announcing a landmark public sector productivity plan that restarts public service reform and changes the Treasury's traditional approach to public spending. And I start with our biggest and most important public service, the NHS. One of my greatest privileges was to be Health Secretary. Thanks to the NHS, I have three gorgeous children, the oldest of whom has been patiently listening in the gallery. The NHS is rightly the biggest reason most of us are proud to be British. But the systems that support its staff are often antiquated. Doctors, nurses and ward staff spend hours every day filling out forms when they could be <coughs> when patients do not show up. I do not like to interrupt the Chancellor. But... You are too close to me to be shouting that loudly. If you want to shout that loudly, you should come sit away up there. I apologise for interrupting the Chancellor. When patients do not show up or one member of a team is ill, operating theatres are left empty despite long waiting lists. Now, when we published the NHS long-term workforce plan, I asked the NHS to put together a plan to transform its efficiency and productivity. I wanted better care for patients, more job satisfaction for staff and better value for taxpayers. Making changes on the scale we need is not cheap. The investment needed to modernise NHS IT systems so they are as good as the best in the world costs £3.4 billion but it helps unlock £35 billion of savings, ten times that amount. So in today's budget for long-term growth, I have decided to fund the NHS productivity plan in full. Yeah. With that new investment, we will slash the 13 million hours lost by doctors and nurses every year to outdated IT systems. We will cut down and potentially halve form filling by doctors using AI. We will digitise 
operating theatre processes, allowing the same number of consultants to do an extra 200,000 operations a year. We will fund improvements to help doctors read MRI and CT scans more accurately and quickly, speeding up results for 130,000 patients every year and saving thousands of lives, something I know would have delighted my brother Charlie, who I recently lost to cancer. We will improve the NHS app so it can be used to confirm and modify all appointments, reducing up to half reducing up to half a million missed appointments annually and improving patient choice. We will set up a new NHS staff app to make it easier to roster electronically and end the use of expensive off-framework agencies. And as a result of this funding, all hospitals will use electronic patient records, making the NHS the largest digitally integrated healthcare system in the world. Today's announcement doubles the amount the NHS is investing on digital transformation over three years. And on top of this longer term transformation, we will also help the NHS meet pressures in the coming year with an additional £2.5 billion. This will allow the NHS to continue its focus on reducing waiting times and brings the total increase in NHS funding since the start of the Parliament to 13 per cent in real terms. The NHS was there for us in the pandemic, and today, with nearly £6 billion of additional funding, a Conservative Government is there for the NHS. The head of the NHS, Amanda Pritchard, today says that this investment shows the Government continues to back the NHS. She says that as a result of it, the NHS can commit to delivering 1.9 per cent annual productivity growth over the next Parliament, more than double the average productivity growth in public services between 2010 and 2019. But today is not just about the NHS. I want this groundbreaking agreement with the NHS to be a model for all our public services across education, the police, the courts and local government. I want to see more efficient, better value and higher quality public services. So today I can announce that in the next spending review, the Treasury will do things differently. We will prioritise proposals that deliver annual savings within five years, equivalent to the total cost of the investment required. And today we make a start with some excellent proposals. Violence reduction units and hotspot policing have prevented an estimated 136,000 knife crimes and other violent offences, as well as over 3,000 hospital admissions. Every crime costs money, so we will provide £75 million to roll that model out in England and Wales. Police officers waste around eight hours a week on unnecessary admin. With higher productivity, we could free the equivalent of 20,000 police officers over a year. So we will spend £230 million rolling out time and money saving technology, which speeds up police response times by allowing people to report crimes by video call and, where appropriate, use drones as first responders. Too many legal cases, particularly in family law, should never go to court and it would cost us less if they didn't. So we will spend £170 million to fund non-court resolution, reduce reoffending, and digitise the court process. Too many children in care end up being looked after by unregistered providers that are much more expensive. So we will invest £165 million over the next four years to reduce that cost by increasing the capacity of the children's homes estate. Special education need provision can be excellent when outsourced to independent sector schools, but also expensive. So we will invest £105 million over the next four years to build 50 new special free schools to create additional high-quality places and increase choice for parents. And we will also put in place a plan to realise the tens of billions of savings recommended in an excellent speech by the head of the National Audit Office. The OBR say a 5 per cent increase in public sector productivity would be the equivalent of around £20 billion in extra funding. With these plans, we can deliver that and more. And if we ensure they are cash-releasing savings, as we are committed to doing, it will be possible to live with more constrained spending growth 
without cutting services valued by the public. So, with the energy and drive of my talented Chief Secretary to the Treasury, we launch our public sector productivity plan in today's budget for long term growth more investment, more jobs, better public services, and one more thing lower taxes. Keeping taxes down matters to Conservatives in a way it never can for Labour. We believe that in a free society, the money you earn doesn't belong to the government, it belongs to you. And if we want to encourage hard work, we should let people keep as much of their own money as possible. Conservatives look around the world at economies in North America and Asia and notice that countries with lower taxes generally have higher growth. Now, economists argue about cause and correlation, but we know that lower taxed economies have more energy, more dynamism, and more innovation. And we know that's Britain's future too. Before I explain how we will bring down taxes. I start with some measures to make our system simpler and fairer. To discourage non-smokers from taking up vaping, we are today confirming the introduction of an excise duty on vaping products from October 26 and publishing a consultation on its design. Because vapes can also play a positive role in helping people quit smoking, we will introduce a one-off increase in tobacco duty at the same time to maintain the financial incentive to choose vaping over smoking. I will make a one-off adjustment to rates of air passenger duty on non-economy flights only to account for high inflation in recent years, and I will provide HMRC with the resources they need to ensure everyone pays the tax they owe, leading to an increase in revenue collected of over £4.5 billion across the forecast period. Next, I turn to property taxation. In recent months, following tenacious representation from the honourable members for St Austell and Newquay, North Devon, cities of London and Westminster, Torbay, and Truro and Falmouth, I have been looking closely at our furnished holiday lettings tax regime. I am concerned that this tax regime is creating a distortion meaning there are not enough properties available for long-term rental by local people. So to make the tax system work better for local communities, I'm going to abolish the furnished holiday lettings regime. I've also been looking at stamp duty relief for people who purchase more than one dwelling in a single transaction known as multiple dwellings relief. I see uh, the deputy leader of the Labour Party paying close attention. excitement we haven't actually heard because we can't hear what the Chancellor is trying to say. Okay, and I can hear who is shouting there. You won't get to speak later. Chancellor. I, I'm sorry to disappoint her, but multiple dwellings relief was not actually designed for her, uh, but intended to It, it was intended to support investment in the private rented sector, but an external evaluation found no strong evidence that it had done so and that it was being regularly abused, so I am going to abolish it. And finally, as part of this budget, both the Treasury, a part of uh, our look on property taxation, both the Treasury and the OBR have looked at the costs associated with our current levels of capital gains tax on property. They have concluded that if we reduced the higher 28% rate that exists for residential property, we would in fact increase revenues because there would be more transactions. For the first time in history, both the Treasury and the OBR have discovered their inner Laffer curve. <laughs> so, so today, 
So today I am going to so today I am going to reduce the higher rate of property capital gains tax from 28% to 24%. That really is for you, Angela. not having it from here. <laughs> Chancellor. Uh, I, I, I now turn to oil and gas. Unlike the party opposite, we want to encourage investment in the North Sea, so we will retain generous investment allowances for the sector. We will also legislate in the Finance Bill to abolish the energy profits levy should market prices fall to their historic norm for a sustained period of time after representations from the Honourable Member for Banff and Buchan. But because the increase in energy prices caused by the Ukraine war is expected to last longer, so too will the sector's windfall profits. So I will extend the sunset on the energy profits levy for an additional year to 2029, raising £1.5 billion. Next, next, I turn to the t- next, I turn to the taxes paid by those who are resident in the UK, but not domiciled here for tax purposes. This this is a category of people known as non-doms. Now, now, now Nigel Lawson wanted to end the non-DOM regime in his great tax reforming budget of 1988, which is where I suspect the Labour Party got the idea from. But I too have always believed that provided we protect the UK's attractiveness to international investors, those with the broadest shoulders should pay their fair share. After looking at the issue over many months, I have concluded that we can indeed We can indeed introduce a system which is both fairer and remains competitive with other countries. So the government will abolish the current tax system for non-DOMs, get rid of the outdated concept of domicile, and, and I aim to please all sides of the House in all my budgets. And we will, we will replace. Order, order, order. This is impossible. Can you just... Order. Could you please shout more quietly? <laughs> <laughs> Chancellor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We will replace the non-dom regime with a modern, simpler, and fairer residency-based system. From. April 25, new arrivals to the UK will not be required to pay any tax on foreign income and gains for their first four years of UK residency, a more generous regime than at present and one of the most attractive offers in Europe. But after four years, those who continue to live in the UK will pay the same tax as other UK residents. Recognising the contribution of many of these individuals to our economy, we will put in place transitional arrangements for those benefiting from the current regime. That will include a two-year period in which individuals will be encouraged to bring wealth earned overseas to the UK, where it can be spent and invested here, a measure that will attract onshore an additional £15 billion of foreign income and generate more than a £1 billion of extra tax. Overall, abolishing non-DOM status will raise £2.7 billion a year by the end of the forecast period. That is money the party opposite plan to use for spending increases, but today a Conservative government makes a different choice. We use that revenue to help cut taxes on working families.
and many of those families, Madam Deputy Speaker, depend on child benefit. But the way we treat child benefit in the tax system is confusing and unfair. It's a lifeline for many parents because it helps with the additional costs associated with having children, and when it works, it's good for children, good for parents, and good for the economy because it helps people into work. But we currently withdraw child benefit when one parent earns over £50,000 a year. That means two parents earning £49,000 a year receive the benefit in full, but a household earning a lot less than that does not if just one parent earns over £50,000. Today, I set out plans to end that unfairness. Doing so, doing so requires significant reform to the tax system, including allowing HMRC to collect household-level information. We will therefore consult on moving the high-income child benefit charge to a household-based system to be introduced by April 2026. Yeah. But, because, but because that is not a quick fix, I make two changes today to make the current system fairer. Following representations from my right honourable friends from Penistone and Stocksbridge, Carl Shalton and Wallington, Bassett Law and West Worcestershire, along with many others, I confirm that from this April the high income child benefit charge threshold will be raised from £50,000 to £60,000. We will raise the top of the taper, at which it is withdrawn, to £80,000. That means no one earning under £60,000 will pay the charge, taking 170,000 families out of paying it altogether. And because of the higher taper and threshold, nearly half a million families with children will save an average of £1,300 next year. According to the OBR, this change will see an increase in hours among the, amongst those already working uh, to the equivalent of 10,000 more people entering the workforce. More investment, more jobs, better public service and lower tax. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, there is one further set of changes I want to make today. The way we tax people's income is particularly unfair. If you get your income from having a job, you pay two types of tax, national insurance contributions and income tax. If you get it from other sources, you pay only one. This double taxation of work is unfair. The result is a complicated system that penalises work instead of encouraging it. If we are to build a high-wage, high-skill economy not dependent on migration, if we want to encourage people not in work to come back to work, we need a simpler, fairer tax system that makes work pay. That is why I cut national insurance contributions in the autumn. By reducing the penalty on work, the OBR said that tax cut would lead to the equivalent of 94,000 more people in work. In other words, it would fill more than one in ten vacancies throughout the economy. Lower taxes, more jobs and higher growth. Today, because of the progress we have made bringing down inflation, because of the additional investment that is flowing into the economy, because we have a plan for better and more efficient public services, and because we have asked those with the broadest shoulders to pay a bit more... Order. Mr Perkins. Yeah. I, I, can, I can manage. Thank you very much. Five times I've heard what you said. I let you away with it. Now that's enough. One more strike and you're out. Madam Deputy Speaker, I do know how hard it is for them to listen to arguments for lower taxes. But that, that is the difference. Uh, because we have asked those with the broadest shoulders to pay a bit more. Today, I go further. From April the 6th, employee national insurance will be cut by another 2p from 10% to 8%. And self-employed national insurance will be cut from 8% to 6%. It means an additional £450 a year 
for the average employee or £350 for someone self-employed, when combined with the autumn reductions, it means 27 million employees will get an average tax cut of £900 a year. Two million self-employed will get a tax cut averaging £650, changes that make our system simpler and fairer and changes that grow our economy by rewarding work. The OBR say, when combined with the autumn reduction, our national insurance cuts will mean the equivalent of 200,000 more people in work, filling one in five vacancies, adding 0.4% to GDP and 0.4% to GDP per head. This is the second fiscal event where we've reduced employee and self-employed national insurance. We've cut it by one-third in six months without increasing borrowing and without cutting spending on public services. That means the average earner in the UK now has the lowest effective personal tax rate since 1975. Their effective taxes are now lower than in America, France, Germany or any G7 country. Because Conservatives believe that making work pay is of the most fundamental importance. Because we believe that the double taxation of work is unfair, our long-term ambition is to end this unfairness when it is responsible, when it can be achieved without increasing borrowing, when it can be delivered without compromising high-quality public services. We will continue to cut national insurance, as we have done today, so we truly make work pay. Madam Deputy Speaker. We stick to our plan with a budget for long-term growth. It delivers more investment, more jobs, better public services and lower taxes. But dynamism in an economy doesn't come from ministers in Whitehall. It comes from the grit and determination of people who take risks, work hard and innovate. Not government policies, but people power. It is to unleash people power that we today put this country back on the path to lower taxes. A plan to grow the economy versus no plan. A plan for better public services versus no plan. A plan to make work pay versus no plan. Growth up, jobs up, taxes down. I commend this statement to the House. motion entitled Provisional Collection of Taxes must be decided without debate. Will the Chancellor of the Exchequer please move formally? The question is that pursuant to Section 5 of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act 1968, provisional statutory effect shall be given to the following motions. Stamp duty land tax, first time buyers relief, new leases acquired on Bayer Trust, motion number 8. Stamp duty land tax registered providers of social housing motion number nine. Stamp duty land tax purchases by public bodies motion number ten. Value added tax, late payment interest and repayment interest motion number twenty two. As members that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. Aye. Order, let me explain for the clarification of the House that this is the provisional point, which is the provisional question which is asked at this stage, and that all members will have the opportunity, having heard the debate in detail, to vote on each of these motions next Tuesday, the 12th of March, at the end of the budget debate. I would hesitate to have a division at this point when the House and the world is awaiting the response from the Leader of the Opposition. So I am I'm going to put this motion again 
And if it is very clear to me, if it is very clear to me that the eyes have more votes than the noes, I will take it on the voices. The question is, the question is, no, I don't need a point of order, thank you. We're in the middle of a division. Thank you. The question is that pursuant to Section 5 of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act, as I said a few moments ago, as many as are of that opinion say I. Oh! On the contrary, no. no. Division. 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 Clear the lobby. The question is that, pursuant to Section 5 of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act 1968, provisional statutory effect shall be given to the following motions. Stamp duty land tax, motion number 8. Stamp duty land tax, motion number 9. Stamp duty land tax, motion number 10. And value added tax, motion number 22. As mayors, that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Tell us for the eyes, Aaron Bell and Robert Largan. Tell us for the nose, Gavin Newlands and Kirsty Blackman.
Order! Order! The eyes to the right, 288. The nose to the left, 38. The eyes to the right, 288. The nose to the left, 38. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. We now come to the motion entitled Income Tax Charge. It is on this motion that the debate will take place today and on the succeeding days. The questions on this motion and on the remaining motions will be put at the end of the budget debate on Tuesday, the 12th of March. I call the Chancellor of the Exchequer to move the motion formally. The question is that income tax is charged for the tax year 2024 to 25, and it is declared that it is expedient in the public interest that this resolution should have statutory effect under the provisions of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act 1968. I call the Leader of the Opposition, Sir Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There we have it, the last desperate act of a party that has failed. Yeah. Britain in recession, the national credit card maxed out, and despite the measures today, the highest tax burden for 70 years. The first parliament since records began to see living standards fall, confirmed by this budget today. That is their record. It is still their record. Give with one hand and take even more with the other, and nothing they do between now and the election will change that. I mean, over 14 years, we've seen our fair share of delusion from the party opposite. A Prime Minister who thinks the cost of living crisis is starting to ease. An Education Secretary who thinks concrete crumbling on our children deserves her gratitude. A former Prime Minister who still believes crashing the pound was the right path for Britain. And today, a new entry in this Hall of Infamy, the Chancellor who breezes into this chamber in a recession and tells the working people of this country that everything's on track. Crisis? What crisis? Or, as the captain of the Titanic and the former Prime Minister herself might have said, iceberg? What iceberg? Smiling as the ship goes down, the Chuckle Brothers of Decline, dreaming of Santa Monica, or or maybe just a quiet life in Surrey, not having to self-fund his election. Whilst the crew behind them scrabble for TV news. If only it weren't so serious, because, Madam Deputy Speaker, the story of this Parliament is devastatingly simple. A Conservative Party stubbornly clinging to the failed ideas of the past, completely unable to generate the growth working people need, and forced by that failure to ask them to pay more and more for less and less. And as the desperation grows, They torch not only their reputation for fiscal responsibility, but any notion that they can serve the country, not themselves. Party first, country second, while working people pay the price. Food prices still 25% higher than they were two years ago. Rents up 10%. An extra £240 a month for a typical family remortgaging this year, because they lost control of the economy, they sent interest rates through the roof, they made working people pay. They should be under no illusion. That record is how the British people will judge today's cuts, because the whole country can see exactly what is happening here. They recognise a Tory con when they see it, just as they did in November. Give with one hand, take even more with the other. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, people have been living through this nonsense for 14 years. Yeah. Yeah. They know the thresholds are still frozen, dragging more and more people into higher taxes. Yeah. Yeah. They know that a Tory stealth tax is coming their way in the shape of their next council tax bill. Yeah, the, levelling, well, the levelling up secretary has told not just this house, but every house in the country he's coming for their council tax. Yeah. Give with one hand, go in the other. Yeah. But most insultingly of all, the British people know. The only cause that gets this lot out of bed is trying to save their own skin. Yeah. Take the desperate move after years of resistance yep. to finally accept Labour's argument on the non DOM yeah. tax ratio. Yeah. Has, has there ever been a more obvious example of a government that is totally bereft of ideas? Yeah. Yeah. And if they're sincere in support of this policy now, then the question they must answer today is, why did they not do it earlier? Yeah. Why did they not stand up to their friends, their funders and their family? Yeah. Because if they had followed Labour's example, 3.8 million extra operations would have taken place by now. 1.3 million emergency dental appointments, three breakfast clubs for nearly 4.5 million children. But if, instead, this is just another short-term cynical political gimmick, yeah. then honestly, what is the point of them? Yeah. What is the point of a party that is out of touch, out of ideas and nearly out of road? Yeah. And we saw it last year as well, when only Labour's policies on the cost of living made the difference. Yeah. Um, um, for those opposite, now a little downbeat about another intellectual triumph for social democracy, <laughs> I, 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 say, I say get used to it, because with this pair in charge, it won't be long before they ask you to defend the removal of private school tax relief as well. Yeah! But, Madam yeah! Deputy Speaker, the harder they try with cynical games like this, the worse it will get for them, because the whole country can see exactly who they are, yeah. fighting for themselves, politics not governing, party first, country second. Yeah. And Madam Deputy Speaker, because we have campaigned to lower the tax burden on working people for the whole parliament, and we won't stop now, we will support the cuts to national insurance today. But I noticed this. In 2022, when the Prime Minister was Chancellor, he made this promise. I can confirm in 2024, for the first time, the basic rate of income tax will be cut from 20 to 19 pence. Oh! Oh! Having, breathed, having breathed that all week, that an income tax was coming, that promise is in tatters today. And of course, we support the fresh investment in our NHS. Although I have to note that the Chancellor, when he was Health Secretary ten years ago, promised to make the NHS paperless by 2018. <laughs> because, and I know, I know the Prime Minister's fondness for Elon Musk extends to an enthusiastic embrace of his community notes on fact checking. So I'll say this bit slowly. Labour supports the fuel duty freeze. That is our policy. And I look forward to the Prime Minister's acknowledgement of that in coming days. Yeah. We do ask the Chancellor and can set out how we will make sure that this policy gets passed on to hard pressed families yeah. at the pump. Yeah. 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 Yet, Madam Deputy Speaker, for all the fanfare around the tax measures today, that straightforward story remains true. Taxes, a 70-year high. Yeah. The British people paying more for less. Yeah. An unprecedented hit to living standards of working people. Yeah. Yeah. The first time they've gone backwards over a parliament. Yeah. And they were cheering that today. Yeah. And the reason is equally simple. There is no plan for growth. Yeah. How can there be? He's, he can say long-term plan all he likes. We see the... Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, let's just, last year he announced 110 growth measures. He said we've turned the corner. Yeah. And where are we now? Britain in recession. Yeah. And 
economy smaller than when the Prime Minister entered Downing Street. The textbook definition of decline, that is their record. I mean, after 14 years, who do they actually think feels better off? Productivity is flat. Mortgages through the roof, yeah. house building off a cliff, yeah. worklessness rising and rising, yeah. homelessness never higher, yeah. crime virtually unpunished, children who can't see a dentist, yeah. sewage in our rivers, yeah. billions and billions of taxpayers' money wasted, yeah. seven billion by the Prime Minister on COVID fraud alone, yeah. five hundred million on the Rwanda scheme that has achieved precisely nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I can keep going a railway line that will never reach our great northern cities. In fact, it might not even reach central London. Billions upon billions for a white elephant without a trunk. (laughs) While today we learn taxpayers are picking up the bill for the science minister's libel. And all the time, all the time, one thing that is growing, the waiting list in RNHS, now nearly 8 million. They've had... 14 years, 14 years, running out of road. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is what decline looks like, and the complacency they've shown today. It takes your breath away. Britain deserves better than this. Britain deserves a real plan for growth, an end to 14 years of stagnation. Wealth creation across the whole of the country, higher living standards for working people. This is the mission we need. But yet again, what we got was the same tired old formula the sticking plasters, the chopping and changing, the party first, country second politics, with no repudiation of the utterly discredited idea that economic growth is something the few gift to the many. But even then, Madam Deputy Speaker, I think his backbenchers erode an explanation. Because when the Chancellor says Britain has grown more quickly than countries like Germany over the last 14 years, I'm sure they will be shocked to learn that this is a statistical sleight of hand. And when it comes to GDP per capita, in other words, the growth that makes the difference to the pockets of working people, their record is much worse. Indeed, in per capita terms, our economy has not grown since the first quarter of 2022, the longest period of stagnation Britain has seen since 1955. In fact, the Chancellor invited us to look at those figures. The OBR says GDP per capita will be three quarters of a percent lower in 2028 than was they forecast in November of last year. That was the number he said we should watch. Three quarters of a percent lower in 2028. And they can call this a technical recession, but there's nothing technical about working people living in recession for every second the Prime Minister has been in power. This is a Rishi recession. And if if the party opposite really wants to know what hides in the Chancellor's spreadsheets, then they will see that it's only the record levels of migration they have delivered which has prevented an even deeper decline. And that is the record they must stand on at the election. Because while on these benches we do not demean for a second the contribution migrants make to a thriving economy, it is high time the party opposite was honest with the British public about the role migration plays in their economic policy. Because right now, in in terms of growth, that is all they have. There is nothing else. No plan to get Britain building again with a reform planning system. No ambition to invest in clean British power for cheaper bills and energy security. No inclination to move away from insecure low paid jobs and strengthen employment rights so we can finally make work pay. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, where is the urgency on affordable housing? How can they look at Britain now and not see this is a massive priority? Never again will they be allowed to pose as the party of home ownership and aspiration. Yeah. Oh, well, I have to say, given the disaster that's befallen his childcare plans, perhaps that's for the best. Because, Madam Deputy Speaker, the cost of childcare is a huge challenge for millions. Parents need him to deliver on his promise. And it seems the chance has been taking lessons on marketing from the Willy Wonka experience in Glasgow. (laughs) All all, all is 
is not as it seems, and with just over three weeks to go, he has to come clean. Yeah, because yeah. up and down the country, parents need to know, will they get their entitlement in April, yeah. or is it just another of their reckless promises on governing? Yeah. Headlines over delivery, promises without plans, yeah. policies that unravel at the first contact with reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The lesson crystal clear that those who broke our economy cannot be trusted to repair it. Yeah. The, the Tory credit rating is zero. Yeah. It's time for change with Labour. Yeah. And that's what today's budget should have been about. A last chance for the government to show it understands the economic yeah. reality of our volatile yeah. world, yeah. that yeah. global supply chains can be weaponised by tyrants like Putin. That a sticking plaster approach to public investment will cost Britain more in the long run, and that trickle down nonsense means working people pay the price. It could even have been a moment of contrition, a reflection on their fiscal recklessness, an apology perhaps for the ridiculous chaos they have inflicted on businesses, communities, and investors in this country. And yet, still no sustainable industrial strategy. Still no National Wealth Fund to crowd in private investment. Still no urgency on speeding up critical infrastructure projects. And no recognition that they have left our standing as a country that always keeps its promises in tatters. And if they don't like that accusation, then look no further than the grotesque spectacle of ducking their responsibility to the victims of infected blood and horizon standards. One of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history. Those were the Prime Minister's words just two months ago. Today, justice kicked beyond the general election. No, Madam Deputy Speaker, Britain can see exactly who they are. And the reality is there is no path to economic stability, no way to a calmer, less chaotic politics with the party opposite in power. Because chaos is now their world view, a mindset that sees Britain's problems as opportunities they can exploit. Whether, like the Chancellor, that's out of desperation because they can't solve them, or whether, like the members for Fareham or South West Norfolk, they have no intention of solving them whatsoever. For a party this weak and divided, the end result is always the same. A vicious downward spiral, chaos feeding off decline, decline feeding off chaos, while working people pay the price. The British people know this will not stop. Five more years and it will only get worse. There will be no change of direction without a change of government. And that leaves Britain a nation in limbo, unable to shake off the Tory chaos that dragged us into recession and loaded the tax burden onto the backs of working people and maxed out the nation's credit card. Britain deserves a government ready to take tough decisions, give our public services an immediate cash injection, stick to fiscal rules without complaint, fight for the living standards of working people and deliver a sustainable plan for growth. So we say to the Chancellor Prime Minister, it's time to break the habit of 14 years, stop the dithering, stop the delay, stop the uncertainty, and confirm May the 2nd as the date of the next general election, because Britain deserves better and Labour are ready. demand silence now. This is the moment for cheering. You can do that some more. (laughs) Chairman of the Select Committee, Harriet Baldwin. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I know it hasn't been long since we had an autumn statement, but I still think that we heard today that the Leader of the Opposition has no plan. It's not been very long since we had the last forecast from the Office for Budget Responsibility. Um, So I thought it was interesting to read today that in the just over 100 days since they made their last forecast, there have been a lot of changes for the better in the UK economy. In particular, I'd like to highlight that they are expecting better 
inflation outturn than they were just over three months ago. They're expecting and have noted the sharper fall in interest rates that we all pay on the national mortgage. And they have also said that they're expecting living standards for the British people uh, to recover more quickly than they were previously forecasting. And I think this is uh, information that we can all welcome today, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, I know there will be a range of views across this chamber about the role of the Office for Budget Responsibility. And of course, we all know that forecasts are all likely to be wrong. We will be scrutinising uh, the Office for Budget Responsibility next Tuesday morning in the Treasury Select Committee and uh, we look forward to asking them the questions about their assumptions. But my view in terms of uh, their role is a bit like the Sir Winston Churchill quote about democracy, that it's the worst form of government except for all the others that have been tried. So I think that although all economic forecasts are likely to be wrong in some way, and the Office for Budget Responsibility forecasts certainly often will not be the most accurate, I think it's a lot better than the alternative of either the Treasury marking its own homework or indeed uh, better than having a budget with no forecast from the Office for Budget Responsibility at all because I think it reassures the markets on which we are so dependent for our borrowing. Now there's obviously been good and even better progress on inflation. Uh, since the peak of over 11% after Putin's evil invasion of Ukraine. And it's vital that all of today's budget measures look, are looked at through the lens of uh, the inflation uh, because we don't want to have anything that could, uh, could uh, prevent that progress towards 2% that the Bank of England is expecting uh, by the middle of this year. And I think that we heard today from the Chancellor that he has looked through exactly that lens uh, when he uh, has announced the measures today. So there are a range of things that will really help. Uh, the five pence off uh, the price of fuel at the pump going on for another year will be very helpful uh, to drivers in West Worcestershire and elsewhere in the country. The freeze on alcohol duty will be welcomed in the pubs across West Worcestershire and across the country. And the public sector productivity plan, I think, is crucial uh, to uh, make sure that we get uh, value for money from our public services. Now, when it comes to the second uh, economic objective of growth, I think we can all welcome the fact that employment growth has been so strong that the economy has created over eight hundred jobs a day over the last 14 years and at previous fiscal events we've seen uh, steps in the plan that help grow the productive size of the UK economy because now that we're at full employment that becomes incredibly important because it helps sustain non-inflationary growth. So to take one example, Madam Deputy Speaker, in terms of stimulating that all-important investment into the economy, the big announcement a year ago was the full expensing of uh, investment, and indeed that was made permanent at the autumn statement. Today we heard it's going to be extended to leased assets as well. And what the BBC in their fact check has noticed, that when this was first uh, announced, it was expected that the economy uh, would benefit greatly. The Chancellor said its impact on the economy will be huge. And the Office for Budget Responsibility said it would increase business investment by 3% a year. Well, in fact, since the policy came into force on the 1st of April, we've seen the level of business investment for the whole of the year last year was 6.1% higher than it was in 2022. So we heard today some more welcome steps that will increase business investment and other investment into the UK economy. Whether it was the tax reliefs in some of the creative industries, whether it was the announcement for British ISAs, which should encourage more investment, long-term investment into yeah. our economy, uh, the back-to-work plan, uh, the childcare plan, there were lots of other measures that will unlock uh, growth. I will give way for, to, for giving way, but I just wonder if she thinks that the Chancellor, indeed herself, is being a little bit complacent over the issue of investment because although it's true that business investment is higher now than it was in 2010, it's still the lowest in the G7 and amongst the lowest in the OECD. 
So why haven't we seen more public investment from the Chancellor today? Because we know that public investment will crowd in that private investment. Why haven't we seen much bolder, more ambitious work on investment today, which is what this economy is crying out for? today uh, from the Chancellor about how strong uh, the growth in UK investment has been. We've heard additional investment in terms of uh, the productivity of our National Health Service. And we also heard, and I think this is absolutely uh, crucially important, uh, measures that will increase uh, the attractiveness in investment in some of the fastest growing sectors across this economy. And I give way to my, uh, my friend. I'm grateful to my Honourable Member. Just should you agree with me that it's extraordinary that the Honourable Member for the Representative of the Green Party didn't welcome the 270 million for advanced manufacturing in clean aviation, exactly. in clean vehicles, the 120 exactly. million in clean yeah. tech manufacturing. Yeah. This is the UK investing in the technology of clean growth, is it not? Yeah. Well, it is indeed, and I'm glad that my honourable friend uh, welcomes it, even if it was not welcomed uh, by the representative of the, of the Green Party. Um, I think that what we can see in terms of, if I just make a little, do you want to talk on investment, invest, oh, on investment? I want to just take her back to right. what she just said about the investment in childcare and remind her, of course, that this week brings International Women's Day and that cost of childcare yeah, yeah. is such an important issue for so many mums in this country. And, of course, it was the Conservatives who rolled out the 30 hours of free yep. childcare. Yes. It's the Conservatives who are rolling out free childcare to two-year-olds and nine-months-old. And we absolutely must welcome that additional investment for childcare and, indeed, in families through the support and child benefit that will help mums to get into well-paid jobs. Yeah. Yeah. I wholeheartedly endorse what my honourable friend has said, and she is absolutely right to point to the importance of this investment in childcare in helping female employment growth. And female employment growth has already been remarkably strong over the last 14 years, and I'm confident that these measures will uh, make further progress in increasing the uh, non-inflationary growth capacity of the UK economy. I think there were other measures that announced today that will help on the growth front. I think cutting national insurance again uh, is also a smart way to uh, help growth. It not only adds money into working people's pockets of 27 million people across this country will see an extra £900 a year in terms of uh, money in their bank accounts. But it will also make a work more attractive. And we've heard from the Office for Budget Responsibility that actually it's cutting national insurance that has the biggest uh, marginal impact in bringing people back into work. Uh, 94,000 from the last cut. It'll be interesting to see whether uh, they continue to expect that to have a significant impact. It's a really smart way to cut taxes for working people. And another point that I'd like to make about it is that it's UK-wide, so that it will be felt in Scotland as well. Um, in terms of debt falling, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, we can see that the bond markets have stabilised. The Office for Budget Responsibility numbers uh, confirm that progress in terms of uh, debt. Um, I want to just bring the House's attention to a report that we just recently published in our committee um, that uh, focuses on the Bank of England and its quantitative tightening. They themselves are selling £100 billion of gilts into the market over the course of this year. They've acknowledged that this actually increases uh, the uh, cost to uh, the exchequer of borrowing by a, probably about a tenth to a quarter of a percentage point. And so I think as a cross-party committee, we wanted to flag up uh, the impact that that could potentially have and send a message to the Bank of England, the independent Bank of England, about uh, some of the uh, ways in which quantitative tightening does have an impact on the real economy. And as a cross-party committee, we obviously are never going to agree um, on the level or scope of taxes between us, but one of the things that we do have unanimity... Uh, uh, and does he want to come on the fact that the rate of tax is higher in Scotland? What I do want to raise, <laughs> what I do want to raise is the issue of quantitative easing that she's just highlighted, because there's obviously going to be a very significant supply of gilt over the course of the coming period, and that obviously is going to have an impact on the gilt market, on yields that are there, and of course it will influence the Bank of England and what happens in the interest rate cycle. And crucially, out of all of that, 
it's going to make it pretty difficult in the coming period to see any material growth in, in money supply, particularly M4. That is going to impact growth, given where we are. Well, I'm, I'm sorry he didn't uh, acknowledge that uh, income tax is higher in Scotland, but he does make a very good point about uh, quantitative tightening and its impact on the, on the real economy. And it is, a, it is potentially out there as a factor that can have um, a, a real impact, and we will be watching it very closely uh, on our committee. Um, we, as a cross-party committee, never going to agree um, on the level and scope of taxes, um, but we do agree that the tax system is to complicated. We have a very complicated tax system in this country with well over a thousand different uh, tax reliefs. Um, but I do think that despite the abolition of the Office for Tax Simplification, there have been some major tax simplifications under this Chancellor. We've heard about the way in which he eliminated in the autumn statement the national insurance class. We've heard about how he has simplified the lifetime allowance for pensions. And we also have heard um, today uh, that he has started to tackle some of the very perverse cliff edges high marginal tax rates and disincentives to work that uh, do exist throughout the tax system. By raising uh, the VAT tax threshold, he has helped uh, small businesses who may hold back uh, because they don't want to go through that. And in terms of universal credit, we've done so much over the years to reduce those high marginal tax rates and disincentives. And so it was great to hear the Chancellor today really focus on addressing this high income child benefit charge. Yeah. When we brought it in, and I voted for it at the time, uh, £50,000 a year was a high rate of income. With the progress in terms of higher incomes, um, the median income in those days was about 22000 now the median income is about 35000 and so £50,000 these days is not more than about 40% over the median yeah. income. And that's why it was absolutely right today that the Chancellor recognised that uh, in his budget statement. And he um, has uh, made uh, the taper that much less of a disincentive to people taking on work above that income level. Um, of course, I'd have loved to have seen him uh, do even more, but um, I am very grateful for what he has done. Did someone try and intervene on me? Was that, No, I was just uh, hallucinating there. Right, I will come to a rapid uh, close then. Um, because, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, what I want to say is that it is clear that on this side of the House there is a plan. It is clear that there is a plan to get inflation down. It is clear there's a plan for increasing the growth rate and the growth capacity of the UK economy without sparking inflation again. And it's clear that there is a plan to get debt falling. And I think we can all see that that plan is working. I think we should stick to that plan and not go back to square one. Before I call the spokesman for the SNP, it might be uh, uh, helpful for members, who, it's all right. Everyone could sit down now. It might be it might be helpful uh, for honourable members to know that I hope to be able to manage the debate, certainly at the beginning, without a formal time limit. Uh, and if everybody speaks for around six to seven minutes, then we will manage that without a formal time limit. If we can't quite manage that, we will put on a formal time limit, which will begin with around seven minutes, but will reduce as the day goes on. Uh, I now call the spokesman for the SNP, Drew Hendry. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And traditional at this point, I would thank the Chancellor for advance sight of his redacted uh, statement. But having seen the statement, I realise I was given an entirely different redacted document. But not to worry, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have seen all the details in the press uh, over the past uh, day or so. Um, so, uh, you know, seeing those unredacted words is nice, but uh, not essential for this. Uh, response. I can also uh, thank the Chancellor for the courtesy of staying, unlike some of his colleagues, in the Chamber to listen to the words of the third party um, here. It does not happen all the time, but I think it is very, very good practice uh, for a party that might well be in the position of third party after the next election. 
Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the, Chancellor, uh, the Chancellor during his autumn statement said that there was a statement for growth. But what have we seen since his autumn statement? Growth has gone down. It's grown into recession, in fact. And the OBR are saying today, having steadily declined since early 2022, real GDP per person is forecast to trough trough at 1.25% below its pre-pandemic peak in the first half of 2024. So this is not, that was not a statement for growth and this is not a budget for growth. Again, I do like with the Chancellor like to start with some measures that I would welcome from his uh, points that he's made today. First of all, albeit the softest possible landing he could have given them, the uh, dec decision to, to at least address the non-DOM status is a positive move forward. Uh, the changes to child benefit, and here we must give credit to Paul Lewis, uh, who has campaigned on this. And indeed, yeah, yeah. Uh, similar to the press, Paul Lewis has tweeted today that he was tipped off by the Chancellor that this was coming. So that is very good as well. Um, the lifetime uh, ISAs move is um, welcome. The R&D support for aerospace, although the smallest possible step that could have been taken in investment in this industry, again, is something uh, to be welcomed, as is invest for any further investment in life sciences uh, with this. The Chancellor has put a lot of store on productivity uh, in his speech today. He's going to solve everything with productivity. Yet if we look back over the past 14 years and indeed before that, one of the things that the UK has been exceptionally poor at is productivity. It hasn't budged at all. So I don't see how the Chancellor, I don't see how the cha productivity, look at the figures for Scotland. He's saying, what about Scotland? Look at the figures for Scotland over the past 14 years and we can have uh, that debate. He says... He said earlier that vacancies would be easy to fill with immigration. This, this is the party who imposed Brexit, joined by the Labour Party and now the Lib Dems, and stopped free movement. Yep. Of course it would be easy to fill vacancies yep. with people, skilled people who want yep. to do the jobs yep. um, that we have, who want to fill those vital jobs in tourism, hospitality, the National Health Service, the Care Service, and across Oh, many other uh, sectors, but of course that has been taken away by this uh, place. Now, his, NI, his national insurance cuts today are already uh, being measured by, people, by the economists who are looking at this to point out that the gains will be cancelled, as was last time by the freeze on thresholds. There is very, very little for people on low incomes, zero for, uh, for 17.8 million people on less than £12,750. So there is not a lot of sense in the measure that he's, he's taken. He also boasted about the fact of taking over with inflation at 11 per cent. But I think it's important for us yeah, to remember the Tory government was in charge when inflation was at 11 per cent. It is their child. Um, this problem with inflation. And they also suggest, they also suggest that somehow 4 per cent is a triumph. 4 per cent is still 4 per cent inflation. Prices still go up. This is, let's face it, this is a last ditch, tone deaf approach to desperately try to recover in the polls. It's the embodiment of the Tory party before the people. Where are the real measures that have real impact on the cost of living? The one, people, well, one thing that people need, need the most direct help with, for those living in fear of the energy bill, being told once again that their direct debits are increasing, slicing more off their take-home pay, none of this is more than cold comfort. To those people staring in disbelief as they realise that their shopping bills are more than 25% higher than they were a couple of years ago, this will stick in their throats. To those trust to their new much higher mortgages and rents directly because of reckless decisions of this, this place, the walls are closing in for them. And on public services, he's failed people again. Paul Johnson of the IFS noted that the Chancellor would have to explain how public services already on their knees, could possibly take more cuts. So let's not forget the £19 billion he slashed from public spending in the autumn statement. 
They also noted the economic case for tax cuts is weak. The public finances remain in a poor position. And the Chancellor is, in his budget today, promoting a further £20 billion cut, according to the IFS. Public services have already been left struggling after 14 years of underfunding, 14 years of economic chaos and blunder from mini budgets to Brexit, colossal wastes of hundreds of billions of pounds, and fraud and cronyism. Public finances are now so pared to the bone that we can see the marrow. Is it any wonder? that a growing number of English councils, one by one, whether Tory, Labour or Lib Dem run, are now effectively bankrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. bankrupt. People in Scotland needed a budget that delivered funding that would have allowed investment for our public services, real investment in the NHS that supports families, that a budget that supports families with the cost of living taken into account and properly invest in green energy, not another austerity Chancellor taking an even bigger axe to investment than his predecessors. When it does come to that election in Scotland, no, when it does come to that election in Scotland, they will have their say and they will have their choice. It is a clear choice between SNP calls to invest in public services and the economy and in our communities in our town centres and city centres, in our manufacturing future, in our rural areas, in our tourism industry, in our food and drink sector, in the priorities they hold, in the values that they hold dear. These will be the major dividing lines at the general election. The Scottish Government is committed to protecting people from some of the worst Westminster policies and is making a real difference to the lives of people in Scotland, despite their limited powers. The Prime Minister might be under the impression that the cost of living crisis is easing, but that assessment will be a slap in the face for households across Scotland who are still facing the consequences of over a decade of Tory, Tory cuts and mismanagement of the economy. People will see straight through attempts by the Chancellor to make up for falling living standards and underfunded public services and wage stagnation with this poorly timed national insurance cut that for most households won't improve their overall standard of life. And leaving aside his failure to deal with the fiscal drag, which as I said wipes out much of the benefit of the NI cuts, leaving aside the vast inequality in both benefits to the better off by his actions and the geographical effect that mean, means London benefits much more than anywhere else, he can't escape the fact that the government has now imposed the highest tax burden since the end of World War II. Yeah. Now I want to tackle the, uh, the issues of tax in Scotland. It's, uh, it comes there. In Scotland, our progressive moves that mean that not only do the majority of people pay less tax, yep. but they also pay far lower council tax than yeah, in England. Exactly. They are supported with free prescriptions, do not have to pay tuition fees and get the game-changing Scottish child payment yeah, and yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing what is right, investing in our people, not leaving them high yeah, and dry. Yeah, yeah. Whilst the Tories cut public funding in England, the Scottish Government's progressive approach to income tax has worked to raise a significant revenue to invest in public services in Scotland. The Scottish Government's tax regime means that on average households in the lower half of the income distribution are £400 better off a year than they would be in the rest of the UK. Around 58% of households are better off under the Scottish tax and social security system than they would be in the rest of the UK. Taking a different progressive course on income tax in Scotland means that in 2024-25, the Scottish Fiscal Commission estimates that the Scottish Government will have around £1.5 billion of additional revenues compared to if it had followed the UK Government's tax policies. The Scottish Government continues to reaffirm their sco social contract with the Scottish people, with people across Scotland reaping the benefits through, as I have said, free prescription, free university tuition, free school meals, free bus travel for the under-22s, 22, free dental care until 26, <coughs> publicly owned rail services and free childcare for two, three and four-year-olds, and seven additional welfare payments, including, as I have noted, the revolutionary Scottish child pay. Yeah, yeah. Now, before I move on to uh, other matters, let's just talk about the economy. And the other measure that 
um, that the Chancellor mentioned today, which was freezing the tax on Scotch whisky. As in the autumn statement, you'd say that is not enough. This is a massive industry to Scotland. It is a massive export for both Scotland in terms of food and drink and indeed to the UK, and yet it is still taxed at 70 odd per cent. They needed a cut in that tax today in order to deliver uh, what they could do. And it, the fact that it was not addressed in the budget is a shame on them. Austerity is an ever decreasing circle, and it is fiscal madness to pursue the same policies that have been failing so obvious for many years. Yet none of these parties can bear to face the truth that for an economy to grow it needs proper investment, for public services to deliver, to free up the potential of our people they need to be supported, not asset stripped and starved of those resources. The Chancellor mentioned £2.5 billion for digital uh, digitisation of the NHS in order to get those uh, so-called productivity games. How much of that is going to go to private companies, I wonder, yeah, when yeah, the yeah, dust yeah. settles? They should have boosted NHS spending by £15 billion to improve health care after the UK Government imposed real terms cuts this year. <coughs> Funding NHS pay properly to match Scotland, where there have been no NHS strikes and caught up for their previous cuts. Where was the announcement on settling with the victims of the contaminated blood scandal? Missing. Moving on to the economy, who should have turbocharged investment in green energy by investing at least £28 billion a year to compete in the global green energy gold rush? and secure sustained economic growth. Where, is the serious, where else is the serious high return growth supposed to come from? We have not heard it mentioned here today. We do not know where it is. That £28 billion is needed. The, the Labour advisers have told the Labour Party that £28 billion a year is needed. Everybody knows that £28 billion a year is needed, and yet none of them are willing to make the investment that is needed to protect us. The abandonment of the just transition and its fantastic... Oh, the, 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 the chuntering from a sedentary position on the Labour front bench. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh dear, imagine, imagine picking up on that one. Their big U-turn, their which, big which, abandonment which, which, of the just transition. Well, it's, it's a pretty no, no, big U-turn. Yeah. I know it's one of many, He's but it's a pretty big uh, U-turn. The fact, Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, the fact that they're rattled, I think, just shows how much they feel this. Their and the government's abandonment of the just transition and its fantastic opportunity by from the, from the Tories and from the shadows in the Labour Party yeah, yeah, is yeah, reckless yeah, and yeah, stupid, yeah, yeah, yeah. economically and for the desperate need to act on climate change. The failure to invest in this will hold back Scotland from reaching our green energy ambitions and leave households vulnerable to future energy crises. The Chancellor must finally match the level of ambition we are seeing in other countries. They have been shown by the European Union, by the United States with their Inflation Reduction Act, that this is an issue that needs to be taken seriously, and yet they are sitting on their hands. Scotland can be at the forefront of the green energy revolution thanks to our incredible natural resources inshore in, in inshore and offshore wind, wave, tidal and hydro power. But with Labour and the Tories' intent on pulling the rug from, out of, from under yeah. the industry, industry's feet, we risk seeing yet another generation of energy potential wasted yeah. by yeah. Westminster. Yeah. 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 So the Chancellor should finally commit to properly investing in renewables and must decouple the price of gas from the price Absolutely. of electricity. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot ensure a just transition from oil and gas for the people and communities that rely on it if you squeeze the life and the se- out of the sector overnight. Yep. We know that households across Scotland have been badly hit by the energy crisis, and proper investment in renewables can reduce the bills for households. Citizens Advice Scotland revealed that in the last four years they have seen the number of people requesting advice and support with energy bills 
increase by 14 times. The Labour Party are saying, from a, again from a sedentary position, that I'm going on too long. I take that as a, I take that as a sign they're not comfortable with what I'm saying here, and they would like me to. They would like me to. Oh, they're, they're bored. They're, they're bored. They're bored by the just transition. Exactly. They're bored by the cost exactly. of energy that people have yeah, to bear. Yeah. They're bored by all these things. Yeah. No way down by I'm about to ask for order so that the honourable gentleman could be heard, but I think that the noise is coming from immediately behind him. <laughs> so, so uh, but as I as I have as as I have as I have the honourable gentleman mustn't shout at me. You can shout at other people, but don't shout at me. <sighs> Drew Hendry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I can make more progress if uninterrupted, so I do appreciate your uh, advice on that. Talking of advice, I want to come back to Citizens Advice Scotland. They revealed that in the last four years they have seen the number of people requesting advice and support for en- with energy bills increase by 14 times. That is a shocking increase. Yep. Yep. And proper investment in green energy can make sure that people in Scotland never have to face an energy crisis of this scale again. Yeah. Now, you could have, as I said, helped families with the cost of living by scrapping grossly unfair and unequal energy bill standing charges and using a £12 billion wealth tax to fund a £400 annual energy discount for households, reintroduced mortgage interest tax relief, capped supermarket food prices, and matched the Scottish child. Payment UK wide. He could have boosted UK uh, finances, but he chose not to. By increasing, introducing the, intri- he could have introduced a long overdue essentials guarantee while scrapping callous policies such as the two child limit and the benefit cap. And of course, one of the most uh, it, one of the most game-changing things they could have done is finally give up on the failed experiment that has been Brexit, rejoin the EU single market and deliver economic growth. Now, the Chancellor must, the Chancellor must support businesses and introduce measures to support tourism and the hospitality industries. We know that businesses have faced a very challenging period with COVID, Brexit and increased costs from all sides, making life more difficult for people across Scotland. That is why the SNP are calling on the Chancellor to reduce the rate of VAT for the tourism and hospitality sector. It is not too late for him to do that, to reinstate VAT-free shopping for international visitors, and to implement implement VAT-free streets to support struggling town centres and high streets. If nothing is done to halt the decline, they continue to be ignored, and they continue to be ignored, as they have been for too long. Then communities will suffer, and far more tax will be lost in the longer term than providing them with some support. They could choose to construct these mini enterprise zones, working with devolved governments and local authorities to agree sectors and areas where support is must, must, most needed. They could benefit from the reductions in VAT, or if the need is great enough, then no VAT. This could be tied to, for example, businesses agreeing to pay the real lev- living wage. As the chief executive of Marks and Spencer said yesterday, he has described operating under the cover- current government as like, and I quote, running up a downwards escalator with a rucksack on your back. If the government can rule out free ports, why, then why not free ports for people? They could reduce, as I have said, alcohol duty for whisky and other spirits and support Scotland's thriving whisky sector that adds £7.1 billion to the UK economy. Businesses in Scotland can no longer afford to be held back by the UK's low growth economy. So the Chancellor should bring in measures to support businesses that have been left paying the price for the UK Government's disastrous Brexit. It is clear that the SNP is the only party committed to rejoining the EU and giving Scottish businesses the chance to access goods and talent from our 27 closest neighbours. The Scottish Government is committed to protecting people of Scotland from some of the worst Westminster policies and is making a real difference to the lives of people in Scotland, despite their limited uh, powers. The cut to the Scottish Government's capital budget and finance transactions has meant that they have had to take some very difficult decisions in this year's budget, but they are still committed to delivering for the people of Scotland. 
The SNP fully support the £3.3 billion package the UK Government have delivered for Northern Ireland and urge the Chancellor to make similar funding available in line with the Barnett formula to help the Scottish Government deal with the budget pressures they are facing. So the Scottish Government are freezing the council tax, or at least freezing the council tax, except in Tory, Lib Dem and some Labour councils, where they think that people should pay more. They are lifting 100,000 children out of poverty with measures like the Scottish Child Payment, providing support to help mitigate additional heating costs that households of the most severely dis disabled children and young people face in the winter months through the child winter housing payments, provide free school meals to all children in primaries one to five and eligible children throughout the school, providing all babies in Scotland with the essentials needed for the first six months of a child's life through the baby box and introducing 1140 hours of funded early learning and childcare to all three- and four-year-olds and eligible two-year-olds, making bus travel free for two million people in Scotland, including all children and young people after, under 22, eligible disabled people and everybody 60 or over. This is just a snapshot of some of the landmark policies the Scottish Government has brought in, and all of these have been achieved against the background, the backdrop of limited powers and being tied to a Westminster system that, as we have seen from this budget today, continues to do nothing for the people of Scotland. Uh, just to emphasise um, uh, what uh, Madam Deputy Speaker said, um, it would be very helpful if uh, colleagues could confine their remarks to now it is probably six minutes, uh, so that we can get everybody in with equal time. Father of the House, Sir Peter Bottomley. Mr. Speaker, it is interesting to follow the honourable gentleman who spoke for the SNP. I was waiting to hear how the experiment with higher taxation is going. And I, would I would invite the SNP to see if they can publish the figures showing how many of the top ten philanthropists in Scotland five years ago are still paying tax in Scotland, and how the top ten individual taxpayers in Scotland five years ago are doing now. And then, well, to this example, the SNP don't like having questions put to them. They were. When the Leader of the Opposition started speaking, it sounded to begin with as though it was the voice of his health spokesman speaking. But I also reflected on his reflection over the last few years. It's in the memory of the House that in 2015, uh, sorry, 2017 and 2019, he wanted the Prime Minister to be his right honourable friend, the member for Islington North. When there was a vacancy to be leader of the Labour Party in succession to the Right Honourable Gentleman, the candidate who was most close to Islington North was the person who is now the leader of the opposition. And his journey over the last couple of years in changing his views or his approach seems to be quite significant. I think people can believe that the Labour Party wants to change. For example, in the town where I represent two-thirds of it, in one of the constituencies, none of the local councillors was judged suitable to be put in a shortlist to be selected as a parliamentary candidate. That shows central power in the hands of the Leader of the Opposition and his uh, National Executive, which I think most people would have found surprising. If I had been one of the Labour councillors told I could not apply, I would have got pretty upset. The reaction I have had from my constituents to the financial statement and the budget have come down to one particular point where someone said, could there please be a change on the level of pension pot that requires financial advice? When that was brought in in 2015, the level was £30,000. My constituent, who has a pension pot of £32,500, has been quoted £7,000 for advice on how to be able to realise this relatively small pension pot. I had asked Treasury ministers to consider whether in the Finance Bill they can lift that figure say to 40,000 or 50,000, so that people who want to gather up a small part of their defined benefit pension can use it. The second reaction I had from a constituent was that since Labour took control of Worthing Borough Council, two thirds of the reserves have gone within two years, and people are worrying whether the council itself, the council can remain solvent. If that's a test for what Labour might do in government, I think it's a pretty good reason to follow the Chancellor and our present Prime Minister and re-elect us so we can go on trying to bring up the levels of productivity 
bring up the levels of growth, bring up the reform and development of public services by getting more people into work, higher tax revenues and preferably lower rates of tax themselves. The Chancellor has announced changes to the penalties on child benefit. I go back far enough to remember when most of the value of child benefit came in the value of the child tax allowance. Children can't work. If I had a dependent pensioner in my household, there would be an income coming with them. For any family who has a child under, the age, under working age, they ought to be able to get the kind of support so over a family life cycle you receive support when you need it and you pay back when you're more dependent or able to work. And I hope we can move to a stage where the whole of that child benef benefit penalty goes completely. There's no philosophical justification, there's no economic justification. It was an error and I hope I voted against it when it came in. I probably did, you know. Um, <laughs> and that sort of person. Uh, th there are many other things on the environmental side, which I won't go into because of the limitations on time. I hope that the proposed district heating scheme, which the government wants to have as one of their flagship projects supported by the local authority, can go ahead. There's a problem now with the cost of lane rental and putting hot pipes under our roads. But I think we do need to give serious attention to how we get the major investment so that nearly all our homes come off burning hydrocarbons, whether it's gas or the like, and get onto a solar heating or uh, heat pumps, either air or ground source heating. That is going to require a major effort, especially for residential leasehold properties. And my concluding point is the chance to announce more money for f more free schools. I hope one of them will be the SEND school proposed in Worthing in the new Durrington estate. Nearly one child in five in West Sussex has some kind of a statement. They deserve specialist support. It's good for them and it's good for the other children. And I hope we'll get an announcement of that very soon. Having said that, I welcome the government's plans. I think those who say that they would take us back to square one are exactly right. Dame Angela Eagle. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I think this was a budget entirely focused on the electoral prospects of the Conservative Party, not the needs of the country or our people. And so the Chancellor decided his only chance uh, to get them through that election was to trumpet so-called tax cuts. But the tax burden is actually going up. And he's made an incredible series of assumptions about departmental spending up to five years in the future and then blown all the money that he's saved from uh, making those assumptions on pre-election giveaways. Um, it was obvious from the moment that the Chancellor sat down last November that this early budget would contain more so-called cuts to personal taxes, albeit against a background of rising taxes. Uh, as the OBR confirms at paragraph 1.21, page 12 of its report, taxes will uh, rise as a percentage of GDP all the way up to 2028-29. Uh, now, the Chancellor said as much uh, that he was seeking tax cuts before the OBR had even produced its current forecasts. He said it before the UK's economic situation had deteriorated, landing our economy in a technical recession, wiping out his expected fiscal headroom. And he hinted at tax cuts before it emerged that our economy is now smaller than it was when the Prime Minister first walked into Downing Street. So in recent days we've observed the Chancellor and Prime Minister engaged in an edifying, increasingly frantic search for tax rises and future spending cuts to top up the kitty for personal tax giveaways. And they've come up with a vape tax, changes to non-dom status, which were proposed by Labour and long ridiculed by the Chancellor himself. And perhaps um, the Minister, when he replies, will indicate whether um, those that no longer pay uh, non-dom uh, no, no longer have non-DOM tax status will actually pay inheritance tax. Uh, and we've also had changes to the tax treatment of the holiday uh, let regime. So whilst the party opposite cheered the tax cut sleight of hand, let's bear in mind some facts. Despite all the Chancellor's smoke and mirrors, the tax burden at the end of this Parliament will be higher than it, was, than it has been since the Second World War. Yeah. That's Yet right. our public services are crumbling around us, with one in ten local authorities on the verge of bankruptcy, and our infrastructure and public realm falling apart. 
And the cost of living crisis persists with the UK's real wage growth, the slowest than it has been since the Napoleonic Wars. No wonder we have a flatlining economy. Because the freeze to income tax and national insurance threshold is due to raise 44 billion in the next five years as millions of people are dragged into higher rate tax. The personal tax cuts the Chancellor is brandishing today are, in other words, completely drowned out by these other huge increases in tax. And the Chancellor uh, uh, and, the pre and his predecessor have announced even more. The Chancellor has claimed it's his moral duty to cut taxes, but in reality, he's put them up, and he just hopes nobody will notice. But, Madam, um, I'm happy to give that. <coughs> making a powerful case for the need for investment in public services, but in that context I do wonder why the Labour Party appears to be supporting the freezing of the fuel duty, because we know that the top cost of uh, freezing fuel duty since 2010 is now a staggering £90 billion, and climate emissions are also 7% higher than they would have been since 2010 if that policy hadn't been in effect. So precisely because she wants to see more money going into public services, can she explain why Labour is supporting this extraordinary policy? The, the costing of that policy in the scorecard um, should be more honest and it should be taken out of the scorecard if it's not going to be uh, put into effect. <coughs> Taxes are still higher than they've been since the Second World War and the government has continued to fritter away billions on fraud and waste. <coughs> Just today we learned that taxpayers have had to pick up the bill for the science minister's legal costs and damages in a libel case. How much has that debacle cost us? First, the Conservatives gave us the catastrophic mini-budget with its unfunded tax cuts which spooked the markets and sent mortgage costs and rents soaring for millions. Now the current Chancellor has decided to fund his election giveaways with the fiscal fiction of huge cuts in planned departmental spending scheduled to last for the whole of the next Parliament. There are no detailed plans on how these cuts in spending can be safely delivered because we won't have a spending review and today the Chancellor confirmed that there will not be a spending review until after the next general election. He's pencilled in a so-called increase of nearly 1% for <coughs> departmental budget spending, but he's not compensated for higher than expected inflation, yeah. population growth, or any extra cost pressures. Would my unfriendly work? I'm happy to. <coughs> my unfriendly group give way. It's not just uh, flatlining in terms of 1%, but if she looks at capital on page 27 of the uh, red book, that most departments are actually either staying still or in some cases uh, actually like the Home Office, Education and Defence actually have been there uh, by 2024-25, have been their budgets cut. Um, the, uh, my, uh, on, my right honourable friend must be able to read my mind because that was exactly the point that I was coming on to make in real terms, up to 18% cuts cool. yeah. in unprotected departments going all yeah. the way through to the end of the next Parliament, which had been described by David Gork, the ex-Tory Treasury Minister, as the height of fiscal irresponsibility. So the legacy of this government is a burgeoning government debt up from 64.7% of GDP when Labour left office in 2010 to 95% now. The Chancellor will just barely meet his own self-imposed fiscal rules by the tiniest of margins. Meanwhile, his neglect means that NHS waiting lists have soared with 7.8 million treatments outstanding, and despite publishing 11 plans for growth since 2010, the trend growth rate is down from 2.3% in the 2000s to 0.8% this year. There's no regional plan, no working industrial strategy, no sign of levelling up as regional disparities are widening, not closing. And our GDP is now 400 billion less than expected from the growth rate forecast by the OBR in 2010. Wages have stagnated. Uh, the uh, government have also delivered deepening levels of poverty caused by low wages and real-term benefit cuts, which have reduced the incomes of the poorest 20% and seen the number of people relying on food banks go from 60,000 to nearly 3 million. So we've seen the last desperate throw of the dice from a failing, discredited government, which has long since run out of ideas and is finally running out of road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I've declared my business interests in the register. I'm pleased the Chancellor started by re reminding the nation 
uh, that under Conservative leadership, governments since 2010 have presided over the creation of 800 new jobs every day, every week, every month, every year, and have halved unemployment. The scourge of worklessness which was inherited has been banished, and we now have the, the less worrying problem that we can't get enough people to fill all the jobs rather than the other way around of not having enough jobs for the people. And I'm pleased that he reminded the House that uh, we have outperformed in growth all of the major European nations. But I'm sure he would agree with me that that is a very feeble target to set ourselves. And we are now free to do so much better. And the question we need to ask is why has the United States of America so outperformed Europe so comprehensively for so long? And what can we learn? And the first thing we can learn from them is a better system of economic policy guidance and control. The requirements on the Federal Reserve Board, their central bank, uh, is a balanced mandate. It is not just the 2% inflation, which is a very necessary target, which we share, but also they are to promote growth and growth in employment, so they understand the trade-offs uh, and can adjust the policy accordingly. And I would like us, as our way of steering the economy, to get rid of fanciful made-up figures for five years' time by the OBR, which are always wrong, and to have two main aims, to have that 2% inflation target not merely binding on the bank but also binding on the whole government, because government has a big impact on prices and wages, and I would want us to have a 2% growth rate, a uh, considerably higher growth rate than European countries have been achieving in, in the last decade, which I think is achievable if we took the right actions. Now, to do that, we need the Bank of England to work in sympathy with the government's policy. And I remind the House that there is a dual mandate on the bond portfolio, the so-called so APF, and the Bank of England, having bought far too many bonds at ridiculously high prices on very low yields, uh, running a very loose policy which gave us an inflation, has now lurched too far the other way, is running too tight a policy, is selling far too many bonds at much lower prices, prices it deliberately lowered in the market, and saddling us with losses. In this document, it confirms that the accumulated losses paid so far, which taxpayers and the Treasury have to pay, amount to £49 billion since the thing flipped over in 2022. £34 billion year to date, the last figure I saw. Unaffordable, unnecessary, quite wrong policy meaning we have less growth and a far bigger bill. I'm very glad that the government has decided to major on productivity in general, and in particular on public sector productivity. It was some months ago when I stumbled across um, a figure in ONS Figures Well Concealed saying that in the three years from COVID, we had lost 7.5% productivity in our public services. So I did a quick back of the envelope calculation and said that's roughly £30 billion. It means that it costs £30 billion more today to produce the same level and range of public service as it did before COVID, as well, of course, as many tens of billions more on top of that that you actually have to pay because of all the inflation. So it was a £30 billion hit. I now see that the government more or less agrees that the, the <laughs> Chancellor has costed the loss in his figures at 6% rather than 7.5%, but he has said that he wants to eliminate a 5% productivity shortfall out of the 6%, and he costs that at 20 billion, which is exactly the same as my 30 billion for 7.5%. So uh, that is felicitous indeed. And so the issue is, how are they going to go about doing this? <coughs> now, I, I hear the scheme for the NHS that there's going to be a very elaborate expenditure on, on very wide-ranging centralised computerisation. Good luck with that. But I wouldn't rely just on that myself for my productivity package for the public services. And you don't actually need new investment to get yourselves back to the productivity level you were at in 2019. You don't need to use all today's wonderful AI. You just need to use what you already got, which you had in 2019. And it's about management. <coughs> it's about personnel. And it's about giving the personnel uh, the right tasks. And what we've seen is a huge increase in managerial positions and administrative positions. And far from managing things better, it's managing it less well. We had a shocking case in the press recently where there were awful lot of managers presiding over a prison that had gone wrong. 
and they weren't able to actually do the, the more important day-by-day -day things that were needed in order to resolve the problem. If you look at the, the way in which there's been this huge expansion in, in the civil service and other public administration uh, in the COVID period, uh, you will see not only has there been a big increase in numbers, but there's also been a big increase in those who have been promoted up the grades uh, for whatever reason. But you do need enough people that somebody is supervising, and you don't need all supervisors because they are often too posh to do the work. So we do need to manage things better, and that is the productivity challenge before us. I would also urge the government to abolish UK government investment. It is a very expensive body that has a completely, uh, completely dreadful track record in that it is presided over the post office and did nothing to deal with the sub-postmasters, and it presided over £1,400 million of accumulated losses, bankrupting the corporation. And then it presides over network rail, and the whole rail industry and network rail and HS2 is absorbing £33 billion of uh, public money this year, and I don't think we're getting value for it. So, my time is up. Government, redouble your efforts on productivity. Understand it's mainly about who you hire and what you ask them to do, and get rid of UK GI, and ministers take responsibility for the dreadfully badly performing nationalised industries. Sir Ed Davey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. What we heard from the Chancellor was a budget that reeks of desperation and deceit from a government that knows it's lost the trust of the British people. A bottom of the barrel budget, nothing to make families truly better off after the catastrophic fall in living standards we've seen under the Conservatives. And no plan for long term economic growth, no real extra support for the NHS and our public services, and no end in sight to the years of unfair tax hikes, just a last-ditch attempt from the Conservative Party to cling on to power. But now, Madam Deputy Speaker, people have had enough of this government's empty promises. What they want is a general election to get this out-of-touch government out of Downing Street. Yeah, 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 yeah. They are sick and tired of a government that promised in last year's budget to grow the economy, only to plunge it into recession with a government that promised to bring down NHS waiting lists, only to let them continue up and up, and that promised to cut tax, but instead has hit families with years of unfair stealth tax rises. Never before have I seen a government deliver weaker public services, higher taxes and zero growth all at the same time, and all in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Madam Deputy Speaker, I fear that by designing his economic policy, give a short-term sugar rush to Conservative backbenchers, the Chancellor is condemning millions of families to high mortgage rates for much, much longer. And you don't need to take my word for it. Look at the OBR. The OBR forecasts mortgage rates staying at 4% or more for the next five years at least. This is a disaster for homeowners across the United Kingdom. And let's look at taxes. The Chancellor seems desperate to convince people he's letting them keep more of their own money, but he's fooling no one. Yeah. Everyone can see his supposed tax cut for what it really is, a badly executed conjuring trick, giving with one hand but taking away twice as much mm -hmm. with the other. Since last April, a typical household has already paid another £1,500 extra because of the Chancellor's stealth tax on income tax thresholds, that's money they're simply not going to get back. But even after today's announcement, that same family will pay an additional £366 in tax next year because the Chancellor has frozen their tax-free allowance. And on top of that, they've got soaring mortgage payments, food prices and energy bills all to worry about. This tax cut has already been wiped out by the time the ink dried on the Chancellor's speech. But people were also looking for investment in our public services, especially our NHS. Across our country, I see more and more frustration that nothing seems to work anymore under this government. People can't get a hospital appointment in time, they can't get to see their GP in time, and they can't get an ambulance on time. Like in Hampshire, where the local NHS is so stretched 
there's a proposal to close the A&E at the Royal Hampshire County Hospital. In Manchester, where Stepping Hill Hospital has had an entire outpatient ward closed for months because it's unsafe for patients and staff. Or in South London, where St Helier Hospital has been left to crumble with no sign of the investment promised by this government. A&E and maternity services um, are at risk of closure. Not, not, for second. not for second. When the Chancellor makes cruel cuts to vital services, it doesn't just affect numbers on a spreadsheet. It affects people's lives. He either doesn't, doesn't get that or he just doesn't care. I give way. I hear what the uh, Russell gentleman was saying about investment, but he was actually part of a coalition from 2010 yep. to 2015, yes. which savagely cut yes. services in the North East, including right. local government expenditure and health expenditure and others, which is now having to be picked up because it's, the austerity has continued. Did he take any responsibility for his role in where we're at with some of these crumbling infrastructure? But I say to Honourable Gentleman, quite, quite gently, um, if he looks at the spending plans that were proposed by the Labour Party going to the 2010 election, they were actually worse than what actually happened. And moreover, uh, we fought the Conservatives in, 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 in your government to maintain spending on education, which we did, and then they cut it after 2015. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, if we look now at the economy, Perhaps the most out-of-touch claim by the Chancellor is that the economy is turning a corner. The only corner the economy is turning under this government is from stagnation to recession. They left our economy smaller than it was in 2022 when the Prime Minister took office. The best growth rate they've achieved in the last three quarters of 2023 is 0%. GDP per capita People's share in our country's wealth has been falling for nearly two years in a row. That's the longest stretch on record, and it's left the average household £1,500 poorer. And there's worse to come, Madam Deputy Speaker. Nearly five million mortgage holders will soon see their repayments skyrocket by an average of £240 a month due to the high interest rates. This is the government's real track record, a recession made in Downing Street with no hint of a chance to turn things around. The Chancellor could have stood up today and given people a fair deal. He could have cancelled the unfair tax hike he's planned for April and raised the tax-free personal allowance. He could have properly funded the NHS to bring down waiting lists and let more people return to work, helping to grow our economy. He could have championed unpaid carers and raised the carers allowance. He could have supported people with the cost of living by reversing his tax cuts for the big banks to help those struggling with their mortgage payments. And he could have presented a serious plan for economic growth by launching an industrial strategy, reforming business rates and standing up for our small businesses. Instead, he went for one last roll of the dice in a desperate attempt to cling on to power. But Madam Deputy Speaker, I think people have already made up their minds. Mm -hmm. So the government must do the right thing, call a general election right now, before they do even more damage to our wonderful country. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Hello, the Honourable Member for Kingston and Surbiton. I obviously heard a different budget from what he heard. Yeah. Uh, I thought there was a lot in this budget that is very good and to be commended. As someone who read economics at the uh, London School of Economics many years ago, I understand and appreciate the economy, the challenges that my right honourable friend had had to confront. I welcome his announcements today, as well as the sensible and measured approach he has taken. I commend him for his performance and the proposals today, and I want to concentrate on a few key issues which are really vital to my constituents. Now, of course, our country and the whole world has experienced unprecedented difficulties in recent years due to matters out of our control the COVID-19 pandemic and the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East. We are suffering the consequences, so it remains as important as ever to practice fiscal responsibility. And as we continue to see the results of the Conservative government's efforts to bring inflation under control, grow the economy and reduce debt, I believe we are looking for our country to have a better future. I was actually in the Education Department when uh, uh, the, 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 gentleman, the member for Kingston and Surbiton uh, was uh, in the coalition government 
and uh, I would ask him to really look at the record of some of the things of what he is saying now. Inflation has fallen from over 11% to 4%. The economy is now performing better than forecast, wages are increasing, and we're seeing mortgage rates coming down. As we heard from the Chancellor, our economy has outperformed European neighbours, and the OBR forecasting we will meet our fiscal rule to have debt falling as a share of the economy. This is all really positive news, and the measures in the budget today, I think, will enhance it and be welcomed. I look very much, I very much look forward to seeing the benefits of today's announcements for my constituents in Bexley Heath and Crayford. High inflation is a bad thing for everybody. It affects and causes problems. Individuals, businesses, communities, everywhere. I was just rather sorry that both the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the SNP couldn't at least praise that, because this is a real achievement, down to 4 per cent. We have again cut taxes for 27 million working people from next month by cutting the main rate of the employee national insurance contributions by 2p in the pound. Together with the cut announced at the autumn statement, this equates to a tax cut of over £900 for the average worker. This is really good news. Personally, I have always disliked national insurance. As the Chancellor said, it is an unfair double tax on work. And I think, therefore, what he is doing in this is, is a fairer system. And it's the best way to incentivise work, which is something we've got to do. Incentivise work. Get more of the people who are not working and active to get into the labour force. And that is the way to drive growth, in my opinion. This way, we're going to a fairer and simpler and more understandable tax system, which I think we would all welcome. From April, a full-time living, national living wage workers' take-home pay will be 35 per cent greater in real terms in 2010, due to the excessive increases in the national living wage and the tax cuts we have <coughs> delivered. I welcome particularly my right on friend the Chancellor's commitment to supporting parents and the long campaign for a change in the system to end the unfairness for sing single-income families with higher child benefit charge. Families are the foundation of our society. We value them and we need to support them as much as we possibly can. Almost half a million families will benefit from the increase in the threshold to the higher income child benefit charge, with some 170,000 families no longer having to pay the charge. It is also right that we look to end the unfairness of the single earner families by moving towards a household system by April 26. So many of my constituents have raised this in the past. I have raised it with this Chancellor and previous one, and therefore we are delighted that he has taken on board this, he has listened, and he has acted. And I commend him for that. The other thing that is important to us in our, my constituency and Bexley Borough is because we use the car more than most, because we do not have an underground system. Therefore, people are so dependent on either the uh, South Eastern, which is a mixed blessing. I know if my uh, right hand friend is nodding in my direction, uh, because it has been somewhat uh, problematical. So, therefore, they need their car. And the cut, the maintaining the cut on the fuel duty and freezing the rates for the 14th consecutive year is to be commended. Also, the freeze on alcohol duty, which I know many of my colleagues on this side have campaigned vigorously uh, for. They have campaigned with justification. And uh, two of our excellent uh, uh, pubs, one is the Penny Farthing, which is a micro pub in Crayford, and the King's Arms in Bexley Heath, every time I go in there, and it isn't, Madam Chairman, too often, I have to assure you, uh, but uh, I'm always campaigning for this, and therefore it's good news for everyone in the alcohol industry and for those who drink in our pubs. And pubs are social hubs in our area, and uh, good publicans and good com company. Unfortunately, we're too busy working, Madam Deputy Speaker, to be able to go in too often. Um, I know they will be welcoming these measures when they uh, notice them on the news later. The other thing I particularly was interested in was the tax relief for savers, the new British ISA providing an extra £5,000 tax-free allowance. Yes, I must stop. For, I, I'm getting the, 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 the nod from the, the, the Deputy Speaker. But I would like to welcome that. 
and the increase in the registration for small businesses of the AT. So there's so much in this budget that is good, so much I think that will make a difference to our economy and our country, and I welcome it. Yeah. Seema Malhotra. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And the context in which I speak to this budget today is one of chaos and instability, following on from 14 years of Conservative failure on the economy. This budget has not changed the dial. The reality is that people will still be worse off after the last 14 years. And Sky's Ed Conway shares a graph that he says the Chancellor didn't want to talk about. Uh, which shows that the, after the budget, the UK tax burden will still be uh, heading up to the highest level since the aftermath of the Second World War. So no, this is not a turning point. Household mortgages, mortgage costs are up, prices are still rising, and the tax burden is at a 70-year high. The Chancellor likes to speak of stability, but he seems to forget that he comes from the same party that gave us the former Prime Minister, who was beaten by a lettuce, and her disastrous mini-budget, with its impact on our national debt, our, our businesses, our local council finances and our family finances, those consequences are still playing out and will for years to come. What Britain needs first and foremost is a serious plan for growth. We should be in no doubt, Madam Deputy Speaker, that our low growth, high tax economy is the end game of 14 years of conservatism. The result of the hollowing out of our public sphere, the stripping back of businesses' potential, the levelling down of hope. Official figures show that, that people are worse off at the end of this Parliament compared to the start. The CPI average hourly pay for residents of Feltham and Heston has fallen by 6% since 2019, when it was around £17 in today's prices, and has fallen by 20% since 2010. The number of small businesses in Feltham and Heston has been falling for the past two years running and is now lower than it was in 2019. 40% of children are in relative poverty after housing costs, and it's no surprise that the average family will be £1,200 worse off under the Conservative tax plan, given 25 Tory tax rises since the last election. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, it does not have to be this way, and that's the point, isn't it? There is an alternative to the choices they are making that have left people in Britain worse off while friends and donors do well on that VIP fast lane. Labour has a plan for growth. Growth which leads, leads to businesses thriving, public services stronger, more money in ordinary people's pockets and good, secure jobs, and an end to people and businesses paying more and getting less. A plan for stability and growth that commands national and international confidence and makes Britain the best place to invest and to start and grow a business. Yeah, yeah. Where we become leaders in the green economy of the future, creating opportunity for all. Under Labour, you will have stable and competent political leadership and stable and competent stewardship of the economy. The strengthening of our economic institutions like the Bank of England, the OBR and our new Industrial Strategy Council. How you do politics and how you govern really matters. But under the Tories, business investment has been lagging for years, and today's budget brings more sticking plaster politics and nothing on the support for the cooperative sector and growth. Yeah. But let me say a few words about skills, because we cannot grow our economy without investing in our people. The biggest opportunity we have for inclusion, for our productivity, for our economic growth, for the competitiveness of our nations is a strategy for human talent. A BCG report a few years ago highlighted how human capital is under intense pressure worldwide as powerful forces, globalisation, demographic and regional shifts, digitisation, gain momentum. So, national, so nation states need a national plan. But this budget comes on the back of years of failure and gives no answers to the skills challenges that we face. New official data from September shows worrying trends since 2017 when the last survey was done. The proportion of employers with a skills shortage vacancy has gone up from 6% to 10%. The proportion of the workforce with a skills gap where an employee is judged by the employer to lack full proficiency has gone up from 4.4% to 5.7%. The proportion of employees who had provided training for their staff 
has fallen from 66% to 60%. And meanwhile, the number of apprenticeship starts has plummeted under the Tories by over 200,000 since 2017, with more than three billion of the apprenticeship levy unspent since 2019. Apprenticeship starts in the West Midlands, where I recently visited South and City College in Birmingham with our superb West Midlands mayoral candidate, Richard Parker. Apprenticeship starts in the West Midlands have fallen by over 30% since 2010. And small business engagement with apprenticeships has dropped by a staggering 49% since 2016, something we must change. And this decline has not been an equal an equal one. In 2015, more apprenticeships were started by learners amongst the bottom 40% of, of income distribution. Now they are started by, by those in the top 40%. And the Chancellor rightly talked about the productivity challenge and, and some of that improvement coming from digitalisation and AI. But over half of secondary schools in the UK were not even offering computer science as a GCSE in 2021. And the number of 14 to 19 year old students taking technical IT or computing qualifications has fallen by a third since 2015. Tackling our productivity also needs a plan for our young people. Under a Labour government, Britain's skills plans will be led by a new national skills task force, Skills England, working alongside our industrial strategy, which brings together businesses, training providers and unions to meet the skills needs of the next decade across all of our regions. We'll recruit over a thousand new careers advisors for our schools and colleges, deliver two weeks of work experience for every young person so that young people know the pathways that are available to them. And we will better support our FE sector to support local skills needs where the LSIPs demand it with new technical excellence colleges. And we will transform the apprenticeship levy to bring more flexibility to up to, with up to 50% of the levy spent on courses more flexibly as businesses have called for. Business including the te Tesco, the Co-op, the BRC, the uh, Tech UK, City and Guilds, the British Chamber of Commerce, Superdrug, the CIBD and many others. So let me conclude with this that Britain needs a change, and it is only a changed Labour Party that will deliver it, with a costed plan for all our policies that will drive the change we need in our economy, our NHS, our public services and our communities. They, Madam Deputy Speaker, are out of ideas and they are out of time. And more than, more than anything, this budget has shown what my constituents need and what our economy needs and what our country needs is a Labour government. Yeah. Dame Priti Patel. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, as a former Treasury Minister, I want to thank the Chancellor, but also Treasury Ministers and also government departments, because I actually know how hard it is to put a budget together and the level of representations that are made. And I think also I must put on record my thanks to the Chancellor for his due consideration, I think that's a polite way to put it, that he's given to the representations that I have made and I've consistently made in terms of supply side reforms and lower taxes. He knows exactly the case that I make around fiscal fiscal drag in particular, and for delivering greater efficiencies in government. Um, the Chancellor has put forward a clear plan for the economy and targeted tax cuts, and I'm going to come on to that in a moment, but also around support for businesses and efficiency, um, not just across the board, but in the public sector. And we're never going to get the benefits today, I think, of discussing the ins and outs of the Red Book and the OBR. And, you know, on days like today, if we had much more time, we'd all love it. And I, I can give you that assurance. Um, but I think it's fair to say we must all recognise that there are some fundamental challenges that our economy faces, which, of course, the budget has sought to address. And the Chancellor understands that tight, fine line that he is walking right now, but also how we tackle some of the big issues around the size of the state, um, public spending in particular, which is constantly, when we look at the rate of growth of public spending, it has exceeded the rate of inflation and economic growth. Public spending is now in excess of 1.2 trillion per year, which is approximately around 44% of GDP. Now, I'm old enough to remember back in 97 when public spending was around 35 to 36% of GDP and what a contrast that was. But, you know, as a, as a consequence of sustaining high levels of public spending, we recognise also that tax receipts have risen to over 1.1 trillion. 
And of course, we know what that all means in terms of delivery and getting that balance on taxation, uh, which I maintain is very burdensome and we have to get those rates down. But I do actually pay a lot of tribute to the Chancellor for listening to comments around efficiencies. He has spoken today about a public sector productivity plan. The details of that are going to be fundamental and really important to hear. Um, I was really pleased to hear about the way in which he's looking at cash savings across the economy, um, public spending that is, but also looking at how he is now going to grow aspects of some government spending around, for example, expansions of violence reduction units. We've seen pilots work very well across certain government departments and we now have to look at how we get better delivery from public spending and how that actually drives down real outcomes in government and it's something that I've spoken to the Chief Secretary about over recent months. So I'm pleased to see that there are some concrete proposals heading in the right direction but of course we've got a long way to go. And with that, I want to come on to the area of you know, people keeping more of what they earn, which is a clearly a fundamental conservative principle. And this is where the whole issue of NICS comes back into play. And I've seen the numbers, and clearly you know, we are heading to a direction, Madam Deputy Speaker, where we could even move into the direction where we see low rates of national insurance coming forward. Yet again, we've seen them go down. I think the debate when the legislation comes forward is going to be very interesting. I stood here back in the autumn and there were about three people speaking in favour um, of national insurance coming down and supporting the legislation and everything else. We want to see much more support for it next week. But importantly, I think we've got to get this balance right in terms of incentivising work. Getting national insurance down is fundamental, but actually tackling the number of people that get caught up in terms of high rates of taxation and fiscal drag. The last numbers in the autumn were, meant that four million more people would be brought into paying higher rates of taxation by 2029. We'll go through the OBR and see what this means this time round, but of course it is still significant and we need, know, now know that more work is required in that area. But it will be interesting to see, is this a government that's going to bring national insurance down again successively in future autumn statements too? That's something that we should look at. Clearly I welcome the reduction or the decision to maintain the 5 feet reduction in fuel duty. We've already heard what that means for working households. I've made representations on that and I will always continue to make representations in that area. But also when it comes to business taxes, fiscal events are huge for business taxation. They really are. And I welcome the announcements today on increasing that registration threshold, obviously freezing things such as alcohol duty, but also when it comes to dealing much more on tourism, lowering corporation tax. I've spent many, many times here speaking about low rates of corporation tax. We are now tied into the OECD rates of minimum corporation tax. My views are known on that. But also I want to see greater changes now so that we can see businesses benefit from our Brexit freedoms. So Madam Deputy Speaker, there are many areas that I would like to speak about today. But I think broadly speaking, the direction of travel is really important. I also recognise, though, that I heard um, the benches opposite speak about local government finance. I'm just going to welcome the announcement of £5 million today that being made through the Levelling Up Fund for cultural projects, because actually that comes to my area in Malden too. Um, and these are important measures today that have been announced. It's a tough time, but at the same time, there is a plan that the Chancellor has announced, and we need to stick with that plan and make sure that it delivers for working families. Yeah. Stuart Hosey. It, during his statement today, the Chancellor said, not just higher GDP, but higher GDP per head. Yeah, yeah. Just one slight snag with that. The figures published today for GDP growth per capita, 24 through to 2027, are lower in every single year than the figures they published only a year ago. So it's not higher GDP per head, it's actually lower GDP per head. And I, I use that as a little example, because we hear the rhetoric and the hyperbole that introduces a budget statement, but it rarely stands any scrutiny when one actually reads the budget documentation. Now, I'm absolutely certain that the government can claim they're going to 
meet both their fiscal targets at the end of a five-year future rolling forecast. Uh, I think every government could say they're going to meet their targets at the end of a five-year future rolling forecast. It's what happens in between that's important. Now, they told us a year ago net debt would fall as a share of GDP in 2024-25, and the net borrowing would fall below 3% of GDP in 2025-26. However, by the time of the autumn statement, only five months ago, we were told debt would now not fall until 25-26, a year later, and they still forecast that uh, deficit would fall below 3% of GDP in the same year. We were also told in the spring that GDP growth would exceed 2% in two of the next five years and that productivity would sit between 1% and 1.3% every year across 24 to 27. But by the time we reached November, growth was not forecast to exceed 2% in any of the forecast years. And productivity growth was forecast down in every single exactly. year. Exactly. Today, though, the Chancellor announced while they would still meet their primary debt target in the same year, 25 26, uh, the percentage of debt to GDP would be higher than it was only five months ago. So, debt not really falling, at best, debt stagnating. And GDP growth would still not exceed 2% in any year to 2028. This is really important. Another half decade where GDP growth will not even meet or reach historic trend growth rates. That is absolutely shameful. shameful yeah. And in terms of productivity, the productivity per hour metric which the government like, it is actually lower cumulatively over the new forecast period today than the government announced last November. He said it was a budget for growth, a budget for productivity, a budget for long-term investment. The debt is not really falling as a share of GDP. The deficit is not getting better. It's actually getting worse compared to the forecast last year. And in terms of productivity, that perennial problem which we all recognise exists, productivity, growth, cumulatively, over the entire forecast period is lower than the government announced last November. Uh, of course I'll give way. I'm very grateful for you giving way. Um, does he agree that we've got to increase growth, which we all agree on? We've got to get all parts of the United Kingdom growing. And the, if he looks at the figures from the House of Commons Library, from 2011 to 2021, England grew cumulatively. 14.9%, Wales 13.7%, Scotland 7.2%. Does he agree that the Scottish Government need to do more to stimulate growth in Scotland? Yeah. I agree that we need growth across the piece. If one of the tools to facilitate growth is uh, tax credits, then I'm sure the Minister recognises tax credits are a function of corporation tax. And therefore, if he's genuinely serious about encouraging growth in Scotland. It devolved powers over business taxation yeah, yeah. with their associated tax yeah, credits. Yeah. And we'll see how we get on. The point I wanted to make, and I'm coming to a, a, a conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that whatever else was said at the start of this statement about growth, about productivity, all the hyperbole, all the big introduction, all the fanfare, this budget actually delivers none of these things as evidenced by the numbers the government have published themselves today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam um, Deputy Speaker. Can I commend my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, for his budget statement today? He is, I believe, surely, slowly but surely getting Britain's economy back on the right track. However, we have much work to do. The United Kingdom has, I believe, no business in being a high-tax, low-growth and low-aspiration nation. That is not the Britain that I recognise. The people of Romford are feeling the pinch. The overall burden of tax is higher than it has been since the Second World War. Council tax is rising in the London Borough of Havering yet again. 
that public services are not even meeting the basic expectations. Local government is struggling to remain solvent. The cost of living is hitting my constituents in the pocket very hard, with energy prices rocketing and the daily cost of food and essential shopping rising to unprecedented levels. Inflation remains acute, yet there is little economic growth. Financial prudence may be an important conservative attribute, which is certainly absent from the benches opposite, but there is, Madam Deputy Speaker, nothing less conservative than a record high tax burden. We can and must do very much better. Hard-working families in Rumford want to see lower taxes, higher economic growth and good public services. These three aims can only be achieved if we adopt a robust free enterprise agenda, reduce the size of the state at every level and give the British people the incentives they need to work harder, be more productive and maximise our nation's potential for economic growth. My Essex constituents are entrepreneurs, market traders, small businessmen, shopkeepers and city workers. They do not want to see an economic policy of managed decline, but rather one of heightened ambition and raised expectations. So, that is why I welcome many of the Chancellor's tax announcements today. The additional 2% cut to national insurance contribution means that this Conservative Government has delivered £900 annual tax cut for the average worker. The extended cut to fuel duty will also help hard-working people mitigate the costs of the Mayor of London, who has imposed so much extra costs on my constituents. Child benefit reforms will help millions of hard-working families. The reforms to stamp duty and reduction in capital gains will help millions of property owners. Nevertheless, the Chancellor has repeatedly recalled over recent days that nations with the most economic growth, whether they be in North America or Asia, are those with even lower taxes. I encourage the Chancellor to further emulate these countries' success in the years to come. Low taxes will put money back into the pockets of the British people, leading to higher growth and more resources for public services. My right hon. Friend, the Chancellor, clearly shares this outlook, outlook with his announcements today of tax cuts, investment and reform to boost productivity in the public sector. However, I encourage the Chancellor to go much further. We should follow the footsteps of the Thatcher-Lawson budget, which led to unprecedented economic prosperity in the 1980s and the 1990s. We can and must succeed, but Britain has to be much bolder if we are to reap the benefits by becoming a low-tax, high-growth economy once again. But tax cuts and investment alone will not be enough. We need to adopt a radical plan to free our economy from needless bureaucracy that is holding Britain back. The benefits of becoming a sovereign nation once again following Brexit gives our nation exciting opportunities that we must seize to maximise our ability to generate growth and prosperity that we so desperately need. Margaret Thatcher showed the world how it could be done 40 years ago, rescuing Britain from the perilous situation she inherited following decades of a failed post-war socialist consensus. Today, we live in a post-pandemic world, but if we are to recover from the consequences of lockdowns, a radical approach is required to jumpstart our economy and unshackle ourselves from the red tape and over-regulation and government waste. Britain today is over-governed, so reducing the size and role of the state must now be an imperative for our Conservative government. Regulation and public sector spending do not grow the economy, 
put cash into people's pockets or improve public services. It is the small businessmen in towns like Romford, the shopkeepers in towns like Romford, the people who are the entrepreneurs and market traders, they are the people that will provide and generate the economic prosperity for the future. I am disappointed that unfairness of local authority funding formula has not been addressed. Councils up and down the country, including my own borough, Havering, is facing acute financial pressures. The funding formula is unfair and outdated. It is also uh, discriminatory against boroughs like Havering, Outer London in Essex. It fails to address differences in demographics. Most importantly, it leads to hard-working, tax-paying Britons without services they need and deserve. This issue too requires ambitious reform. Madam De Deputy Speaker, ambition is key. Lower taxes, higher growth, reform and deregulation, exploiting all the advantages of Brexit, investment and reform of the public sector. This is the way forward for Britain. Our government has been right to tread a prudent path back to economic growth, but now is the time to be bold and fearless in the pursuit of greater ambitions we have for the British people. Yeah. Meg Hillier. Yeah. And I think it's quite surreal to follow the honourable gentleman. Like him, I believe in small business, but it's not small business <coughs> and how it grows that's going to fill the problems in the public sector, which has been squeezed under 14 years of this Tory government to the pip squeak. It's not small business, however good it is, that's going to refill our council coffers and make sure the basic services of social services and special educational needs and schools are sold. It's not the small business that will solve the waiting lists in the NHS or bring schools off their knees. And we have seen this government, of course, as well as the years of austerity causing all of these problems, crash the economy in September 22, leaving families and businesses crushed. They may have survived the pandemic, but those that did have faced real hardships since. So this is really a budget of a desperate government, another slew of promises that will not deliver. And on the Public Accounts Committee, that's what we focus on, delivery. We look at optimistic, sometimes well-intentioned promises that fail because there isn't that plan for delivery. But in my own borough, we see such poverty. And earlier than the, in Prime Minister's questions, the Prime Minister said that equality has increased under his government. Uh, inequality has reduced. Not in my borough. 48% of children in Hackney, nearly one in two, live in poverty after housing costs are taken into account. And even in central inner London, we, have, we are the 22nd most deprived local authority in England. And there is real day-to-day -day poverty. And I invite anyone to come with me on my doorstep surgeries and see the reality. And let me tell you a story about that reality. A constituent of mine, it could be many, but this is a particular la lady I visited just a few weeks ago. She lives in a two-bedroom council flat with her husband and four daughters. The flat is only marginally bigger than my office in this building and only a bit smaller than a committee room. Her three, three of her daughters share a very small bedroom with bunk beds. The toddler shares with her parents. The bathroom and kitchen are so tiny you can hardly fit two people in at any one time. They share one living space. And government failures over housing and Brexit mean that our children are also leaving London, which has meant for her that the local school is now closing because our roles are dropping. And the cost of housing means that they have no prospect of moving anywhere else. The shortage of properties uh, in the social rented sector, where there are over 8,000 households now on the waiting list, um, and only 671 homes became available during 21-22 for the last uh, verified figures, compared with over 1,200 in 26 17, and both of which figures could be outstripped by demand, means there's no possibility. And the cost of housing means that uh, many people are being shipped out to temporary homes, ripped from their schools, churches, mosques and communities. Yeah. And that means that this constituency school is closing, as are others. Her four daughters, on top of the overcrowding they've got, need to move. They are a family that works, that wants to do well, but they have little opportunity. And down the road from there is a, the product of government uh, free school policy, a school with 25 pupils per class. So those of you who know how funding works for schools know that that school will never be financially sustainable because you can't, full schools are funded on 30, 60 or 90 per class. So the, the trust that's taken over from the first that failed is struggling with the finances there. So a brand new building built that's unsustainable and yet a government, po government policies that mean other schools are closing. And if you look at housing costs across my borough, it is absolutely wretched. Where so many people are renting privately but unaffordably, 
more people rent socially than in, in private, but living in overcrowded conditions. An average two-bed rent is just under £2,000 a month, and there are 30% fewer privately rented properties available now on right move compared to the pre, pre the pandemic. And there are no properties available to those on low incomes at local housing allowance rates. This is the product, the real day-to-day -day <coughs> impact of government uh, policy. And we have now so many people housed outside the borough of the households in temporary competence. I'll give way. Forgive me if I'm, I'm misunderstanding the way that our system of government works, but isn't social housing and her constituency the responsibility of the Labour Mayor of London? We could perhaps, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm in, indulge the time. I, could, I haven't got time to explain it, but no, not, it, is, it is the responsibility of the council. But because of so many, many properties so, sold off under right to buy, that means that we have fewer properties available. So people like my constituent are living cheek by chow with people who are living in private rented accommodation, often sold to cash buyers if it's above seven storeys, and those people are having to pay private rents at the rate that I, 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 I made. So the differential is extraordinary. The difference means that no one can move from one to the other, and the social rented housing, which is so desperately needed because of the cost of private housing and to buy or to rent, uh, is just not available. My borough, under the, my mayor and the current previous mayor, have been building social housing for social rent, council housing, as have many housing association partners. But because there is no government subsidy for that, every time they build a social rent, they pretty much have to build one to sell at, pro at market rates in order to cross-subsidise. So a quick lesson in social housing economics, but it shows the detachment that people do not realise in this chamber the reality of the lives of people, so many people in London. And if you look at the real human impact, as I say, there are 3,777 children in temporary accommodation from Hackney. That's a enough to fill eight primary schools, equivalent to 1% of the borough's population. And those children want to live in London but cannot afford to do so. And not only can they not afford to do so, but they're being passed from pillar to post, from temporary accommodation to temporary accommodation, yeah. moving school regularly. This is a squeeze on opportunity. Yeah. And for those at the higher end who might be able to get onto the housing ladder, the lifetime ISA, an opportunity missed in this, uh, yeah. in this budget, because it only um, provides support for a property purchase um, up to uh, £450,000 nationally, though it's higher in London. But even that higher rate in London doesn't cover the cost when it's typically £750,000 for a brand new two bedroom property. Who is able to afford that? Yep. And on public spending, the Chancellor merrily talked about reductions um, in spending in most departments. And if you look at you know, the Red Book, I haven't had time to go through it in detail, but we see a huge drop. In, I mean, the Home Office budget alone is going down significantly, which is a concern when you think of all the challenges in policing, immigration, and other security that the Home Office has to deal with. And if you look at education, all of those budgets are reducing. And there are big nasties out there in every department that will cost money for whoever is in power. The civil nuclear decommissioning and rebuilding of our nuclear power stations, the nuclear enterprise, the costs of de decommissioning nuclear submarines. We haven't even done one of those yet. The first will be decommissioned in 2026, and that is an, a becoming an urgent crisis. The 700,000 pupils in crumbling schools. These are just some of the examples of, of issues where we really need, and, uh, need the, the input. The schools budget, the Department for Education wanted four billion a year to build the new schools that were necessary, it was granted 2.7 billion and we already see its capital budget reducing. Mm. And the government talked the, the Chancellor talked about public sector public productivity and reform. Well Public Accounts Committee, which I'm proud to chair, examines this endlessly. And too often we see, as I said at the beginning, there's optimistic plans which don't deliver. But the Chancellor's already spending what he's promising to deliver on that. And let me tell you all, oh, it takes a long time. We do need to have reform. We do need to see digital transformation. But you can't deliver those changes and those budget savings overnight. We, what we need is a long-term approach, slow politics, if you like, where both sides of this House, whoever is in government, agrees that some things just have to happen and aren't at the, the, the whim and the will of a, a government that's on its last desperate stages to try and prove that it's got something to offer to the British public. I'll so give way briefly. She's making an excellent speech about, uh, speech about all the things that have not been in the budget. Does she agree that the biggest missed opportunity is not investment into the green transition? There are, there are so many missed opportunities, Madam Deputy Speaker. But the child benefit issue, one point on this, it, is, it was a mess of this government's making. They have now broken the independent taxation rule, and that is a problem. But this government has broken Britain. My constituents are worse off than they were 14 years ago, and worse they have no hope. So we need to see a government that will deliver hope 
opportunity, housing, school improvements and cutting waiting lists. We need to mend broken Britain. We need a general election and a Labour government now. Yeah. John Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, a single budget rarely in itself makes a substantial difference or is remembered. However, a budget that is part of a story, a sense of direction is important and it can help to continue a narrative and build a vision. This budget, in my view, is one such occasion. A clear vision of where we want to go, in particular with regards to tax and, of course, growth. Last autumn, the Chancellor started this uh, sense of uh, purpose and set out a direction. First of all, supporting business with full expensing, and secondly, supporting those who are in work with a 2% reduction in national insurance. This budget continues that direction of travel and is one which I fully support. A further two pence reduction in national insurance is welcome and will be welcomed by all those in work. The equivalent has already been said of £900 per annum. And it also has help for those who are self-employed as well. And if I was to make one suggestion to my party as it continues this narrative and looks to a, the manifesto and a commitment at the next election is to reduce national insurance further and indeed to ultimately abolish it. I fully agree with the Chancellor that simplifying the tax system, especially for those who are actually in work, is something that should be a priority. And of course, I just touched on some of the other budget measures, the freeze and fuel duty taxes, helping all motorists, alcohol tax freeze, the expansion of childcare, and further support for business with the VAT threshold rising and full expensing extended to leasing. And of course, the public sector support, the 40,000 new doctors, 71,000 additional nurses and 20,000 new police officers do demonstrate our commitment to public services. But budgets cannot be seen in isolation, and there are plenty of other things going on. Unemployment remains historically low, which benefits families and individuals up and down the country. The living wage will rise by 11%. 25% higher in real terms than it was in 2010. Inflation at 4% and will fall further, in my view, will probably be well below 2% by the summer, and that will allow interest rates to start to fall. And it's not all about work. We also have pensions, with a rise of, about, of around 8% coming, benefits of the triple lock, which has taken over 200,000 pensioners out of poverty. But the ultimate goal is growth in the economy, we have fared better than many other European uh, partners, but clearly we want to see growth right across all regions of the United Kingdom. And to achieve this, we need the correct ingredients at both the national and local levels. Investment, skills, lower taxes, less regulation, all leads to higher productivity and therefore a wealthier society. And I give a local example of my own constituency of Carlisle. It is extremely well placed to grow significantly through national and local support. There is over half a billion pounds of investment in place, progressing now or about to be undertaken. That is transformational investment, digital investment for a modern economy, roads, we have a, a link road, £220 million improvement, which will improve connectivity locally and right across the region. A railway station undergoing refurbishment, bringing it into the modern age, the gateway to everywhere for that region. A university, the skills of tomorrow, but going to be located in the city centre, helping to regenerate the city centre and grow the local economy there, as well as create the skills for tomorrow. And a medical school opening in 2025, which will improve the health economy. And as for the talk about housing, I always say to people, remember, we do not have a national housing market. It is regional, and we still have affordable housing in our Carlisle and an attractive place to come and live and work. And on the back of that, we have a garden village, 10,000 new homes, which will allow the city to expand in an appropriate way. Madam Deputy Speaker, in my view, Carlisle demonstrates success at the local level. Investment, skills development, better connectivity, low unemployment, room for growth, levelling up in action. The budget is part of the equation which can help to achieve and support growth in Carlisle and across the country. I support it because it sets out that we are in the right direction for both our country and, of course, my city of Carlisle. Luke Pollard. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This was a budget for job preservation, but the job preservation of Conservative MPs in marginal seats. It is the epitome of short-termism and sticking plaster politics. It wasn't what Britain needed, and I'm afraid it may not be enough for the Conservatives to get themselves re-elected. Madam Deputy Speaker, there are five areas I briefly want to touch on on behalf of the people I represent in Plymouth. Firstly, on housing. I was disappointed there wasn't more on housing to help people get onto the property ladder, especially in areas of acute housing stress. In the far southwest, there is a real pressure on house prices, both for rent and for buying. We've been decimated and hollowed out as an area by second homes and Airbnbs. And although I welcome changes to the furnished holiday lets regime, it won't deal with the scourge of second homes that are hollowing out our communities and leaving them empty for much of the year. Plymouth has a housing crisis, largely compounded by the fact that the rural and coastal communities around us are experiencing an even deeper housing crisis with a lack of affordable housing. And I would like to have seen more in the budget to support councils like Plymouth who want to build, build, build. I want to see more density in our city centre, and I hope the government could be supporting that, supporting councils like Plymouth, a Labour-run council, with a plan to build greater density in the city centre, thousands of more homes next to transport hubs, next to places of work, next to a vibrant city centre. That's what I want to see more from, from the government, but there wasn't enough in there. Secondly, on nurseries, I welcome the possibly transformative change that a government focus on childcare could bring. It's a really significant moment of helping people back into the world of work. But I worry that not enough preparation has been done to get it right. In only a few weeks' time, it will be implemented, but there has not been enough effort on skills, on recruitment, on retention, on the viability of nurseries, small nurseries, especially those in poor communities. We're only weeks away, and I really hope the Chancellor would have added and supported those nurseries who want to see the expanded uh, provision but can't afford to do so and that's especially true in communities like mine where parents can't afford the compulsory top-ups to give their uh, kids a place in nursery care that's simply not good enough um, thirdly, on the key and bomb, Madam Deputy Speaker, you will have seen over the past few weeks the incredible effort by our armed forces, the police, Plymouth City Council and others to support the community after the discovery of the World War II bomb. I want to say thank you to everyone who put their lives on the line, especially the Royal Navy and Army bomb disposal squads. But it did highlight a particular Treasury problem, and that is that there's an insurance loophole that insurers can use and have used when the bomb was discovered in Exeter a few years ago to claim that insurance policies are not valid due to an act of war loophole. This is an act of war loophole that was 80 years ago and I would like to invite the government to speak with myself and the member for Exeter about how we can sunset that clause, how we can make sure that if you buy an insurance policy for your household or your business, you know that you'll be insured if the worst happens because let's face it, there are still thousands of undiscovered World War II bombs out there. Fourthly, and very briefly, I want to see more support for care leaders. This is something that I think matters to all of us in this House. And I think there are opportunities that, frankly, do not cost that much money to support care leavers, in particular getting their first home after they leave care on their 18th birthday. A national rent deposit guarantee scheme and a national rent guarantor scheme would fundamentally transform the first opportunity, the life chances of young people leaving care, because they don't have access to a bank of mum and dad or someone to guarantee their rent in their first uh, home in the private sector. Working with Bernardo's, we estimate this will cost £30 million to set up. This is, £30 million is a lot of money, but in the big scheme of things, £30 million for changing the life chances of all those thousands of young people in care is money well spent. I'd like to see the government look at that. Finally, I'd like to see a greater fair share for the far south west. Whichever government sits on those benches after the next election will be formed of MPs from the southwest of England. And I would like to see the regional variations in spending addressed, because in Plymouth we only get above average spending on one area of government spending and one area alone, and that is defence. With the largest naval base in Western Europe in the constituency I represent, I'm proud to stand up for armed forces, but on health, education, skills, transport, housing, we're below average. And there should be no reason why any child in Plymouth is worse less than the national average. In fact, we need more of them. Uh, more um, fairness in our system to let them achieve their true potential. Madam Deputy Speaker, this uh, budget, I'm afraid, is a pre-election budget that I think yeah. the public will see through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not the long-term plan that I think we were really looking for, 
mortgage payments higher, weekly shops more expensive, food bank use up, inequality up, tax burden the highest in 70 years, our economy in recession, <laughs> taking with one hand, <clears throat> giving with one hand and taking with another. I think one thing is clear, it's time for a general election and I look forward to the Prime Minister putting out his lectum without the logo on in the next two weeks <laughs> and letting the people decide who they want to be in power. It's time for a fresh start. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chris Grayling. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Pleasure to follow on the... Uh, uh, the, the member for Plymouth, and uh, I think I, I would echo what he said. I think the uh, the emergency service did an extraordinary job yeah, 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 yeah. with uh, yeah. removing the bomb in what could have been a very, very horrible situation. Um, but I listen to what the other side is saying, and I, I, I listen in vain for any actual plan. Um, what we seem to be hearing instead um, is a whole series of shopping list items with no sense at all of the actual economic reality of the moment. And the economic reality is very straightforward. We have, over the past four years, dealt with the biggest public health crisis in a century. We've dealt with the biggest security crisis in Europe for 75 years. We have dealt with an international resurgence of both inflation and rising interest rates. And still, at the end of this, actually, we have an economy that's doing far better than those on the far side said would happen, an economy that still has some of the lowest levels of unemployment for decades, and an employment, an economy which is turning the corner, which is forecast to grow, and which is attracting investment. You know, we are number three in the world for attracting inter inward investment. We heard today about AstraZeneca's plans in Cambridge and on Merseyside. These are good news stories, and they're good news stories happening because this country remains a good place to do business. It remains a place that attracts international organisations to base themselves here. Um, but nonetheless, we are a country like the whole of the Western world, uh, other European countries face the same challenges that we, have, we are, uh, where actually the answers are not simple, they're not straightforward. And I listen to what the other side are saying, who seem to suggest that some magic solution, if somehow they manage to transform themselves into the government of the day, the world will be fine. Well, I can assure them in the unlikely event of that happening, they will find all the same issues that we're dealing with. Uh, the difference is they will get the solutions wrong. Instead of bringing down taxes, instead of taking steps as the Chancellor did in the autumn statement to drive investment, they would do the opposite. They would put up taxes, they would put up public spending and they will stifle our economy. And that's why they do not offer a solution for the future. It's why actually a Labour government would be profoundly damaging for this country. Uh, and we do need to remember, Madam Deputy Speaker, back in 2010, we inherited 2.7 million people unemployed and rising. We inherited a million unemployed young people. And here we are, 14 years later, still with historically low levels of unemployment. Yes, with challenges in the labour market, and I want to talk a little bit about those. But nonetheless, of all the economic challenges any nation faces, I've always believed that unemployment is the highest. Because unemployment creates real human misery. And the fact that we do not have the level of unemployment that we inherited 14 years ago, I think is a huge plus for this country. Now, the reality is we do need to return to some of the principles we put in place back in 2010, because we have too many people outside the workforce, too many people on long-term sick benefits. We had, at that time, some very proactive programmes to help those people back into work. And I think we need to recapture that now in the aftermath of the pandemic. But I'll tell you one thing, Madam Deputy Speaker, that is not a solution, and that is what the other side is offering, which is a system without sanction. Because at the end of the day, those people who can work, those people who should work, should not be sitting at home on benefits. And those, even those on sickness benefits, for the vast majority, there's always the potential to return to work. Perhaps to do something different to what they've done before, with the right help and support, they can get to a better place because nobody benefits from sitting at home on benefits the rest of their lives. It destroys lives, it destroys health. Uh, but if there is no stick to go with the carrot, then actually you achieve far less than you should do. So the idea that an alternative that says, well, we'll provide support, but there's no consequences for those who don't take it, is simply nonsense. Um, we have to get back to very proactive carrot and stick approaches. The welfare state is a ladder up which people should climb. It is not a place in which they should live. But I also want to talk, Madam Deputy Speaker, a little about the aviation sector. Uh, I'm sorry to see that we are putting up taxes on air passengers, um, mm. albeit in the higher classes, because in the end, what that does is it drives traffic out of the United Kingdom. People change on the continent or in Dublin 
uh, because it's cheaper to do so. So I hope those measures will be temporary, and I don't want to see further measures that will drive down competitiveness of that sector in the UK. But at the same time, I am very pleased to see the investment in uh, helping the development of sustainable fuels for the aviation sector, the announcement the Chancellor made earlier in the week. That is very welcome. It is very necessary because, as I said at Prime Minister's questions, uh, this is an essential area for the aviation sector going forwards. Uh, it can only take serious steps towards net zero if it transforms the fuels it use, uses, and certainly for both long-haul flights and for the immediate future, sustainable aviation fuels, synthetic fuels, are the only way in which can, it can take those steps towards net zero. Uh, and I don't want to see a situation where our industry buys all its fuels from other countries. Uh, as I said earlier, the, uh, the, the, the United States is at the moment the source of sustainable fuels for UK airlines. Now, that may be fine right now, but we have got to take quick steps to ensure that we have an industry in this country. And that requires, over the coming months, uh, the Department of Transport and the Treasury working together to accelerate the, uh, the process of setting out its plans for the SAF mandate, setting out uh, plans for a price support mechanism so that immediately after the election, whoever is in power can put those plans into place straight away. That is essential to the future of the industry in this country. And actually, it's not just about aviation. It's about jobs in parts of the country that need jobs. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I hope the Treasury will put its foot on the gas when it comes to sustainable fuels to make sure that happens quickly. I hope the Department for Work and Pensions will be bold in stepping up both the support and the consequences of refusal to accept that support from those who are long-term unemployed. Uh, but I say to the Treasury, I think in a difficult set of circumstances, they've produced a pretty good balanced budget, and I commend them for it. Julian Knight. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so I, I, uh, I have to say I won't be giving way in this uh, short speech, and I'll keep my comments uh, relatively uh, brief. As someone who uh, passionately believes in a free market and a small state, I find the national figures, debt figures, in this budget truly appalling. Let's be clear. We've gone from a position of 37% national debt just prior to the national crisis to close to 100% today. That is a two and a half times increase, most of which under, well, a Conservative majority government, under its watch, a Conservative government of all things. Now, there have been tribulations, but there have been also huge missteps since 2010. This means that we have an increase in national debt equivalent to the first two years of the Second World War, when we were fighting for our very lives against the Nazis. No one can say that anything in this period of time remotely approaches that. In the 1960s and 70s, governments of the day had an excuse. They were recovering from the economic dislocation of the Second World War. We have no such excuse for this appalling financial mismanagement, apart from our indolence and lack of political will. So what has gone wrong, Madam Deputy Speaker? I can send a lot of blame at the door of George Osborne and the public school died in the wall establishment clique that run the modern day Conservative Party. 2010 and 2015 were huge opportunities to reset the relationship between the state, the individual and businesses who are the only means of growing the tax base in this economy. So-called austerity was nothing more than a reduced increase in government expenditure. Government should have been made slimmer, fitter and supply-side economics should have been the core of everything that we did. Instead, we had George Osborne talking about parking the tanks on Labour's lawn. Well, looking at the Ipsos polling, Madam Deputy Speaker, how has that worked out, eh? Secondly, the reason why we're in the state that we're in, that we have failed to grasp the opportunities of Brexit. This should have been an opportunity to deregulate en masse and to make our economy fitter, stronger and to outcompete the Europeans. Instead, the very first move post-Brexit was, was to impose VAT on tourists, a move which has been devastatingly uh, counterproductive. That is just an example of the way in which we have failed on Brexit. We have lost and we have shown absolutely no will to grasp those opportunities. If you're going to support Brexit, then you have to do it properly. It's the only way to have actually done it if you actually believed in it. And we have failed in our will. 
As a nation, as the borrowing figures show, as well as fiscal and monetary policy, we are addicted to debt and printing money in order not to face the hard choices, which could actually be golden opportunities. As a result, this country's finances are more vulnerable than they have ever been. We are no longer part of the European financial ecosystem. We are alone. All we are doing is borrowing more, paying ourselves more for producing less. Unless the supply side is properly tackled by a bold government, I can see this nation being back at the door of the IMF, just like in 1976, and saying, frankly, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we aren't as bad as the Italians is a joke. This budget was supposed to be a do or die, but looking at the documents and the wider polling, it's more not do, and then unfortunately we die. The crying shame is, Madam Deputy Speaker, at least Blair had to work for his landslide. Finally, I reflect on my last words in this place before I chose to recuse myself voluntarily. They were, frankly, I've had enough. And to be honest with you, speaking to the British people on the doorsteps as I have been doing and talking to my constituents, I'm really sorry to say that is precisely the verdict that will be delivered on the government in the very near future. Sir David Davis. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's rather sad to follow on from that speech. I'll just remind the Honourable Gentleman of a one in 75 year financial crisis, a one in a century uh, health crisis, and a one in a 75 year international crisis in Europe, uh, all of which uh, contributed dramatically to the problems he uh, outlined, uh, much more than. Uh, albeit, albeit I may be on the same side as him when dealing with the public school uh, uh, tendency in my party. Uh, I don't blame them for this. Uh, and my old friend give way. Uh, <laughs> of course, absolutely. Every, every opposition has its day. I, I would just like to say we're not all that bad. <laughs> well, I might return to that uh, shortly. <laughs> But the, but the simple truth is that, uh, like my, uh, like the, uh, my right honourable friend who spoke before me on this side, um, I think the Chancellor has done a very skilful job in dealing with an extraordinarily difficult backdrop. Now, now I think there are more, there are more things he could do, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Although much of it is down to the structure of government decision making rather than his fault. But as the leader of the opposition said himself, we were dealing, for example with a world in which Putin had weaponized supply chains and destroyed the economic basis uh, uh, of our anti-inflation policy that worked for the previous 10 years. So I understand the caution uh, that the Chancellor displayed uh, and his desire to retain the confidence of the markets in his, in his decisions today. Uh, and in, against that, I guess it's remarkable that he's taken 20 billion out of national insurance uh, for 27 million people, about 900 ahead, and another 2 million self-employed. Uh, and I think, frankly, I mean, people are underestimating the success the government has had in terms of inflation reduction uh, and in terms of employment. For most of my time in this House, the idea of 800 new jobs a day, every day for an entire government's tenure, would be extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. It certainly didn't happen under the previous uh, Labour government. So uh, we have uh, quite a lot to be happy about. That being said, if I had had my way, I would not have gone for national insurance. I would have gone for reducing income tax. Mm. Uh, why do I say that? Well, there's been a lot of assertions made in the public domain, but I think probably emanating from the Treasury, that national insurance is less inflationary than income tax. This is bogus nonsense. The only argument they have to, su to support that is that uh, national insurance will pull into... Uh, into the uh, employment pool some tens of thousands more, uh, more people. Well, so will cutting income tax. And indeed, because income tax applies to people above the age of 65, it will also keep people in the workforce, highly skilled, highly capable people who we don't want to retire at the moment. So I actually would have preferred uh, an income tax cut rather than a national insurance cut. Uh, but we've got what we've got, it's better, it's much better than we probably would have got from the other side. While I'm on income tax, I just want to make one point en passant. In every budget we have, I raise the question of IR35, because it is oppressive on small businesses and self-employed, 
It drives people out of the country. The Public Accounts Committee is, is actually looking into it, and I hope they'll come up with a conclusion at some point soon. And I really, really will keep at the government to deal with IR35 and deal with the loan charge, which is a related issue and which is, frankly, uh, the HMRC is behaving in a barbaric manner, reminiscent of the post office. Uh, so I'll come back to the, uh, um, in some time. Now, there are a number of structural things I will go into raise. The member for Wokingham uh, made the points I was going to make on the Bank of England. I think the current structure of the Bank of England, the current guidelines and rules of the Bank of England are flawed in a big way. They handicap the way governments can operate, uh, uh, both in terms of their fiscal policy, but also in terms of their inflation policy. And I really do think we need to, to readdress that, and he, he made a very good point there. But also, I want to deal with the issue of the OBR. I think it was George Osborne who created a circumstance under which the OBR sets the guidelines, sets the, the, the fiscal rules almost for the government in place. And of course the government then is terrified of what the markets will do if it doesn't follow the, the OBR's attitude. Well, I understand the, the Prime Minister has um, a picture of Nigel Lawson in his, uh, in his study. Uh, and he ought to read Lawson, because Lawson's view on forecasts, economic forecasts of any sort, whether they were pseudo-economic or pseudo-technical uh, nonsense. He did not believe in forecasts, and, and we would do uh, much to learn from him. Because I think the whole British establishment is suffering from a collective delusion in the amount of authority it, it rests in what the OBR does. Uh, and what, in fact, what all government forecasting does. Let me give the House some examples. The Bank of England's forecast failed to predict the worst inflation crisis in modern times. In 2022, the OBR's UK, UK borrowing forecast was over 100 billion off the mark. 100 billion. <laughs> Last year, the ONS, not in forecasting, just in measuring, announced revisions which added 50 billion to the size of the British economy. Samuel Gordon turned around and said well, they've completely rewritten the story of, of post-COVID Britain, which they did. Uh, and a new report on the OBR suggested that since 2010, the combined total of OBR's errors in growth forecasts aggregates to over 500 billion, and its errors in forecasting public sector debt accumulate to over 600 billion. This is the mechanism that, that chancellors are using to decide how much tax they can afford to cut. Uh, and it works to remind people that the fiscal, the fiscal rule is that we should see a reduction in the percentage of the economy, a uh, reduction in the percentage of the economy uh, 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 in 2029. That's the difference between two guesses. It's not a rational way to run an economy at all. Well, I'm right I'm, I, 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 I will give away. Oh. Uh, great to give away. I, I particularly was struck by the, uh, uh, the change to capital gains tax and the, uh, uh, the reference to the LAFICO. But does he agree with me that it's disappointing the OBR particularly still does not appear to, to look at dynamic impacts of tax changes in a way I think is essential for the future? Well, I'm uh, entirely right. But the, but the... Or, order. Or, order. Just before we move on, I think interventions are absolutely marvellous. Um, however, those who have spoken, do be conscious that we are trying to get everybody in with equal time. And my um, advice and remains six minutes um, per speaker. Sir David Davis, who will oh, notice that he's slightly over that now. I'll ask him to say I'll cut what I was going to say about productivity. Um, Given the issues we have, one of the rules that should have used to apply in this House was we had something, uh, a, a, a general amendment arrangement uh, after the budget. That disappeared in 2017, which means that we cannot change the budget except in very, very narrow ways. And what this might almost have been a point of order, Madam Deputy Speaker, rather than part of the speech, but I, I make a plea to the members on the front bench to ask the, the, the Chancellor whether we can have uh, a general amendment arrangement at the end of this budget. Sammy Wilson. I suspect that from the speeches on the other side of the House that whilst uh, members have given some welcome to this budget, there is still a great deal of disquiet about it because I'm sure that all of the members on the other side were hoping that the Chancellor would come out with a budget which was a Conservative budget which gave them a banner under which they could march towards a general election. And instead, quite frankly, 
we have got what can only be described as an old Mother Hubbard budget. Because whilst the Chancellor would have loved to have thrown bones to the electorate, nice juicy bones that they could bite on and then be happy to vote for the Conservative Party at the next election, in effect, the cupboard is bare. And the cupboard is bare not because of past government's mismanagement. The cupboard is bare because of this management of the government, which has been in power for 14 years. From costly lockdowns, which were badly thought out and the economic consequences never thought of, to the ongoing billions being spent on net zero in the belief that somehow or other we can alter the world's climate, to the failed opportunities which Brexit gave, and to the staggering tax burden under which the economy is now stumbling and therefore has not been able to grow. All of that is a result of decisions that were made by the government, and this budget is a manifestation of the consequences of that. When we look at the detail of the budget, at first sight it seems that maybe there is much good in it, the national insurance contribution reduction, until we remember that the figures in the Red Book and the OBR figures show that the impact of that is wiped out by the stealth tax which is imposed on the UK population as a result of not moving tax thresholds. Even when we look at the VAT lift for small businesses from 80,000 to 85,000, it does not even begin to take into consideration the inflationary impact that there has been over the period in which that limit has been in place. Or the child benefit changes from 50,000 to 60,000. Had inflation been put uh, uh, been accounted for, that should have been lifted to 62,500. So stealth taxes are still being imposed, even though they are presented as improvements. And I, I welcome the fact that some small businesses will be lifted out of the, the, the VAT tax threshold. I welcome the fact that people will have less uh, national insurance contributions and that squeezed middle income families will have additional money, which hopefully will encourage them to go into work. But the fact of the matter is that once the headline is stripped away, one sees that this budget is not quite as generous and the bones are not quite as juicy as what the Chancellor would have us believe. I want to just mention a couple of specific things in relation to Northern Ireland. First of all, I welcome the Barnet consequences for Northern Ireland, the fact that the, the, the town um, uh, uh, fund has been extended to Coleraine, and I will be interested to see how the global trade arrangements um, are, help uh, firms in my um, uh, uh, part of uh, the United Kingdom to expand their export uh, potential. But underlying the difficulties which are being faced by the um, the, the renewed storm at assembly. I know that in the past they could be criticised because they didn't take tough decisions. Successive Sinn Féin ministers, and we've had three of them in the Department of Finance, did not even bring forward a budget that could be agreed and allowed spending to get out of control. But the fact of the matter is that the funding formula, and the Treasury accept this, the funding formula applied to Northern Ireland is different than the, fu the funding formula which applies to Scotland and Wales and has led to a huge fiscal gap. And I do not believe that, it is imp that, 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 that one part of the United Kingdom should be treated differently in this way. And it is disappointing to see that in the budget um, that has uh, not been ad addressed. The second thing I would say is that I do welcome the uh, fuel allowance and the fact that we um, have not had an increase in the fuel allowance because, of course, Northern Ireland being much more rural uh, um, and reliant more on, on uh, private transport in the form of lorries to bring goods in and take goods out, fuel duty would have added significantly to costs and to inflation. The Government has, in the budget, talked about new capital allowances. I trust that the capital allowances 
will be applied and HMRC, and I think this is something the Chancellor should be looking at, where well, the government makes these policy announcements, when it comes to HMRC implementing them, it sometimes doesn't work the same on the ground. Last, in the last budget, research and development allowances were, were given. Hundreds of firms have been turned down for those allowances on the basis that they, weren't, they didn't comply or whatever. And one wonders, does Treasury um, take a different view than the government? Let's not lose too much revenue and let's make the process uh, to, uh, much more difficult. In finishing, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, can I just say that I think that as a result of bad management, there's, little, there's been little room for manoeuvre. And I think that the great concern, whether it's another Conservative government or a Labour government, is that this budget lays up and stores huge problems for the future in uh, costs which are going to explode and in unresolved compensation issues as well, which will still have to be paid. Uh, Sir Jacob rees mogg Thank you, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for East Antrim, and particularly my right hon. Friend, the Member for Holden, Price and Howden, who made such a very important speech, in, particularly in his references to the OBR. And I think it was telling that the Chancellor started his speech by pointing out, at least inadvertently, it wasn't a deliberate attack, but how many things the OBR has got wrong. And this is a real problem for policy making, because we look at these forecasts as if they are holy writ, as if they are authoritative, as if they will be right, and then we make decisions on comparatively small amounts, assuming that the forecasts are fundamentally right and say that when it all adds up, it all adds up, but of course it doesn't. So let's look at the increase from £85,000 to £90,000 in VAT. This is an absolutely splendid policy, a really fundamentally good policy. It makes life easier for small businesses and is thoroughly welcome. And it costs £150 million. Now, this, out of a budget of £1.216 trillion, is 0.01%. It is utterly trivial. And yet, the government doesn't go further because it says it can't afford it. Well, yes, of course it can, because this level is a rounding error within the whole total of what the government is doing. And unfortunately, that is the problem of this whole approach. In as far as it goes, it is perfectly good. And the economic circumstances have been tricky. There was £400 billion spent in support over Covid, which was, I think, the right thing to have done. But what we need to be doing is not the nickel and diming that is being done at the moment, but to look at the fundamentals of where our tax and spend policy is. That 1216 trillion, 1 1.216 trillion pounds, is 44.5% of GDP that we are spending. That is too much. It is more than the country can afford. And that's the starting point, because from that it means we're taxing too much. And I believe there is a report in the Daily Telegraph that says that we will not quite reach the tax as a percentage of GDP that we did in 1948. We will just have swerved our highest tax level uh, in the post-war period. But that is because we are spending too much, and we need to get spending under control. So I think it was a pity that the Chancellor stuck with the 1% real terms increase in public expenditure. We should be making public expenditure flat in real terms, and we need to recognise that the best way to afford public expenditure is through economic growth. And it is a matter for rejoicing I know that the people in North East Somerset will be delighted that at last, and the Chancellor mentioned this himself, the OBR and the Bank of England and the Treasury have been willing to look at a particular tax and see if cutting it makes things better. So the 28 to 24 per cent on property, and I do own properties, so I refer to my register of interest, um, may be beneficial to me personally, but it shows that Laffer works when even the Treasury and the OBR come round to thinking about it. But where else could that be done? 
The Honourable Gentleman, the member for Solihull, mentioned the tourist tax. Now, the tourist tax is the <coughs> easiest tax for the government to have got rid of. We know all the evidence is there that it costs the economy and the Treasury money, and yet it ploughs ahead with this obstinate view that a tax rate produces a set amount of tax which we know to be false. Otherwise, go back to 1979, when 98% tax rates raised much less money than 40% tax rates ultimately did. And this is why I'm not at all keen on the attack on non-DOMs. Yeah, exactly. well the OBR forecast expects 350,000 immigrants to come to this country net every year to 2028-29. That is built into their forecasts. We need to get control of that. We need to get control of people who are coming in and undercutting the British workforce and lowering wages in things like social care. That's right. On the other hand, we want as many billionaires who are willing to come because they are very small in number and they contribute very largely to the economy. Attacking them, making it harder for them, may be some may, means of stealing the Labour Party's clothes, but is not good economic policy. Uh, of course, I'll get away with my right-hand friend. Doubly so, because other countries, post-Brexit, particularly France, have actively set out to drag those billionaires into their own countries. France, Italy, Portugal, our oldest ally. Yes, absolutely. Other countries are competing for the very rich, who will go there rather than coming here. I'm also not in favour of the extra tax on oil companies. We need more oil and gas. One of the reasons our productivity has been low and our economy is stagnant compared to the United States is our much higher energy prices. We need to wean ourselves from the green ideology, which is making us cold and poor. It is one of the biggest factors in undermining economic growth in the last 15 years, and we shouldn't be attacking the oil companies. We should be welcoming, welcoming them and encouraging them. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, the time limit is very tight, but there is good news that members of this House will like to know that the um, finance bill is unlimited, so I look forward to resuming my comments when the finance bill comes to its second reading. Dame Diana Johnson. I'm yes. surprised to know that I won't be talking about billionaires, but I will be talking about ordinary people who live in my constituency of Hull North and how this budget provides very little for them. It also provides very little investment, which we are desperately in need of in Hull and the Humber. And it exposes, I think, the reality of what levelling up actually means for the North as we come to the end of this Parliament. It's trifling, it's not transformative. The government talked about the Chancellor mentioned today, Canary Wharf. That's an area that I don't think is in need of levelling up. But if you look at the Hull and East Riding's devolution deal, which comes with a headline catching funding of 400 million, but spread over 30 years, that's 13.3 million a year shared between two councils. Nowhere near reversing Hull's loss of 111 million a year since 2010. Yeah. And in direct contrast to the government's economic transformation and integration deal with Rwanda, which comes with at least 370 million over five years, averaging 74 million pounds a year for levelling up in Rwanda. I want to focus the main part of my contribution this afternoon on what's not in the bill and that's any compensation for the infected blood victims. Yeah. This is despite 118 members of parliament, 10 parties represented in those 118, who wrote to the Chancellor last week asking him to make uh, an announcement on the allocation of funding for those people. And it also comes after this House defeated the government in December by voting to set up a compensation body in the Victim and Prisoners Bill. Could you take a brief intervention? I will. Yeah. Could I congratulate her on her excellent work on behalf of all our constituents on the contaminated blood? Would she agree with me that for children who've watched their parents go through this, it's very, very heartbreaking? Yeah. The Honourable Lady, who's also campaigned over the years, makes a very good point, and I'm going to come on to that. What we do know is that ministers received the final recommendations on compensation from Sir Brian Landstaff in April 2023. 
they'd also received the framework compensation document from Sir Robert Francis in April 2022 to allow them to prepare for compensation to be paid. But today, there's not even an allocation for further interim payments to alleviate the immediate suffering of those uh, who've lost parents, who've lost children, and children who've lost parents. I want to give you an example of what that looks like. The case of Sam Rushby, whose entire family, mum, dad, and three-month-old baby sister, all died from AIDS by the time that Sam was three years old. He has received no compensation and he would benefit from the interim payments that Sir Brian Langstaff has recommended the government to pay. Paragraph 3.45 on page 77 of the OBR document confirms that they have not been able to take into account plans for compensation. Uh, for contaminated blood victims, as no money has been identified by the Treasury to pay that compensation. I have to say to the OBR as well, they seem to have missed the point that Sir Brian has already made his final recommendations on compensation, and the Government don't need to wait until May to decide what to do next. I also just want to refer to the uh, Chancellor and his views and how they've evolved over time. On the 21st of June 2019, Anne Doricott, the widow of the Chancellor's late constituent, Mike Doricott, who died because of the infected blood scandal, said in giving evidence at the infected blood inquiry how her husband was told in February 2014 by the now Chancellor, don't worry about it, we'll sort it. On the 27th of July 2022, the Chancellor told the Infected Blood Inquiry that it could be seen as a huge failing of democracy that victims had waited so long for justice. Writing on the 3rd of August 2022 with two fellow former Health Secretaries, the current Chancellor wrote to the Government after the first interim report from the Infected Blood Inquiry, which set out that Government should pay interim payments, he, they said this, the victims and their families deserve nothing other than the complete and immediate acceptance of Sir Brian's recommendation. To refuse to do so would simply continue the injustice thus far handed out by the state to a group of innocent victims condemned to years of suffering and neglect. They continued, any delay to, su to such pay for, sorry, any delay to pay, for instance, by arguing that we need to wait for the inquiry to finish, for a new Prime Minister or for Parliament to return, will sadly almost certainly see more of the victims die before they see justice. By the time the Chancellor appeared at the public inquiry on the 28th of July 2023, his views had changed. He said this, it's a very uncomfortable thing for me to say, but I can't ignore the economic and fiscal context because in the end, you know, the country only has the money that it has. And I can't give a sense as to timescales. To play politics with victims of the infected blood scandal is frankly unforgivable. Those infected and affected are not responsible for the economic state of this country. The government have already accepted the moral case for paying compensation. <coughs> Can I just say in conclusion that the approach that ministers are taking, I believe, is tin-eared. No allocation in this budget for compensation. Telling us that they are working at pace but not meeting with any of those infected or affected, not taking soundings from any of the campaign groups, hiring experts to advise ministers and refusing to give the names of those people, decisions taken behind closed doors. This is not the way to treat people who have suffered and been dismissed and ignored for decades. It is a shameful way this government is behaving. Yeah. 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 Deputy Speaker, and I rise to welcome many elements contained in today's budget, notably the cut to the main rate of employees' national insurance of from 10 to 8 per cent, the changes to the high income child benefit, which will help half a million families, and the raising of the VAT threshold for small businesses from 85,000 to 90,000 pounds. And speaking on behalf of many small and medium-sized businesses in Fairham, I know that they will warmly welcome this change. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, the real test for us today is asking ourselves whether these measures announced will turn the tide. Will they turn the tide on the highest tax burden in 70 years since World War II? Will they turn the tide on our prospects of galvanising the British economy 
and stimulating growth after a decade of sluggish uh, productivity? Will they turn the tide and send the message to the British taxpayer that we, the Conservatives, are the party of low tax and on their side? Those are the real questions we need to ask ourselves, honestly and with dispassionate fairness. Because if we are not honest with ourselves, we have no one else to blame if we hand the keys of power to a Labour party. And I want the British people to know what that will mean for them. A Labour government will mean tax rises to fund £28 billion worth of uncosted promises. You're shaking your head. My colleagues over there on the other side are shaking their head, but it is true. A Labour government will mean undoing Brexit and aligning the UK more closely with the European Union and opening our borders to potentially unlimited numbers of people from the EU. A Labour government would also, just as night follows day and as every Labour government has done in our history, leave this country with more unemployment and more job losses than when yeah, yeah, it has yeah. entered government. Yeah, that is yeah. something I do not want to see and I'm incredibly proud that since 2010 we, this Conservative government, has produced and created 800 jobs a day. That jobs miracle is something that we can all be proud of on this side of the house and something that will bring huge prosperity and well-being to millions of people around the country. Now our, our approach as Conservatives must be one of responsible management of the public finances. Yes, we want to cut taxes because that's the way to stimulate growth and then reinvest more tax revenue into delivering first-class public services. I'm very proud of our track record on public service delivery over the last decade, whether it's the increased numbers of doctors and nurses, whether it's the phenomenal improvement in our literacy and numeracy uh, rates in English schools, or whether it is uh, 20,000 new police officers. I'm proud of many of the uh, outcomes that we have produced here thanks to commitment to our vital public services. Just in my local area, Fairham Community Hospital has seen an increase of new services from a new chemotherapy unit to a same-day access to a GP service to a regional uh, a renal dialysis centre all in the last few years or a £58 million worth of investment to a new accident and emergency department at our local hospital of QA. And to be fair to the government, things have been incredibly tough and challenging over the last few years. Needless to say, we paid the wages of millions of people effectively to stay at home. Now, I'm very proud of the furlough scheme, but I do think we all need to reflect again dispassionately and fairly on decisions we made at the time during the pandemic. My own view, with the benefit of hindsight and not absolving myself of any responsibility because I sat in Cabinet at the time of these decisions, was that actually we did spend too much. We did lock down too soon and too hard and we did shut schools down in a way that was harmful rather than helpful. And in the event of a similar pandemic, I hope that we don't make those same mistakes again. I don't blame anyone. That was a time of unprecedented fear and uncertainty. But I do think that we will have to learn the lessons so that in the event of something similar happening, we don't repeat those decisions again. I think we overreached, we overspent, and we overcompensated for what could have been handled in a less damaging way for the economy, for the British people in the medium term. But back to today. Now, if we're serious about putting the British taxpayer first, then personal taxes are a good place to start. That's why I welcome the changes to national insurance but I do agree with my honourable, right honourable friend, the member for Holton, Prowse and Harbin, where my preference would have been a 2p cut off the basic rate of income tax and an increase in the personal allowance and a raising of the ta income tax thresholds to properly fix a tax regime which has become, I'm sad to say, a disincentive to work and endeavour in too many cases. The cuts of 2p off the basic rate and the increase in the personal allowance, say from 12,500 where it currently stands to 20,000 or even something like 15 or 16,000, would have helped poorer households and lift about 20% of all taxpayers out of tax altogether. Cutting income tax rather than national insurance helps a broader range of taxpayer, 
including workers, savers and pensioners. And let me say a word about pensioners because yes, they have the benefit of the triple lock system, uh, but since 2010, it is fair to say that the income tax bill of the retired will have increased by hundreds of pounds. Some estimates put it at 400 pounds. And the value of the triple lock has actually been depleted because of the fixed thresholds <coughs> to income tax, and in particular, the personal allowance. So I do regret that income tax was not chosen as the tax to cut today uh, over national insurance because pensioners have lost out as a result. Yeah, yeah. Those thresholds as well, I think, do need to have been raised to tackle the problem, the invidious problem of fiscal drag. We've seen too many, millions in fact, of people, workers, on low or middle level salaries being dragged into higher tax brackets in a way that was never intended. Nurses, teachers, police officers are now paying a 40% rate of income tax, which was never the plan. And that's because of the frozen thresholds which have not been raised in line with inflation. I think that has, it's been proved now that that is a disincentive to promotion, it's a disincentive to working longer hours. It's a reason why many more people are choosing to take early retirement or to work less. And I think that is a, a, a drag and a, 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 an adverse impact of our tax system today. So I think it's a missed opportunity and I hope that the, the, the Prime Minister does remember his promise that he made during his leadership campaign that he would plan to cut the basic rate of income, income tax eventually in this Parliament. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, how do we actually pay for some of these tax changes? I agree with the comments made by my right hand friend, the member for North East Somerset, that there are, we have to really start questioning the validity of the forecasts and the assessments made by the OBR. I think one way that savings can be made are uh, in relation to uh, looking at net migration and overall levels of legal migration. I'm very pleased that the OBR seems to have shifted away from its orthodox view, its orthodox view having been traditionally that more people coming into the country, largely on low wages, is necessarily a net benefit for the economy. David Miles of the OBR just last month has now attenuated that view by saying that no, we cannot assume there to be fiscal benefits from increased migration. There's also been assessments now that the UK has paid £24 billion since 2020 to cover the costs of non-working migrants. And we also have the IFS which has confirmed that non-EU net migration has had a net fiscal cost overall. So I think getting net migration down is key to saving costs. There are many other areas that I would have liked to have seen in terms of cutting public spending, uh, which have been mentioned already. But I do believe that this is overall a budget which has some welcome elements, but it has also represented somewhat of a missed opportunity to properly send the message that we are on the side of the British taxpayer, we will lower taxes, and we will galvanise the economy to produce growth. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Year after year, I have risen in this chamber as the government watered down its commitments on levelling up, transport and living standards. And now it seems there's nothing much left to water down. And every year, I have called for urgent action to prevent the collapse of our National Health Service. Now the Prime Minister admits his plans failed. The government professes that it stands for law and order, but systematic cuts have seen confidence in our justice system plummet. And just as poverty peaks during this government's cost of living crisis, it's created months of uncertainty of the Household Support Fund for vital services such as food banks. <laughs> Today's budget reaches a pinnacle of 14 years of cynical short-termism under this government. From levelling up to healthcare, this budget fails to deliver for the people of Bradford South. Last week, the Prime Minister went on a so-called levelling up tour claiming that levelling up is about providing people with better opportunities to work, travel and feel proud of where they live. But in 14 years, what opportunities have this government given to the people in Bradford South? Network North is a, shot, is a shell of a broken promise that was once proudly hailed as Northern Powerhouse Rail. In Bradford, rather than offering new high-speed rail lines and enhanced connectivity, we are told to celebrate the announcement of a new platform at Bradford Foster Square. This is not the ambitious and transformative Northern Powerhouse Rail 
promised no less, no less than 60 times by this government. And despite all the talk, Bradford South hasn't seen a penny through the levelling up fund. The opportunity to level up this country has been squandered. And so with the government having betrayed the North with its failed levelling up agenda, what has become of the self-professed party of law and order? The Prime Minister continues to argue that the government's plan to make our streets safer is working. Recent reports show that across half the country, not a single breaking case was solved. That's no conviction in half of the country. And I want to be clear, this speaks to the systematic underfunding of our police. The Conservatives are failing on a basic requirement of government to protect our homes. Police should be fighting crime, not fighting for funding. And so if our streets are less safe, what is the government doing for the National Health Service? More than 34,000 people are now on NHS waiting lists for treatment across Bradford. And the Prime Minister has admitted that he has failed on his pledge to cut waiting lists. The NHS is crying out for funding but today's budget does next to nothing. <coughs> Just two weeks ago, I visited Yorkshire Ambulance Service Station in Bradford South. I spoke to the mechanics who work miracles on an old fleet, keeping ambulances on the road for up to 10 years, far beyond their recommended lifespan. Fixing them is not always possible, and often this leads to skilled paramedic crews stranded and unable to do their jobs of saving lives. The ambulance service is crying out for increased capital investment, but new ambulances, just like the Fortune New Hospitals, are an illusion under this government. We need a healthcare service that is fit for the future. We need a healthcare service that will care for everyone from the cradle to the grave. Today's budget will do little to help the NHS. After 14 years, this government has presided over persistent decline. Just think about what Labour achieved when it was last in government. The shortest waiting times in history, crime down by a third, the cancer guarantee, half a million children out of poverty, the national minimum wage, the fuel, winter fuel allowance, record results in schools, peace in Northern Ireland. This was a record that Britain could be proud of. This was Britain under a Labour government. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sir Robert Sims. Six minutes, Mr Deputy Speaker, is uh, difficult to put all the good things about this budget into my speech, yeah, yeah. but I will try. Um, to start off with the context, we did face the worst public health pandemic for 100 years. We um, took that on and uh, made some difficult decisions because Boris Johnson wanted to save frail people from dying. And I think we sometimes forget uh, how scared and how difficult dealing with that pandemic was. I admit I was somewhat sceptical of lockdown and did vote against 16 times, but you can't <laughs> impugn the motives of the government who are trying to save lives, in, certainly in the first year, in 2020, when we didn't quite know what we were dealing with. And then an awful lot of the additional money was um, funded to keep businesses afloat, some of which had gone on for generations, and to keep people uh, f through furlough in employment. And what we see today actually is a fairly full employment in this country, and a lot of that is down to the fact that the government invested money in people when there was a national emergency. A lot of the problems, therefore, of the government over the past year or two is the consequences of lockdown, the cost of lockdown, and the implications that's had for public services with people working from home, etc. And I think the first thing I'd say about this budget is things are starting to normalise in the sense that we're getting a falling um, deficit. National debt is likely to fall. Growth uh, is likely to pick up over the next two or three years. And because of that, the government, for the second uh, fiscal statement budget in a row, has been able to cut taxation. And not only cut taxation, but cut taxation for 27 million people who are in work to try and improve the incentives for those in work. So I think that is to be welcomed. But the Chancellor had a balance uh, to maintain, because the most important things uh, to do is not only to cut tax, but to get interest rates coming down. And what we see with inflation, which is likely to be 2% um, in the next month or two, is that th that does afford the Bank of England the opportunity to cut rates. And some people in the city think uh, probably by three or four occasions as we uh, go into the summer. Now, if you end up with a situation where you have inflation of 2 or 2.5%, two 
and pay increases going up at 5 and 6 per cent, and you have tax reductions through national insurance, and you have falling interest rates, then inevitably um, the standard of living of many people in this country will be going up. And that means people will have more money to spend and the economy should be able to grow. So there is a plan, and I think the plan is working. I don't actually think single budgets make much difference, but I think they do make a difference when you actually have a fiscal policy set out over two or three fiscal events and budgets which want to take you in a political direction. I must admit, I am a bit of an OBR sceptic. Um, black holes tend to disappear and then arrive. Uh, we, we quite often they produce figures which are wrong. But uh, I think on the whole, um, certainly uh, if you look at it, to have a body to give an independent view does reassure markets. And I'm a bit of a Bank of England sceptic as well, in that I do think the uh, comments of the uh, right on member for Wokingham uh, and the uh, member for, right on member for Health Price are absolutely right. I think we really do need to look at the remit of the Bank of England, and growth should be in there as well as inflation. And um, an interesting thing is that we still, I think, uh, 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 pretend that they, they're independent. And the reality is that because of that, we, we don't give them precise advice on what they should do with the overhang from quantitative easing. And uh, the on, right on the working made a very important point. We have lost 40 or 50 billion on bonds they bought to get us through COVID. And um, that is largely about timing. If you sell bonds when the interest rates are falling, you get better bond prices. If you sell when interest rates have been rising, you get worse bond prices. And the tax cuts in this budget, in terms of uh, national insurance, is about 10 billion. Um, the Bank of England has so far, by mistiming the selling of the bonds it bought in the quantitative easing, has um, uh, wasted five times that. So if one uh, thinks of a world in which we hadn't uh, had to pick up that bill, in which we delayed getting rid of some of the bonds accumulated in quantitative easing, um, to a time when interest rates were falling, then the tax reductions we could have done today would have been far more ambitious. So I hope that as interest rates fall, the losses fall, uh, fall on selling bonds and quantitative easing, that we'll get into a better fiscal position. And I'm sure there's room for another fiscal statement before the next general election. And uh, if there is, then I look forward to further tax cuts as we go ahead. Thank you Cat Smith. Thank you, Speaker. I hope it's not news to anybody uh, in this chamber that the public's trust in politics and politicians is, uh, feels very low right now, and many people have been telling me that they don't feel like their voice is heard in politics. So ahead of uh, the spring budget, I have done a piece of work in my constituency, um, surveying my constituents and going to meetings of pensioners, groups of young people, and, and asking about what people's economic priorities are and match them against what we've heard today in the budget. And I would like to thank all the village newsletters and local papers that have carried my survey so that I've got a detailed idea about what my constituents are concerned about. Um, and if you listen to the ministers uh, crowing over falling inflation in recent months, you'd be forgiven for thinking the cost of living crisis uh, was over. But the 11% high uh, on inflation was because of the decisions made by this government and that budget. Um, and the responses that I received from my constituents make it abundantly clear that this cost of living crisis is not over. Of the hundreds of replies that I received to my survey, over 80% told me that they're actually worse off now um, than they were five years ago. And so the message to the Chancellor uh, has to be that the cost of living crisis is not over. It's very much real and people are really struggling right now. And high energy costs uh, were the most frequently mentioned um, in the survey. And I was literally told chilling stories by my constituents about the steps they've taken to reduce energy bills and um, it particularly affected elderly and disabled constituents. Um, I have cases now of constituents have told me that they've turned off their hot water and heating now completely um, even on the coldest of days due to the increased prices. Other costs commonly mentioned were food prices and mortgages and my constituent Stephen from Lancaster bought his first home last summer but the mini budget and the spike in mortgage rates means that he's paying hundreds of pounds more out of his wages every single month which means that's money that he would like to spend on dental treatment as his NHS dentist closed but he can't. It's money that he needs to spend on his massively increased energy bills but he can't. 
And that was a really good example of the uh, difference, uh, the, the problems faced by so many different constituents in different circumstances. Um, common themes that popped up time and time again were pensioners struggling to make ends meet, people dependent on support from their parents or other family members to pay the bills each month, and people telling me that they were just about managing, but they really struggled to meet those one-off costs such as a car breaking or the washing machine breaking down. And as one constituent put it to me, we're not living, we're existing, mm -hmm. and I want better for my constituents and I want better for the country. Yeah. Um, a YouGov poll commissioned by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation it finds that three quarters of Brits are worried about the current levels of funding for public services and that was very much reflected in the concerns raised by my constituents. Um, no one would be surprised to learn that the most concern was reserved for the NHS with longer waiting lists, poor availability of NHS dentists, with themes that came up time and time again. But constituents were also raising funding for schools, roads, public transport and local authorities who are really struggling to deliver those public services on the ground in my constituency. And I pay tribute to all my local councils, uh, Lancaster, Wire and Lancashire, which are run by a variety of different political combinations, but all face incredibly uh, diff difficult financial settlements. And there's a real fear about the recklessness of tax cuts, the, the impact they could have on public services across Lancashire, um, which comes on top of over a decade of Tory austerity. And one constituent said in the survey, tax cuts will not save our impoverished public services. And I thought I couldn't say any clearer than that. Um, my constituents are also concerned about the levels of inequality we're seeing across the UK and the idea that energy companies don't pay their fair share and yet when they get their energy bills uh, they're really struggling uh, to meet them. Uh, one constituent summed it up as saying reducing taxes for the better off as a pre-election boost does nothing to help ordering people with soaring food and heating bills. And already I'm seeing in my inbox um, emails coming in from pensioners who've already been in touch. They're unhappy that the changes to NI uh, don't benefit pensioners who are really struggling and the triple up does not, um, whilst goes some way, does not actually compensate for the rising cost of living and inflation spiralling out of control. Um, Janet from Pilling uh, was desperately hoping to hear something from the Chancellor about redress for victims of sodium valproate. Both her sons live with lifelong disabilities having been harmed by the drug. Um, and she had held out hope, given that the <coughs> Chancellor in his previous role as Chair of the Health Select Committee knows the heartache and the financial cost paid by these victims. And she's disappointed that there's not been an announcement today regarding redress, particularly as I understand the Government has had an early copy of the Patient Safety Commissioner for England's report on the subject for several months now. So I do urge the Treasury bench to respond at speed to that excellent report and do the deeds to match the Chancellor's words on this matter. And when it comes to redress, I I just want to associate myself with um, comments made by my honourable friend, the member for Hull North, um, on infected blood, but also to raise the uh, justice that's needed for the victims of the Horizon Post Office scandal. Um, I've been contacted by many constituents who work in the hospitality sector, including Liz, who runs the fantastic Café Dolce in Lancaster. Um, she highlighted the difficulties that many businesses have faced because of rising costs, and she wanted to see tailored support for the hospitality sector, and I fear she'll be disappointed by the offerings uh, today. Um, so are we better off now than we were 14 years ago? I'd say the resounding view from my constituency in Lancaster and Fleetwood yeah, is absolutely yeah. not. Uh, taxes are still rising, prices are still going up in the shops, mortgage rates are higher and nothing the Chancellor has said today changes that. It's time for change and it's time for a general election. Yeah. 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 Speak in today's debate and I strongly welcome the measures that have been announced in the budget. We've heard about increasing investment, we've heard about growth, and I'm pleased that the Treasury Select Committee will be scrutinising the OBR and the Chancellor next week. Uh, indeed, it is important that we consider this, as has already been set out, not only the policies in regards by the Bank of England in the selling of gilt, which my right honourable friend, the Member for Poole, referred to, uh, but also the impact of the OBR and what room that gives. But I do recommend to uh, honourable members uh, that they look at Ed Conway, the Sky journalist, uh, for some more on this, and uh, I'm sure it will open their eyes in many ways. But what I did enjoy was the uh, in aspects in terms of investment and seeing that in life sciences, speak in Liverpool, uh, getting a massive boost in terms of that factory will be very welcome in terms of jobs, but also I think very, respond very much responding to um, SMEs uh, adding leasing, leasing in terms of the full year expensing as well as the ongoing activity which the Department for Business Trade indeed all of government does is showing that Britain is open for business. 
I particularly welcome the moves um, looking at pensions. Uh, I, when I was in DWP and working with the, my honourable friend for Hexham, who was the pensions minister then, we were concerned about the poor returns that were coming through for DC savers. And so I welcome uh, what uh, has been set out today. There's some progress in that regard. In terms of also, I think the British ICE uh, is a brilliant idea, and I look forward to um, potentially investing in one myself. I think the overall outcome of this uh, budget, though, really is about making work pay. Now, national insurance is a particular uh, tax in that it tends to get levied, or it is levied, on basically weekly income. And it's £242 a week is the threshold at the moment, which is equivalent in terms of the current national living wage to just over 23 hours a week. Now, in particular, in somewhere like Suffolk Coastal, we have a lot more seasonal workers. And this will be very welcome to those um, where, in particular, during the summer months, where we see an increase in hospitality and similar, uh, that people, the employers are often looking for more uh, employees, and I think that will be welcomed. And we should bear in mind, not only is this combined with the cut that was announced and is already underway uh, for people in terms of their pay packets, uh, that this combination of, on average of £900 per person really is significant. At the same time, thinking of those people in, on the lower incomes, they should bear in mind also the fact that it was uh, the Prime Minister when he was Chancellor who cut the UC taper rate to 50%, and again, a significant boost all about what it is in order to make sure that work pays. And I welcome some of the sensible changes that have been put in place in order to help with that. In reflecting on the fact that 800 jobs a day have been created since we came into power in 2010 is truly astonishing, and uh, just a reflection on how we know that getting people into work, keeping people in work, is really important, and I know that my right honourable friend, uh, the Secretary of State for DWP, will continue to work on that, particularly thinking of some of the impact that happened with COVID. I also work on um, the assurances given on childcare, and I've got a new surgery opening, uh, sorry, new um, nursery opening in Leiston in my constituency uh, called Spring. It's uh, opening on the 2nd of April in response to what is changing under our regulation, under our support, and I wish Daisy Plumridge well. Now, there's one other aspect of um, my constituency that I think will welcome uh, a lot of the changes, and I'm thinking in particular of the abolishing the furnished holiday lets tax regime. Now, people visiting Suffolk Coastal is a really important part of our economy. Uh, however, too often it seems to have become a way to, in effect, subsidise people buying second homes and giving them an extra income that allows them to uh, do that while letting out for part of the year. I think it's wise uh, that we have considered this. I know there's been a few things along the way, uh, but that will make, I think, a significant change in making sure that we have professional landlords who are thinking about families in the longer term. And uh, I think that is, is good. Other aspects that will be welcomed in Suffolk, I expect, will be the relief, tax relief extended to Freeport East. Um, that's particularly true. I was just visited uh, very recently uh, Felixstowe Port alongside the new Maritime Minister, the noble um, uh, Lord uh, of Goa. And indeed, in terms of uh, also the number of pubs in my constituency and indeed the brilliant Adnams Brewery, I'm sure they will welcome the freeze and the fuel duty. Um, I hope that more of my village halls uh, will take advantage of the £5 million fund investment. And indeed, uh, in section 4.24, there's an extra £75 million for internal drainage boards. This is really important work that is done by local farmers, uh, that uh, it's a useful boost uh, to help them with their assets. Also in the Red Book is, I'm really pleased that the consultation that we launched in March 2023 in terms of tax relief on those people entering uh, the environmental land management schemes. As it stood, and um, it's been the case that you only get tax relief, agricultural tax relief from generation to generation on land that is actually farmed. This is an unnecessary barrier, and I welcome the change that will come into effect from uh, April uh, next year. Indeed, uh, also the support for tenants, uh, tenancies, uh, that is really important in terms of our rural countryside. Now, in terms of other things where the government is trying to be efficient, economic and effective, the public sector productivity plan is really important that we try and get this right. It's important because of the outcomes that it delivers for the people who use those services. And in particular, thinking of the NHS 
It is true. Um, in my short time as Secretary of State for Health, we were started looking at why it was that so many agency workers were there. And in reality, I'm sure many people will know this on the ground when they visit their own hospitals or other parts of the NHS. The NHS can be an exceptionally inflexible employer. And it's no surprise that quite a lot of people turn to being bank staff or going to agency. Um, and I hope that this is not just about trying to do a kind of a economic exercise in that regard, but it's a real culture issue that we need to make and leadership in our hospitals. And we can see by the variable performance right around the country, which we've made much more transparent, we can see the changes that really good leadership can make. And that is often driven by culture, but also high expectations. And that is to be welcomed. I'd also say to my honourable friends on the front bench, it's too early, it can be too easy as well to be a locum exclusively. In terms of um, other factors, I look forward to uh, voting uh, for these measures. Um, this is a budget for growth, it's a budget to make work pay, and I look forward to it uh, being supported by the House. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have to say I think today is a very much a missed opportunity. Much has been said by colleagues, particularly on the government benches, about the level of debt and about the level of tax. But isn't the fundamental issue, really going right back to the financial crisis in 2008-2009, has been the failure to deliver sustainable economic growth. And we heard much from the Chancellor today about growth and about productivity. But when you dive into the detail, it simply doesn't add up. But of course, the starting point and it was referred to by my honourable friend earlier on is about GDP per capita. And the starting point in many respects for the debate we should be having today is what's been happening over the course of the last couple of years. Because if you take the period since March 2022, GDP per capita has fallen by as much as 1.5%. Indeed, the OBR tell us that household incomes now are not going to get back to the pre-pandemic level till 2025. The harsh reality for all of our constituents is that they're actually poorer. And when you have all the barrage about cutting tax that we've heard today, and I know we've had some criticism of the OBR, but you need to have a set of forecasts to base the decisions that you're taking. But when you look at the OBR forecast for the next five-year period, then the average GDP growth per annum is one and two-thirds percent, actually the same level as the forecast last November. So for all the changes that have taken place today, there is absolutely zero movement on the needle in terms of expectation of economic growth. And, and I hope that we do have more of a detailed discussion on these things. And one of the things that was touched on earlier has been the issue of growth, and I would say the issue of productive potential in the UK, because let's have that debate about where that productive potential is and how you grow the economy, because quite simply, I don't see that in what the government has come forward with today. But you know, when you base the things on the, the OBR book, as has been talked about, but you look at the detail of some of this, and you talk about the headroom that the government seems to have, which, let's be honest, is limited. But that headroom is based on an assumption that the fuel price escalator takes place every year from now. Well, it hasn't taken place since 2011. So in that sense, what the government's told us today, in terms of the headroom it has, is an absolute fantasy. But then, of course, when you start to look at where we are on tax as a percentage of GDP, it's going to hit 37.1% at the end of the forecast period. We hear many Tory MPs saying that tax is coming down. No, it's not. All that's happening is that some of the tax increases are being ameliorated, and the fiscal drag has been much talked about. But the forecasts that are there is that that fiscal drag from the failure to increase tax bans means that there's a 40 billion tax take as a consequence of that. So let's have some honesty in terms of what is going on. But where is that plan for growth? Where is that plan for a, an industrial strategy? And I'm glad that my colleagues in the Scottish Government are taking this seriously. We will have a, an industrial council. And much has been said about Labour's plans now backtracked on for the £28 billion green investment. But we need to recognise the scale of the opportunity that there is to decarbonise the economy and drive in jobs. And let me just take the example of green energy in Scotland. We can increase our green energy output fivefold. We can create up to 235,000 jobs. If we don't do that, other countries will make that investment, will benefit from the opportunities that there are there in green energy. We need to grasp that. 
We need to make sure that we can transition that economy. We need to make sure that we're creating the circumstances that people want to come and invest here. But let me then turn, if I may, to public spending. Because again, in real terms, what we see is that over the course of the next few years, that public spending per capita is actually going to be flat. And that, of course, comes after many years of constraint on our public services. But when we take into account the investment which is going into the ring fence areas, notably into the NHS, that means between now and 2028 that the actual real terms decline in public spending is 2.3%. Well, what is 2.3%? It's about £20 billion. We often hear people saying that austerity hasn't happened. Well, my goodness, when you look at our constituents and you look at the cuts that are taking place and look at local authorities in England and look at the challenges that they face, £20 billion to come out over the course of the next few years. It is absolutely shocking what is taking place. And I hear somebody chuntering from a sedentary position about Scotland. Well, my goodness, at least in Scotland, we've tried to ameliorate some of the effects of that. We've invested in the child payment to drive people out of poverty. Because the harsh reality of this budget is there is no hope for people in Scotland. It's more of the same. It's low growth. It's no increase in productivity. It's no vision. It's no investment in the green economy. And I say to voters in Scotland that come that election, and yes, bring it on, that you're going to have a choice. And you've got a government in Scotland that's got that focus on investing in that industrial strategy, of delivering the new green jobs for the next generation. And you've got more of the same from broken Britain and more pressure on the public services. That is the choice that people in Scotland will face on the back of this budget. Edward Lay. The Chancellor, in his excellent speech, mentioned that he was going to unleash £100 million worth of levelling up. Well, I think honourable members may now guess the subject that I'm going to briefly allude to, which I constantly mention in this House. Uh, there is a bit of levelling up in Lincolnshire which is worth £300 million, which is a levelling up which we were hoping to achieve in RAF Scampton, the most iconic RAF base in the country. Uh, levelling up in terms of using a 10,000 foot runway, superb heritage buildings, the home of the Dam Busters and of the Red Arrows. So I do appeal once again to the Government to listen to me when I have been begging them for the last year to achieve a compromise by which we would take. And I see there is one of my Lincolnshire colleagues sitting on the front bench, and I am sure he has a certain amount of influence on his fellow members of the Government. I hope the Government will listen to what I have been saying for the last six months. We should have a compromise by which we do take some migrants in a small part of the base, but we unleash the rest of the base for levelling up, because that is what Lincolnshire means needs more than ever. It needs more jobs and more growth, and I hope this budget is a budget for that. Of course, this is a debate about the budget. It is not a debate about illegal migration. but. This whole saga of putting up uh, more and more people in hotels or in military bases has got to end. We've got to get the Rwanda bill through Parliament. We have to have a proper deterrence and we have to stop these people who are making a joke of our border control. But the far more serious problem than illegal migration, Mr Deputy Speaker, is illegal migration. When I entered the House, uh, legal migration, when I entered the House 40 years ago, was running, net legal migration was running at about £17,000 17, a year. Uh, 20 years later, it was 185000 a year. Now it's over 600000 It puts a massive strain on the economy. The fixation on importing cheap labour is immoral and unpatriotic. We can't undermine our own workers by letting in people and paying lower than average wages. And there's a single thing that the Chancellor could do, and that's to end all these shortage schemes and simply insist that if you want to come and work in the UK, you have to earn a minimum of UK uh, national wage, which is roughly about £33,000. 
Not only does such an influx of people drain our economy, displacing investment in domestic skilled work, but it also puts an immense strain on public services, as we all know, with more British citizens than ever, including the least advantaged, struggling to get GP appointments and secure their children's school places. We have to deal with net legal migration. This is the single biggest problem facing our government, and we have to act on it. Because, as we know, we're importing all these people because we're not paying enough, perhaps, in the NHS or to care staff, and therefore we have to import them from all over the world. But we know that there are 9.3 million people in the UK who claim benefits of working age. Uh, with this statistic, seem to remorse, will rise remorselessly. Productivity rates decreasing, predicted to keep falling further uh, in the coming years. We have to address this fundamental weakness of the British economy that we're not paying enough wa proper wages to our people. We've got too many people of working age on benefit and we're importing too many people from the rest of the world. On the broader case, I, I've been listening to what my colleagues have been saying. I would have preferred, I must admit, instead of a cut in national insurance, I would have a, a preferred a cut in income tax. I think it has much more dynamic behind it. I think people understand it. And as has already been said, of course, that there are many people who don't pay uh, national insurance. There are many savers, people of pensionable age. There's no point in keeping the triple lock if you're dragging more and more pensioners into paying tax and dragging more and more pensioners, not rich people, not rich pensioners, even into higher rate tax. So I would have preferred a cut in uh, income tax rather than national insurance, but I understand where the Chancellor is coming on that. May I just say a word about the Office of Budget Responsibility? I just can't understand why we seem to have outsourced so, many, so much of our economic management from the Chancellor Exchequer to the OBR and to the Bank of England. Yeah. People say, oh, well, look what happened when we didn't listen to the OBR in the, quote, disastrous mini-budget. The reason why that budget went wrong, it wasn't about the fact that they didn't listen enough to the OBR or their forecasts, which are often wrong. What went wrong with that budget was that there were too much unfunded tax cuts. As a nation, we have to become a dynamic, a uh, low-tax, low-regulation economy. And that is the only way forward for a Conservative government. So I'm very dubious about these forecasts from the OBR. I do think that, generally, uh, we should not put too much faith in opinion polls. They're simply a test of opinion. What's going to matter in this coming general election is that you have a choice. We accept that we're paying too much in tax. We accept that we've been hit unbelievably badly by the lockdowns, uh, by, by the pandemic, by the war in Ukraine. We accept that people are taxed far too highly, they're regulated too much. But what I shall be saying to my constituents when they go to vote, whether it's in May or next November or when it is over, do you want to pay even more tax? Do you want to have even more regulation? Do you want to have even more migration to this country? And the answer is a resounding no. So speaking for myself, I should be voting Conservative. Thank you very much. Catherine West. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it's a pleasure to follow the member for Gainsborough and hear about all the challenges in his constituency. Um, there's nothing more important than to give children the best start in life. And I came into um, local politics to begin with through the Shore Start movement. And even now, looking at some of the women who I volunteered with back then, uh, many of them are now senior in early years provision. And it's a wonderful thing when you get it right. Yeah. I noticed that last Sunday in an interview with the BBC uh, Sunday with Laura Koonsberg, the Chancellor said he could not guarantee that working parents of two-year-olds would get their promised 15 free hours of childcare. And this is simply not good enough to see yet another broken promise by the government. The Chancellor announced these three hours this time last year, a whole year ago, and still not delivered. 
My constituent <coughs> Gillian wrote to me recently. She's two young children and in January she found out that her local nursery was closing down due to a lack of staff. She told me, we were informed of the closure of the nursery yesterday afternoon. I immediately stopped what I was doing and started calling nurseries and childminders in the area. I must have called 25 childminders, none of which have availability. Can you imagine the panic of that parent when she knew that she would have to either give up her job, move house, move in with her parents, or go and be part-time? Parents are already really hard-pressed, whether it's their mortgages going up, whether it's the fact that for some families their privately rented homes have gone up by 20% overnight yeah. in the last 12 months, yeah. Yeah. or whether you are waiting for a social home to become available. Yeah. Families in Hornsey and Wood Green are facing extreme pressure. What good is free hours if you cannot find a nursery which is still open? These hours need to be properly funded, and yet so many early years settings have closed. As I heard from Councillor Brabazon, who runs the Children's <coughs> Services in Haringey Borough, so many childminders have left the sector due to lack of support from the government. So my question to the Chancellor would be, how is he going to provide parents with more free hours if nurseries cannot recruit or retain staff? How will he prevent those nurseries in my constituency from closing down? Will he guarantee, at the end of the debate, that every eligible child will get their free hours either April or will he move the goalposts again to September 2024, or perhaps September 2025? Delivery seems to be an ever-moving um, boundary. He continues to move, move the goalposts, and at this rate, the children will be in secondary school before they've got a, an adequate provision in childcare. As well as affordable and accessible childcare, thousands of children are living in unsuitable temporary accommodation, including hotels, due to the government's abysmal housing policy. This is not a new problem, but this is something which has been going on and really bothering a lot of MPs in this House. The refusal to scrap Section 21 and build social and affordable homes have all contributed to the mess that we're in now. Yeah. There have never been more children in poor quality temporary accommodation, yeah. causing yeah. desperation for so many, and in some cases, some children actually dying in temporary accommodation. Um, press have reported on that just in the last week. London boroughs are now spending £90 million a month on temporary accommodation, according to London councils, and more than 175,000 Londoners are homeless and living in temporary accommodation, including 85,000 children, on average at least one homeless child in every London classroom. This is an absolute disgrace that we're spending this much money because it's mainly housing benefit, when that money could be turned into bricks and mortar yeah. and new homes. Yeah, yeah. Up and down the country, families fed up with the government, broken promises, incompetence, yeah. and this budget will do naught to fix it. Only Labor's got the plan to break down the barriers and provide the best chance in life for children. We need an end to the Tories sticking plasters, an end to Rishi's recession. We need a general election and a Labor government. Yeah. 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 Paul Bristow. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I rise to welcome this budget, to welcome a low-tax budget and a budget focused on increasing productivity in our public services, and by goodness do we need it. Uh, yesterday I had dinner with an old friend of mine who had spent quite some time out of the United Kingdom, and we were just talking about what he felt life was like in the UK now, and he used the phrase that he felt that... Uh, society was becoming infantilised. And I asked him what he meant by this. And he talked about the ever-increasing intrusiveness of the state and other bodies into individuals' lives, into the lives of ordinary people. And I, I asked for an example, and he rather kind of curiously decided to talk about the railways and how when he gets a train, uh, we, we got a train only the other day, he was told on several occasions to mind a gap. He was told to uh, contact the British Transport Police if he um, saw something suspicious. He was told that, uh, to ensure that he had the correct ticket for his fare. He was told to say it, see it, sorted, on loop about 20 times. And in itself, you might think, well, why is he talking about these individual safety announcements? Surely they make sense. But it was not as if my friend was about to leap into the gap. It wasn't as if my friend was going to decide to pick up strange packages. It wasn't as if my friend was planning to try and evade his fare. But the British 
state or this institution seem to want to tell the most individual and warn him of the dangers of this constantly. We are over-regulated, we are overtaxed, we are over-governed and we are over-leveraged both at a state level and individually. And thank goodness we've got a budget now which is going to try and address some of these problems. <coughs> we desperately need to see a low-tax economy and we desperately need to see productivity in our public services. And nowhere, no example is more clear of this overburdensome, this intrusive, this nannying element of the state than when it comes to Peterborough City Council. We have an administration that would rather axe lollipop ladies, one of the only physical manifestations of the City Council left on our streets, than it would tackle inefficiency in its back office or look to productivity savings. They would rather demolish or at least close three, count on three, Mr. Sp Mr Deputy Speaker, three bridges over a local beauty spot known as Cuckoo's Hollow, effectively, effectively cutting off hundreds of people from shops and from going about their business, uh, and many of them disabled, many of them with mobility issues, many of them elderly. They would rather do this on spurious health and safety grounds than they would take a common sense approach to repairing each of these three bridges individually, one at a time. Instead, they would rather close them overnight and not tell a single soul about it. M Mr. Deputy Speaker, more people have walked in the service of the moon in the last 70 years than have been placed at, in any sort of danger by these particular bridges. But that's the sort of council we have. A council that would rather close, fence off a local uh, open space called Warrington Fields, again, because I have some sort of concern over safeguarding. And again, Mr Deputy Speaker, a city council that would rather close a swimming pool, the regional pool in Peterborough, the place that I learnt to swim, again, because they have taken an overcautious approach when it comes to a survey and have taken the worst case scenario as law, as to the letter. And they would rather close it, they would rather close it than actually make do and mend. And a planning system, Mr Deputy Speaker, a planning system that treats people who would want to build a small annex, a granny annex, or a small addition uh, to their house, it would make them feel like they wanted to build St Paul's Cathedral or the Taj Mahal next to their houses, rather than something that would obviously benefit the local economy and benefit that individual family. So we really need to accelerate those supply-side reforms when it comes to planning, and we need to get uh, Peterborough, and we need to get this country building. But we also need to take a much more mature approach, in my, uh, in my way, to politics and how we... Uh, talk about the economy and talk about public spending. I'm incredibly proud of the investment that I've managed to secure for my city in Peterborough. Hundreds of millions of pounds in our future, in infrastructure in Peterborough, because we've not had our fair share over many years. And that's something that I'm incredibly proud of. But I think the way we talk about spending commitments is as if spending and the amount we spend is the goal in itself. And actually, what we want at the end of it is outcomes. We want to see a situation where we're spending more than ever before on X, Y, and Z. Spending is not the goal. The outcome is the goal. Productivity is the goal. It's what we get for our book. And that is what we need to see. And that's the sort of change we need to see. And I was, really, I was incredibly pleased in the Chancellor's excellent speech to see that point made uh, very, very clearly. But nowhere, nowhere does this productivity challenge uh, embed itself more than our National Health Service, Mr Deputy Speaker. Because, uh, and I really, was really pleased to see that, what was it, we, this National Productivity Plan, Public Services po Productivity Plan, and when we talked about our NHS. And again, I just want to suggest three things we might think about if we want to see our NHS uh, productivity um, uh, increase. The first is making sure that clinicians, the consultants, the clinicians, the nurses, the doctors, the people we pay to care for patients operate at the top of their licence. And I was very disappointed to hear disparaging comments I think at Prime Minister's queues from the benches opposite about physician, physician associates. Actually, we want more physician associates in our National Health Service so we can have consultants and doctors and nurses doing what they need to do and operating at the very top of their licence. We also need to streamline the way uh, ranking and grades are in our NHS to make sure that people can move from one 
uh, element of the service to another element of the service much more easily. That will increase productivity uh, and uh, satisfaction, I think, and job satisfaction. And finally, we have organisations such as uh, NICE and GERF, getting it right first time, who tell us <coughs> how to, get the, to do the best possible thing uh, for patients, tell us what works, and then the NHS doesn't do it. It doesn't adopt it at pace and at scale. But that's what we need to be doing in order to increase productivity at, in our NHS. And I hope this productivity plan addresses some of those issues. So how does this end? If we're going to continue with the infantilisation of our society, where does it end? Well, I'll tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, where it ends. It ends with the opposition, the Labour Party, one of the two great political parties in our system, in our democracy, mandating it, telling people that teachers are there to brush children's teeth. Where does the responsibility of the state end and the parents begin? Because if we're mandating teachers to brush their ch children's teeth in schools, then I think we've got a long way to go if we want to actually create an independent and a non infantilised adult population in this country. Well said. Uh, well, I'm, I'm grateful for members sticking to um, six, seven uh, minutes, uh, which Dame Rosie indicated, because we don't want to put a time limit on if we can get away with it. And it does mean everybody uh, will get in uh, and have uh, equalish time. Gareth Thomas. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Gentleman for Peterborough, but I'm afraid I think this is a budget which will make little significant positive difference to his constituents or indeed to my constituents or the country at large. The cuts in national insurance that were announced uh, today are certainly not going to compensate for the higher interest rate uh, rises that my constituents have had to suffer, or indeed for the plans uh, announced by local Conservatives in Harrow Council recently to push up council tax by some 16% in the coming uh, years. The OBR confirmed today that living standards will stay below even 2019 levels for at least another two years. That means less money in my constituents' pockets, less money for our high streets and less money in family uh, budgets. And this budget will certainly do little to reverse the sustained underinvestment in public services in Harrow or across uh, the country. Every school in my constituency has less funding in real terms now compared to 2010. Indeed, on average, Schools in my constituency have seen a reduction in real terms since 2010 of almost £900 per pupil. More than £12 million in real terms cut from school budgets since 2010 in Harrow West. The four high schools in my constituency have been hit particularly hard, seeing funding cuts in real terms of between £900 to almost £1,900 per pupil. The primary schools in my constituency, too, have seen cuts in their spending power compared to 2010 of between £200,000 and almost £600,000. And in particular, the excellent Pinner Park School, where I was lucky enough uh, to attend, has seen a change in real terms per pupil of £880 uh, per pupil since 2010 and a loss of almost £740,000 in spending power. Many schools in my constituency and indeed across the country face huge problems retaining and recruiting teachers and other staff. In my constituency, in no small part due to the housing crisis in London. I uh, have always wanted to see the inner London allowance for teachers extended to outer London too to help deal with the recruitment crisis in my constituency uh, of teachers and outer, uh, outer London too. There was nothing in the budget uh, to help uh, see the, to deliver the level of investment that the schools in my constituency uh, deserve. On special needs funding in particular, whilst I welcome the small announcement that the Chancellor made today in this space, ministers still do not appear to have grasped the scale of need. In Harrow, traditionally poorly supported by Conservatives and whose problems have been exacerbated now by a poor Conservative administration, just 29% of education, health and care plans were issued to support young people with significant special educational needs within 20 weeks, lower than, similar rates in, lower than rates in Barnet, Hillingdon and Brent. Conservative Ministers too have rejected three times bids for funding from Harrow Council for another urgently needed special needs school. 
up for 290 extra places. And that shortage of locally provided appropriate SEND places is forcing the use of expensive private school places, rocketing transport costs, and for parents of SEN children, the ever-present worry that their child's place will be taken away from them or that they'll have to settle uh, for a placement that isn't fully appropriate. It's also placing heavier pressures on mainstream schools who aren't getting sufficient extra funding to ensure some of their SEN pupils are properly supported. Parents of children with special educational needs are telling me that the council locally, and I know this is mirrored nationally too, do not have the resources or staff to complete those education, uh, uh, health and care plans in good time. The parents of one young person, for example, in my constituency, are waiting for a second occupational therapy assessment in order to complete an EHCP that was started in June last year. They've just received a letter to say that OT assessments will be delayed again because the service is running at a re reduced level. Support for children with special educational needs, frankly, is in crisis, and this budget isn't offering the investment necessary to bring new hope to the thousands of families who've been let down by the party opposite's failure to invest over the last decade in Britain's next generation too. And the NHS in Harrow is on its knees. Nationally, one in every seven people in England are on NHS waiting lists, more than ever before. <coughs> That means they're putting their lives on hold, having to manage in pain and discomfort for months. For far too long, trying to get an appointment to see a GP in Harrow has been a struggle for too many uh, people. In a sign of the scale of the crisis in access to primary uh, care, I understand a new system for urgent GP appointments is being forced on all GP surgeries across North West London. No consultation on that plan has happened up to now, and independent medical advice uh, suggests serious concerns about patient safety flowing from it. It would, be, would have been far better if the underfunding of the NHS hadn't led to the closures of 8am to 8pm walk-in urgent care centres in my uh, constituency. They eased the pressure on GP surgeries and, crucially, on accident and emergency services too. And one major NHS reform that would make an immediate difference locally is for an investment in a 50% expansion in intensive care beds at Northwick Park Hospital, which serves my constituency, from a 24-bed unit at the moment to 36 beds. That would help to ease the huge pressure on A&E that what is the busiest hospital in London for blue light ambulance visits experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. I make no criticism of the staff there. They're doing an impressive job. But sadly, this is a budget that will see further cuts in the support available from the NHS and uh, a lack of investment in our schools too. And I hope even at this late stage, ministers will find a way to begin to put that damage right. Yeah. Tobias Elwood. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. We are on day one of four days where the House debates the Chancellor's budget statement. But within minutes of the Chancellor sitting down, we've already heard opposition parties roll out their headline sound bites such as look where we are after 14 years of Tory rule which I suspect we're going to hear a lot of as we lead up to the next general election in the hope that with the next general election fast approaching the wider geopolitical context in which we've had to govern is completely glossed over. This simply trivialises the importance of the debate that we're having here. So let's do justice in appreciating what has actually happened over the last 14 years. We have had to endure the largest global uh, pandemic since 1920, costing over £400 billion in order to protect our economy and indeed vaccinate the nation. We continue to endure the worst war in Europe since 1945. That is impacting on both the continent's security and indeed its economy, which saw global oil prices increase by 11% and indeed UK wholesale gas prices rise by 40% and food prices spike following Ukraine's great export disruption. This is the monetary and fiscal backdrop, the challenging context which we find ourselves facing today that sits behind the cost of living crisis that has seen double-digit inflation and has led to the unprecedented but necessary colossal state intervention that we are now slowly moving away from. And oh yes, 
Look at the situation that we did inherit back 14 years ago. UK debt was rising. The deficit was about £150 billion a year. And, of course, unemployment was higher than in 1997. Now, of course, Labour would quite rightly point out that they had to endure the global financial crisis that hit Britain hard. But that actually underscores my point of placing in context the global economic headwinds that we have had to face. Of course, I would like to see more money to further ease the burden on households, to tackle the waiting list, to upgrade our defence posture. But the reality is Conservatives have had to manage the UK economy through the toughest of circumstances, during which time there have been successes that should indeed be acknowledged, including investment in our schools, the rollout of free schools and academies, seeing us jump in international league tables, the rollout of pupil premiums and free school meals. Our welfare structures are far more simpler, fairer, better targeted, with also transformative free childcare as well. And we see national, ins national insurance contributions now cut to 8%, a tax cut for 29 million people. On the green economy, our agenda is world beating, the fastest decarbonisation of any major economy and the first to legislate for a net zero target. And now we hear today that there's going to be further steps as we invest in the modular nuclear reactor programme. And thanks to the tax breaks and investment incentives, we have the third largest tech sector in the world, behind the United States and China. We are global leaders in pharmaceuticals, life sciences, quantum computing, AI, aerospace, as well as fintech and financial services, backed up by some of the best universities in the world. Crime is falling. Police numbers are now rising. Violence reduction units to tackle knife crime that I've been campaigning for with the Chancellor are now being rolled out, including in my constituency of Bournemouth. A new generation of hospitals are being built. Upgrades to existing hospitals, such as we're seeing in Bournemouth. 42,000 more doctors, 72,000 more nurses. And the levelling up programmes are transforming communities up and down the country, including Bournemouth's seafront. And of course, we're on target to build one million new homes in this parliament. And when it comes to defence and security, we've expanded our surface fleet with two carriers. We've upgraded our Air Force and our CASD programme. We formed the National Security Council, as well as the National Cyber Security Centre, and signed up to AUKUS as well. We've hosted G7 summits, the NATO summit, and have played a lead role in Ukraine, as well as defending safe maritime passage in the Red Sea. So please, don't say it's been 14 wasted years. That's an insult to the British people. It's been challenging, absolutely, and not without frustration. I can say that firsthand. But had Labour been in office, without benefit of hindsight, would they have fared so much better than us? Bearing in mind, it actually would have been, and he's in his place, the Honourable Member for Islington would have been at the helm for some time. He certainly would have taken Britain in a very different direction. I think he would acknowledge that. But here is the rub. It's not like... I did mention him, so I will give way. I thank the, I thank the member for giving way. Yes, it would have been a very different direction. There wouldn't be the levels of poverty, homelessness and inequality that there are in this country today. <laughs> I gave him the opportunity to put his words on record and I look forward to what he has to say. But here is the rub. It's not likely in Britain to get any easier. Global storm clouds are gathering again. Our world is becoming more contested and more fragmented. We face ever more testing times ahead, with increased threats to our international rules-based order. The question is, who is best placed to strengthen our economy, to navigate us through further global shocks, to lead the country. Now, with inflation now falling, heading towards 2%, wages rising, business confidence returning, education standards improving, and the UK growing faster than most of the other members of the G7, this clearly is a budget for growth that we should all support. Yeah. Kim Ledley. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, and it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Bournemouth East. I'm glad that things are going so well in his constituency. I wish it was the same in Batley and Spen. Today's budget was an opportunity to get Britain back on track, to unlock our great potential and begin the important work to get Britain's future back. 
But sadly, this budget has failed to address the deep-rooted economic challenges that we are facing today, and the Government has to take some responsibility for that, and particularly for the chaos of the last five years, where we have seen five different Chancellors. Such political instability is damaging. It's damaging to businesses, to families and to communities. To be fair to him, the current Chancellor had the unenviable task of trying to tell people that everything is going to be okay, when for many people that just isn't how they feel. Many people are struggling to make ends meet, people who are working full-time are having to use food banks, and everywhere they look, things just are not working, whether that's the buses or the trains, getting support for their children with special educational needs or with their mental health, or accessing a doctor or a dentist. So many people in my Yorkshire constituency tell me they feel significantly worse off than they did 14 years ago. And if I mention levelling up, they often just laugh. I hear of the daily sacrifices people are making, the hard work people are putting in, but the feeling that this hard work and sacrifice is just not paying off. They see a Prime Minister who has implemented 25 tax rises since 2019 alone, the biggest income tax burden for decades, and they know and feel that this economy is just not working for them. They want to see and feel real change, but I know that they will be sorely disappointed to hear this budget that won't even scratch the surface of the challenges they face. <coughs> like people across the country, families in Batley and Spen have faced a really tough couple of years. The disastrous mini-budget of 2022 saw their mortgage repayments, their weekly outgoings, including the cost of their food shop, spiral out of control. One family I spoke to recently, where both parents are working full-time, have got to find an extra £350 a month for their mortgage. The National Insurance Court simply won't cover this, meaning they will have to sacrifice paying for precious family activities or not being able to pay for their kids to go on school trips. This is the reality for many people as a result of the political choices of this government, who remain intent on blaming everything and everybody else for their mess. They cannot pretend that the Conservatives' mini-budget was anything other than an economic disaster that we are all now paying the price for. And while ministers opposite may celebrate that inflation just about halved last year, the reality from families in Batley and Spen means that they are facing food prices that went up by 7% last year. They're still rising today, and our economy has now dipped into recession. And whilst we quite rightly regularly pay tribute in this place to the dedicated volunteers that give up their time to run our increasing number of food banks, it's not acceptable that over the last decade we've somehow managed to normalise their existence as though it's something to be proud of. And it's not just families feeling the pinch. Small businesses in the towns and villages I represent are finding it incredibly tough. I recently met with local landlords and landladies who face increased overheads, which they simply cannot pass on to customers and consumers who are facing their own cost of living pressures. Some local pubs have already closed and more are under threat. I'd like to turn now to the pressures on local authorities, something which we have seen much of in the news in recent days, Sir Roger. Kirklees Council has lost over a billion pounds of funding since 2010 and is facing unprecedented financial pressure. And the government, I'm afraid, has to take responsibility. Indeed, if the Conservatives, Conservatives had kept Labour's funding formula, Kirklees would currently be in surplus. Instead, like many other councils, Kirklees is having to make almost £50 million of cuts just to balance the books. And after fulfilling their statutory obligations on education, refuse collections and social care, this has inevitably led to an impossible dilemma of choosing which leisure centres, libraries, town halls, mental health services or registry offices to close. The impact on my constituents is devastating. Luckily, we've managed to save Batley Sports and Tennis Centre, but the battle for Clackheaton Town Hall and other vital local services continues. This budget today should have ring-fenced ring money for sports and leisure facilities, for libraries, for town halls. These things are not nice to have. They're essential parts of our community infrastructure, and we need them to keep the population fit and healthy and reduce long-term pressure on the NHS. They are the key to happy, healthy and well-connected communities. More broadly, local government funding needs fundamental reform. The current funding formula is not fit for purpose, and it's seeing local councils controlled by every political party facing either extreme hardship or potential bankruptcy. Local government is often the most direct interaction people have with politics, and it carries a huge burden trying to ensure local services are working for residents. Failing to fund them properly is causing a backlog of issues which we will have to pay for eventually anyway. The current situation is unsustainable, 
and it does not make economic sense. So I urge the Chancellor and Leveling Up Secretary to urgently reform the funding formulas to ensure adequate funding for the areas that need it most for the basic services which are the glue that bind our communities together. Mr. Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, today's budget was a missed opportunity. It was a missed opportunity to begin the work of rebuilding Britain, reforming our communities and unleashing our potential to get our future back. After years of financial and economic pain, it was an opportunity to reset and get our economy working for our communities again. But all we got were a few tweaks, a couple of gimmicks and a few shiny announcements designed to distract from the fundamental issue of the flatline economy that is impacting people daily across the country, including in Batley and Spen. I sincerely hope that my right honourable friend, the Shadow Chancellor, will be delivering the next budget in a few short months to deliver the change we so desperately need, to get Britain back on track, to rebuild the relationship with our local authorities and get our economy working for families across the country once again. <laughs> Nigel Mills. Thank you. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady. And the test I was going to give this budget before I heard it was how does this help my constituents, particularly those who are still struggling the most with the cost of living crisis? Which I think that was the priority for the Chancellor at a time when actually we have seen inflation uh, start to come back down to where we want it to be. We've seen interest rates come back down from their peak and we've seen the economy yeah, probably perform slightly better than we feared, although not as much as we would have hoped. So I was certainly hoping that he wouldn't take any, any risks with destabilising that position and he would focus what he could do on those that needed it the most. I, I think that is pretty much roughly what we saw was a steady as she goes, uh, a budget that did indeed focus on those issues. So I certainly welcome um, measures like extending the length of time that you get to pay in advance back in universal credit, the extension to the household support fund, I think, is a extremely welcome and a good way of targeting funds who do need it uh, the most over the next uh, six months. Uh, the, clearly, the single biggest decision was the extra 2p off national insurance that will help people uh, keep more of, they earn, more of what they earn, help make work pay, and help household finances. So I strongly welcome that decision. Like many others, I think I would have preferred to do income tax. I think I would have raised the personal tax allowance. I think that would have helped um, those earning the least amount more quickly than a, a percentage a change. But it's not a time to be picky. I think this is an expensive measure, a welcome one that will really help people, and we shouldn't ask for perfection. I think in many a budget speech, I've asked, <coughs> could we actually have a, a sense of direction for what we're trying to do? And I welcome the increase in the VAT threshold up to 90,000 after a, a long pause. But I think it would be helpful if we tried to peg that to you know, what is the right. Are we trying to give a self employed person, perhaps after they've incurred the costs, a median income without being in the VAT regime? Is that what we're trying to do? Is that where we should try and peg the threshold? Because otherwise, we think we're just occasionally plucking random numbers out of the air. It would be better actually to have a right starting position and index it every year to give some predictability. But having asked for that sense of direction, actually we do have one on, on national insurance and it appears to be the Chancellor's view that double taxing income with two different taxes is the wrong thing to do and he seems to want to phase out national insurance when we can afford it. I, I think that is a welcome sense of direction to take. I think he could do that more quickly by just abolishing national insurance, putting more on income tax and, ju and just having one tax if he really thinks double tax is, is the wrong thing to do. And probably the revenue would get from a taxing more passive income at a slightly higher rate would pay for a lower rate on earnings. So you wouldn't have to make it literally 28. You could probably get away with a slightly lower rate in this, that situation. So perhaps if we are, are being radical and that is, is now the direction we want to go, that is something he could he could perhaps look at uh, dusting off those old exercises on do we really need those two taxes to be separate in that situation. It's intriguing though if we, if we really do believe it's wrong to tax work higher than other forms of income and then on the same day we reduce the capital gains tax rate on the sale of second properties, that seems slightly incongruous. I think it just shows actually how hard to have simplistic views is because actually we finally have a dynamic assessment which shows if you lower the rate you get more activity and more revenue. It would seem rather perverse to uh, reject that and want to have a principle that gave you lower money. So I, th I think I welcome that change even though it, on the face of it it looks slightly inconsistent. I'd use my last couple of minutes just uh, actually just to work on a couple of the small things. I think the fuel duty freeze is hugely welcomed by my constituents who do 
they rely on the cars quite significantly. I, I welcome the alcohol freezes as well, again, uh, largely welcoming, trying to help the hospitality trade. I actually have called for the abolition of the non-DOM tax regime in about the last three budgets. So I welcome the fact the Chancellor has done that. I was expecting a little fudge this time. That perhaps he would reduce the number of years. You could claim it from 15 down to 10 or maybe increase the amount that you have to pay to access that regime. So, but to actually announce a whole complete reform of how we tax uh, temporary residents and non-residents, I think is absolutely the, the right thing to do. The, our regime is completely out of date to have resident, non-resident, ordinarily resident, settled, habitually resident, domicile, non-domicile. I don't think anybody understands what on earth all these things mean. I think having one modern regime where everybody who is a uh, long-standing resident pays the same taxes, I think will be absolutely right. And I think it is fair to say if somebody comes here temporarily to run a business, start a business, to, uh, on an exchange with an employer, actually... We don't really want to have all the hassle of working out our whole worldwide situation in that, because by the time we work that out, they'll have left anyway. Uh, so I, I think having a short-term exemption is the right way to go, and then having a much clearer, more modern regime that provides certainty and provides fairness, I think is much more defendable than the historic one, which depends on where your father was born. I mean, how on earth can that in the, in the modern day? So I, I welcome the Chancellor has grasped that nettle and done it in a proper, coherent way. I, I look forward to seeing what the final detail of those changes are when we see the consultation. And in a similar vein, I welcome the reforms to the child benefit surcharge. I think the Chancellor hinted he thought 100,000 was the right place to set the household income when he said that two people earning 50,000 were exempt. He didn't actually say. So I, I look forward to the consultation actually saying where we think the long-term correct position place is. I, I think that would be a fair place to put it in that situation. But overall, I, I welcome a budget which is probably about the best that could be done in a situation where our deficit in the next country is £87 billion. For those who think we could be spending more or taxing less... How big a deficit really can we be running? Uh, so, uh, and for those who think that relying on five-year forecasts is a bit risky, well, relying on the one-year forecast would get us a very different budget, I sense. So I think the Chancellor has found the right balance. We're going in the right direction. I look forward to supporting it next week. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I ask the House one question. How can it be right that in the sixth richest country in the world, more than four million of our children are living in poverty? How can it be right that uh, ten, the richest 10% of households earn and receive an income over 10 times that of the poorest 10%? And in my own borough, which uh, does include some extremely wealthy people living there, one in four people live in poverty, making us the most, sixth most deprived borough in London. In other words, there are 20... Uh, six other boroughs that are less deprived. 19,000 people in my borough experience high levels of food insecurity and whilst I'm delighted that the Mayor of London has pledged free school meals across the whole of the city, in, my, in the case of my borough we've been, we've been providing them since 2010 which is a huge step forward. I mean, we do have a very high rate of child poverty at 47.5% of our children living in poverty. And so this budget could have done so much to reduce levels of child poverty, could have done so much to improve the livelihood of some of the poorest people in the country, which is why I responded to the intervention of the member for Bournemouth East in the way that I did. We have what I think is immoral and disgraceful, a two-child policy in this country on benefit levels. That means that children in large families lose out, large families already often poor because they're a large family, are then made even poorer by the discrimination against the third, fourth or even fifth child that is in that family. It would not be madly expensive to end that, um, that policy and it would take 250,000 children out of poverty. It would cost £1.3 billion. And when the... Um, Chancellor announced that the non-DOM uh, abolition, which I agree with, would free up more money for tax cuts for the future. That could have been used to end the two-child policy, a very neat uh, synchronisation of two policy changes. Or the Chancellor could have looked at uh, page 63 of the OBR report, which lets us know that there are now £156 billion estimated to be of uncollected taxes in this country, more than double what it was five years ago. 
the figure is getting worse and worse. It seems that uh, this budget is more interested in appealing to a small number of people on, on some degree of um, tax cut through lowering national insurance. But I ask the question, is it fiscally responsible to plunge more families and more people into desperate poverty than we do at the present time? A quarter of a million people in this country are homeless. More than a million households are on social housing waiting lists. Most young people have no chance whatsoever of being able to rent somewhere of their own because they're simply too expensive, they have to share, cannot even think about buying anywhere and have almost no chance of getting on a council waiting list unless they have um, either large numbers of children or quite complex medical conditions or stress levels. And so we do have a serious housing emergency. We see that emergency every day when we come into this building. We see homeless people on the streets of London begging. Those numbers are increasing as time goes on. And the amount of money, as my friend the member for Hornsey and Wood Green pointed out, that we're spending through public expenditure on housing benefit to subsidise very expensive private rented accommodation is a sort of catch-up every year. The local housing allowance rises a bit, the landlords raise the rent a bit more, and the public have to pay this exorbitant level of rent. Why on earth can't we have rent controls that are pretty normal, private sector rent controls, pretty normal across most European cities and indeed pretty normal in parts of the United States? In my own borough we have 15,000 households on the, um, on the waiting list for social housing. The only way forward to deal with the housing crisis is actually not to pledge to build the millions of homes that the government is doing, but actually to pledge to build council housing at secure rents and affordable rents to guarantee decent quality housing for people. This country did that by both parties in the two decades after the Second World War, and then we had the Thatcherite idea of selling off social housing. Very nice for those that were able to buy it very cheaply at that time. Every other generation since then has paid the price of that policy. And so I ask the government why they don't give a priority on the housing needs of the majority of the population and those that are in desperate need, recognising the effect on child poverty, the effect on underachievement in school and the effect on society as a whole by the very poor quality of housing that so many people live in. Underfunding of local government has enormous implications enormous implications and so when the government says they're very pleased that Britain is an attractive place for arts and culture, wonderful, I absolutely agree, I want us to be an attractive place for art, entertainment and culture. But if you cut local government expenditure then the art centres get underfunded, the performing arts suffers and the whole cultural scene suffers as a result of it, as does so much else. And I'll conclude, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I know you're concerned about the time, a letter that the um, leader and deputy leader of my local authority, Islington, Kayakoma Schwartz and Diamond Ward, wrote to the local paper in a plea to the Chancellor before the budget. They made four points. One, they called for local government funding to be, made, uh, to be realistic so that the underfunding didn't mean they had to cut services or reduce services in some way and they are doing that. They've lost £300 million due to central government underfunding. They asked for rates to build much needed new council homes. The council has done well on building on land that it owns, but it can't afford to buy anywhere else, or it has to do a mixed development, which means you get less council housing than you could. And also, full flexibility about how the money could spend could be spent. So um, we need to have much more responsibility put onto local government to spend the money as it sees fit and that would indeed help with the housing issue. And the last point I make is uh, whilst the Chancellor said a great deal about the NHS, he didn't mention social care at any one point in his speech. It is a crisis that is there for so many. So many families are devastated by the cost of social care and so many women have to give up 
their jobs, their careers, and their hopes because they have to care for elderly or uh, elderly relatives or those with profound disabilities. We can do so much better in this country than we're doing. And so this budget, to me, is not welcome at all. It is a huge missed opportunity. Kevin Foster. Well, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It will come as no surprise to the right member for Islington North to know that whilst it's a pleasure to follow him, I don't agree with many of the comments he said, although, or the suggestions he comes up with, though I do agree with him that housing is one of the defining issues, and while I might not agree with his proposed solutions, it is certainly one that we need to address. But in terms of coming to the budget, it is worth looking at the context for the economic picture here in this country. We've had, in the, in, within this parliament, we've had a pandemic, which is the first of its nature for a century, and we've had the return of war in Europe, war between nations, uh, for the first time since 19. 19- 45, with the resulting price shocks that it sent through the world economy. So, you know, there is a need to look at what actually is the context. We're operating in you know, a context that's rarely mentioned when we hear speeches from the other side. And when we look at what the achievements there have been, it is an absolutely stunning figure to say 800 new jobs a day created. That unemployment is now lower than it was. Previously, when we've seen big economic shocks, that's seen people ending up unemployed and all the impacts that brings for them and their family. And it's worthwhile looking at the figures that were published yesterday by, by, from the DWPs, talking about how economic inactivity rates in the UK are lower than that of the USA, France, Italy, South Korea, were lower than the G7 and the EU average. You know, these are real people being kept in work, in jobs, that if we hadn't had the interventions that we're now having to pay for, uh, during the pandemic may have been a very, very different picture. And of course, it is worth seeing uh, today's budget in the context of the autumn statement, not least around when we come to the changes on national insurance, probably the largest part of this budget, and that we have seen a £450 on average tax cut for those in work in January, now being followed by another <coughs> reduction, and also seeing as someone who wants to see us you know, have lower taxes, more, give people more of the chance to keep the benefits of their own hard work. It is encouraging to hear some of the comments from the dispatch box earlier about thinking about this issue of the fact that those in work pay a higher tax rate on their income than those who get their income in other, in other ways. That does make an, encour- an encouraging call. Although I think it would be no surprise to the Treasury bench that they'd also expect me to want to mention the fact that there is, I think, an issue about how we look at the tax allowances going forward, particularly the thresholds for the basic rate of income tax. Uh, certainly, all those employment will, of course, benefit uh, from the national insurance rates being reduced, uh, but certainly in future, I think we need to do, we do need to feel, see it's thought about this, particularly, for example, those who've saved for a small retirement annuity on top of the state pension, uh, with the effects of the triple lock having seen uh, the state pension rise to protect people against some of the impacts that we've seen in things like price rises. Again, how that will be considered going forward. But it would be remiss not to say about a couple of things that I was uh, fairly pleased to see. And the first one is the rise in the VAT threshold. You can see the impact of the VAT threshold in Torbay fairly clearly. It's the guest house that closes when it's getting close to the threshold. It's the restaurant that put, put, literally puts online uh, what day it's going to open each year uh, based on its estimate of when it will hit the threshold through the, tra- through the trading year. That literally is instant growth for the hospitality sector in the Bay around having that threshold raised. I'd also say it's welcome to hear about things like the tax relief on performing arts and theatres being made permanent. Again, I notice the Ambassador Theatre Group, which is the owner of the largest uh, theatre in Torbay, the Princess, welcoming that going out. And it's also welcome on the, the alcohol uh, duty freeze as well. Again, Torbay has more than its share of hospitality venues that will benefit and be welcoming uh, that change. Alongside the fuel freeze, the duty freeze, again, helping people, helping families with uh, their budgets. I'd also say it is very welcome, the change on short-term let's, uh, Spanish let's taxation. Uh, whilst you know, they, you know, things like Airbnb style accommodation has offered choice into the 
uh, tourism and accommodation market. It's certainly not something we now need to be offering tax breaks uh, for to, enc to encourage even further, of, particularly where we're seeing what were family homes for rent over the long period being converted into holiday accommodation. You know, the Chancellor is right to respond uh, to the calls that have been made to end that particular tax relief. It is not one that was particularly needed. If we are going to give support to the hospitality sector, it is better done uh, via things like targeted business rates, reductions, or via, as I say, rising of the threshold, which will support all small businesses, not just small businesses of a particular type in the sector. You know, again, I see this budget in the context of this, the large support being offered uh, to Torbay's uh, regeneration. We've got over £100 million has been made available by the government to support schemes ranging from the paint and picture houses revival uh, to supporting the Torquay Pavilion uh, to the regeneration of the town centre. But I think the one thing I would end on mindful of, Mr Deputy Speaker's uh, guidance around uh, time length of speeches is the issue of planning. Now, bringing this up is not about looking to concrete over Greenbelt or other areas, but it is the fact that we do need to reshape our town centres for the future. In many ways, we need to have the type of reshaping of our town centres in the digital age that we had in the late 1940s and early 50s for the mass motoring age, when our towns and cities had to move away from being mostly having horse and carts on the street uh, to having motor vehicles. Now they need to reshape. And the process does take too long. Even schemes that have got wide public support, that have got government funding behind them, can take months to get through the planning process. I think that is an issue that we do need to look at again around stimulating growth and greater prosperity. But overall, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a budget that will make a positive difference in Torbay. I like the way it's setting a direction towards looking to lower taxes as we can and setting out the clear difference between ourselves wanting to give people the opportunity to keep more of what they earn, to aspire for them and their family, and a party opposite without a plan. Rachel Maslin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member from Torbay as a tourist destination much like York, the hospitality and tourism sector certainly faces its challenges, and I look forward to studying the proposals from government. But this clearly has been the last budget from this Parliament and after today, this government. Fourteen years, and the Tories are leaving the country with record debt, public services are on their knees, and households are floundering with the cost of living, high rents and mortgages, utility food and fuel bills up. And yet, rather than repairing the economy, now in recession, the Chancellor has forgotten how his predecessor crashed the economy, left the nation's pensions hours away from collapse, and how it will take a generation to recover. Households now £870 worse off under the Prime Minister's tax plans. And while extending the housing support fund, something I have campaigned long for by just six months, we know that so many families in our constituents are, are hanging by a thread. And of course, Britain shouldn't need such measures as such a rich country in the world. But when so many people have so much, we see how entrenched inequality is. The very safety net, which should keep people safe, has been slashed and people are falling through. And nearly four million people are living in absolute destitution. With one million on universal credit requiring the, the budgeting advance loans, as the Chancellor said, we hear what the Joseph Rowntree Foundation is saying. Their research showing that soci social security is simply not enough for the essentials. They need to pay, be paid at least £120 a week for a single person, £200 for a couple. Scope has said disabled people fare even worse and need an additional £12 a week to keep themselves afloat. And of course, the child. Uh, policy, the cap which has been put in place where you can only um, get the support for two children has meant that children are left in poverty too and it should be scrapped. Nothing for local government and that will be ringing in the ears of councillors up and down the land. The LGA is saying one in five are facing bankruptcy. Since 2015 the City of York Council has seen 53% in real terms cut from its settlement, national government stripping local government. And where is the housing we need, not least the social housing? And why are people still waiting to see an NHS doctor or an NHS dentist? And why are people left languishing on the wards of our hospitals, 
because they can't get the social care because they're not paid enough to do the job. Crime is up, justice system dysfunctional, our schools are squeezing their budgets and our youth services more or less disappeared 87% in York. And the answer is that this government has squandered 14 years. Such consequences are stark when I turn to the world's poorest of running a poor economy. We think about those right now in Darfur and in Gaza, where there is no food, no medicine and no hope. Failed economics means overseas development aid has been slashed and people are left hungry and sick. And this is why we can't afford this government. But don't get me wrong, there are some people doing incredibly well. They have profited out of dodgy PPE contracts and dodge tax altogether. And now that the Prime Minister is planning his exit from Parliament, and no doubt Britain as well, he is reforming the non-DOM scheme, which he has personally benefited from. And after 14 years of virtually no productivity and bouts of recession, economic volatility, and working people's hard-earned taxes gambled and burned, this budget has proven that this government have failed to put party people above party. It's going to be tough for Labour. Our inheritance has been squandered, but Labour will stabilise, invest and reform the economy. We must be building with fundamental Labour values that determine economic competence and stability and address the scourge of inequality. Investing in future industries and jobs, in our innovations, entrepreneurs, science and technology, not least on climate mitigation, with the great British energy decarbonisating the, the, the grid, doubling onshore wind, tripling solar panel and quadrupling offshore wind, bringing down energy bills so all can benefit. But I have to say I was greatly disappointed that York and North Yorkshire's Green New Deal did not get a mention today and it has the opportunity to create 4,000 green collar jobs. Bio Yorkshire will be a game changer for our region and for the climate. And therefore, we need to ensure that we elect Labour's first mayor for York and North Yorkshire in May, David Scaife, because I know that he will bring that project to life. But as we reform, we need to bring about change. We need to build the houses that are the next generation need and this generation are desperately crying out for. We need to retrofit millions more to secure the green homes for the future. There are a few things I do want to say I welcome in the announcement today. The funding for the National Rail Museum as it expands as the world's largest rail museum. And I do encourage you to come and visit as it opens its new doors. I do welcome the changes to taxation on short-term holiday lets following my campaign and private members' bill to stop landlords flipping their homes, but to use those reforms as well to ensure that we, we have the housing we need has not come forward. I'm really disappointed that government are going to give grandfathering rights to existing properties, meaning that 2,000 family homes in York will not be returned or have that opportunity of being returned to families that desperately need them. And I am interested in what the government had to say about the 3.4 billion investment in the NHS after the select committee's report around digital transformation. And I look forward to scrutinising the plans. As we celebrate International Women's Work Week, I must highlight that women are always losers under Tory budgets. With childcare costs rising and social care collapsing, ever that burden falls onto women. And therefore, we need to see change. And as our first Chancellor in the new government will be a woman Chancellor, I would really encourage her to introduce gender budgeting so that every decision is stress test to ensure that women are levelled. And with fiscal policies, political choices and administrative procedures addressing gender equality, the economic output of women is recognised and equality is achieved. We get better economic stability, better growth and greater productivity gains. It's working elsewhere and I want to see that introduced into the next Parliament too. Today there will be headlines. Tomorrow reality will hit. But we won't forget these last 14 years. With the general election on the horizon and the, poorer, and the prospect of an economic reset with Labour, 
we must move forward with Labour's values that we've held for 124 years and use our common purpose for the common good. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'm delighted to follow um, the Honourable Member for York Central. She speaks with such passion so often on issues of poverty and need, and I very much enjoyed myself my visits over the years to the York Railway Museum. So I will certainly be taking up her invitation to visit in its new renewed state in due course. Um, there is much to welcome in today's budget, cutting taxes for working people who are both employed and self-employed, Progress on tackling inflation, which makes such a difference to everyday life and costs. The fuel duty provisions, which are so important to motorists in areas like my area of Dover and Deal, and so different to those attacks on motorists that we've seen from Labour's London Mayor. The Household Support Fund does provide opportunities and support in Kent and in Dover and Deal to so many people, and I welcome that extension. The VAT threshold for small businesses, the increase to 90 is very important. A number of local businesses have been in contact with me about that particular provision, and I know that will be very important to hospitality businesses in our area. And finally, the focus on better health care. Outcomes as well as investment both are welcome. However, this could and should have been a budget for housing, and that opportunity has been missed. I think there has been a misanalysis in the Treasury about the fundamental importance of housing to achieving the other objectives, those in well-being and health and educational opportunities, in the creation of savings and individual wealth over a lifetime. And to put that in context, by not having the housing that is needed, there has been a 23% increase in bed and breakfast housing, a 12% increase in the number of children in temporary accommodation, a huge number of the under 40s who are struggling to get on the housing ladder while paying record levels of rent. And this all costs the taxpayer money. £1.7 billion for local councils in temporary accommodation. And we see in this budget a rise to £36 billion in the housing benefit budget in the years 24-25. It is bad money to be continually spending on high expenditure private rented housing instead of on affordable and social housing. That's what should and could have been done in this budget. And the reason that that matters so much is because England has fewer available homes in its population than any other comparable developed nation, the lowest rate of available properties per population than all OECD countries, the oldest housing stock, and one of the highest proportions of substandard and inadequate housing. Housing could and should have been a priority for this budget. A budget for housing could have seen an acceleration of affordable housing delivery of 100,000 homes over the next 18 to 24 months. It could have provided a much needed boost to GDP of 15 to 17 billion pounds for each 100,000 new homes that are delivered. And if we put that in the context of the Chancellor speaking today about some of that inward investment and put in context the value to GDP of house building, it underlines what an important industry this is. We could have seen an opening up of pensions to support first-time buyers get on the housing ladder while still saving over the long term for their pensions. That would transform home ownership opportunities for the under 40s and put it back within reach of working people who are 30 or under. And so much more besides. Instead, this has been a missed opportunity for housing. In the time available, I would like to just raise two specific issues that are in the detailed budget papers. The first is the provision for an SDRT exemption on social housing. This is in the papers only available for housing which is subject to public subsidy. But a large amount, indeed the majority, of additional affordable housing is of course provided through Section 106 and other planning requirements and is not the recipient of public subsidy. Indeed, that is the expectation of Homes England and the GLA. 
So I would ask the Minister if he could relook at those provisions around SDLT to make sure that they reflect a level playing field for all registered housing providers operating in the sector and also reflect the realities of the housing market. The second is that unleashing pension fund investment has been a long-term goal in the housing industries. It is an area where tremendous progress has been made in recent years, yet there's so much more that can be done. So I would ask the Minister to consider making housing part of the essential infrastructure provision that is provided within the new unlocking of the pension funds, and consider how the new UK ISA could be better applied, again, to help people get on the housing ladder. Housing and house building are fundamental to the success of our country, the well-being of our nation, the prosperity of individuals, and they are therefore important to us all. I regret that this hasn't been properly reflected in the budget, but I hope that I may meet with uh, my right honourable friend, uh, the Minister, so that we can continue these discussions and see what can be done with the money that is available to build the homes that our country so desperately needs. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In the, uh, his budget statement, the uh, Chancellor said, in recent times, the UK economy has dealt with a financial crisis, a pandemic, and energy shocks caused by, uh, by war in Europe. And like today, uh, on the benches opposite, he completely airbrushed out of history two of the self-inflicted wounds of the uh, Conservative government, one being Brexit, and if you look at the OBR report uh, today on page 38, it says that 15% uh, trade is down with Europe, costing the economy 4%, and that long-term effects will not be known for 15 years. The other one airbrushed conveniently out of history, and I I'm surprised the, the Chancellor forgot this, because it's how he got his job in the first place, uh, was the mini-budget by the Right Honourable Member uh, for uh, Norfolk North West. Uh, and that we're still paying for in people's mortgages. Although she's gone off now to pastures new, uh, converted and surrounded by an audience of conspiracy theorists and right-wing extremists, uh, the core of what she's arguing, though, is still on display today. And that's about a small state, and it's about uh, a small state and a society which means that our public services are not going to be invested in by this government. We've had 14 years of this. In the North East, real-term uh, medium uh, wages are now 7% below what they were in uh, 2008. In my own constituency, 24.7% of children live in relative poverty. And what is absolutely disgraceful and makes me angry is that in the sixth most uh, prosperous country in the world, in County Durham in the last 10 years, life expectancy is going down, while suicide rates are now at a record high in the North East. Now, that has not happened by accident. Now, the government make great pledge about they've actually got uh, you know, more police officers on the beat. We have, well, actually, 135 less now, even with the increases, uh, the extra expense that we did had in 2010. And as for the joke, which it is, of levelling up, uh, which is the uh, equivalent of pork barrel politics at its worst, mainly focused on uh, the distribution of capital sums uh, not joined up to different parts of uh, the country where the party in power can get uh, political capital out of. We have had one uh, bid, successful bid, in, uh, in County Durham. It happened to be in Bishop Portland. It's got us half a bypass. Um, at the same time, the Chancellor today announced that he was uh, announcing the £100 million uh, new, uh, you know, devolution deal for the North East. Well, if I tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, Durham County Council alone in the last 14 years has had to cut £260 million out of its budget. Every single council in the North East has lost upwards of 30% of uh, its uh, budget. So the idea that 
uh, this money will somehow replace what has been lost is not the case. And what we're seeing in today's budget, and if you look at the uh, Red Book, on every single department, every single uh, non-mainline um, department, is stagnation uh, or even cuts. So, you know, one, uh, for example, in defence, the actual budget, both capital and revenue, goes down next year. In education, it flatlines. And the idea that the uh, Chancellor announced today, the 1% uh, increase, well, that's basically a cut in our uh, public services. And that's not an accident, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. That is a fact of life. What we have here, and I don't know if it's because the Chancellor and the uh, Prime Minister are so scared uh, of uh, the uh, uh, right-wing faction on his, in his own party, but what it's about, it's about squeezing the, um, squeezing the uh, state. It's about making sure uh, that you give away tax cuts, even though you're creating problems you've created your own, by your own economic and wasteful mismanagement over the last 14 years. Um, and that's going to lead to dire cuts. Local government is one which I feel strongly about, because councils are going to fall over, it's quite clear. Uh, they're not, and what, what we've got, we've got the government saying, well, the reason why they've fallen over is because they're being wasteful and some, quite rightly, have done some very dodgy things in property, even though they were actually encouraged to do so by the uh, government when in power. And people say, well, why is it, for example, that Durham County Council, whose six pence of budget now is spent on looked after children and uh, old, older people's care? Well, that's because. In part of austerity, we had the cutbacks in children's services, closure of sure start centres. So, you know, lo and behold, genius, it's not a, it doesn't make a, a great genius to work out that if you actually take away support for those families, you're going to get more into uh, the care system. And what's that doing? It's putting huge pressures on those uh, budgets, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. At the same time, the government are offloading their responsibilities onto local council uh, taxpayers. Can I just finish by raising uh, two issues which uh, I feel very strongly about? And I think it's about kicking the can down the road. And I think the government, frankly, are a disgrace. Many people will know that I've uh, been involved in the campaign for uh, sub-postmasters uh, uh, for many years. And, you know, credit to the minister, the member uh, for Malton, Thurston Moulton, who's been a very good minister trying to get compensation out there. But I do note on page 77 of the OBR's uh, uh, report, there's no extra money being put in for the budget for the new schemes. And scandalously, which I agree with my right honourable friend for uh, Hull North, that no money has been allocated for the contaminated blood uh, uh, victims either. Now that is cynical. That is about uh, just kicking this into the, into the election, hoping somebody else is going to... The government have a moral duty to both those people and need to have put uh, money aside for that. So this budget is a missed opportunity, but it's more of the same. And unless we get a situation where people wake up in this country to recognise that if you want well-delivered uh, uh, local, local services, if you want well-structured uh, communities that are supportive, which have come to be, a, you can't do it with this government. Uh, until we get that election and people wake up to the facts that we're all going to have more of the same is that 14 years are going to continue and the only way that's going to change is by having a Labour government. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. This budget was overshadowed by the news that the Chancellor had done a, really, a, a fairly rare thing for a politician. He'd put his hand into his own pocket. Was this for a youth club in Hounslow or perhaps a new high-tech hospital scanner? No, it was for his own party association. Meanwhile, my constituents have to live with yet another budget from yet another tired Conservative government. After 14 years of, of their government, our economy is in recession. Living standards are falling, public services are in crisis and our country is desperate for change. 22 fiscal statements since 2014 that promised higher wages, promised higher skills and promised higher growth and yet delivered none of these. And today another statement promising dollops of jam next year at the earliest. My constituents are seeing, like all of our constituents, 
Their bills rise, their weekly shop more expensive, their rents and mortgages skyrocket and their debts pile up. So what does this budget offer them? The OBR figures show that under Sunak's tax plan, working people are on average £870 a year worse off. The government has given 5p for every 10p taken away from our constituents. This included the OBR's revised estimate of the impact of tax, of tax threshold freezes that raised 30, 41 billion over the forecast period and create 3.7 million more taxpayers. It does nothing, this budget, to tackle the housing crisis. As many members have said, the biggest crisis that's facing my constituents. Families locally cannot afford to rent, let alone buy, key workers being priced out of the area and home ownership but a distant dream. And hundreds of children in my constituency, I want to say living, but frankly they're existing in insecure, often dangerous, temporary accommodation, costing Hounslow Council and the benefits budget millions of pounds each year, money that could be spent on building new homes. It's no wonder that more and more lifelong Conservatives I've met in recent months, whether in Chiswick or in by-election campaigns in Bedfordshire or Kingswood, who've told me that they're no longer voting for the party opposite. And it's probably why I was seeing so many glum faces on the benches opposite while the Chancellor was speaking. And now followed, as this is the end of today's debate, followed by, and I've listened to so many of the, the party opposite, uh, criticising his statement in their contributions, including the member for Dover who's just spoken. Talk about a divided party. My, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this budget fails to deliver not only for uh, working families uh, and uh, people seeking accommodation, but it fails to deliver for businesses. I think of the businesses I've met across Hounslow. Pubs struggling with soaring energy costs, corner shops facing a crime spree, manufacturers and exporters facing barriers in trading with Europe. This budget offers virtually nothing for them nothing on business rates, nothing on improving trade and nothing on skills. Mr Deputy Speaker, my constituents, taxpayers and users of public services as they, as they are, they would assume the Treasury understands basic economic concepts, such as that higher taxes for them means more money for the Treasury and public services. But today the Chancellor joked about coming late to discovering his inner Laffer curve, which means that sometimes raising some taxes actually results in less tax revenue. So is it because he's discovered the Laffer curve? What, is this why the Chancellor is cancelling the alcohol duty rise due next year? As he's been told, he's lost a couple of billion uh, pounds of uh, tax revenue since last year's rise a couple of billion that our public services so desperately need. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is basic stuff, basic economics. It's even covered in the GCSE level economics syllabus. So in conclusion, my constituents from Chiswick to Hounslow deserve better than this budget today. The growing economic mess is what happens when a government that is obsessed with headlines, obsessed with a short term win and obsessed with focusing on the politics rather than on the long-term investment that our economy needs. It's no wonder that we're trapped in recession, trapped with low growth, trapped with decimated public services and trapped with a weak economy. The tax burden on our constituents higher, the weekly shop higher, rent, mortgages and energy costs higher, most people worse off. After 14 years of Conservative rule, it's clear my constituents and people across the country deserve better. It's time for change. <coughs> I beg to move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. Does many of that opinion say aye? Aye. Contrary, no. Ayes have it. The debate be resumed what day? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Motion number two on estimates, liaison committee recommendation, minister to move. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order paper, as many of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. <laughs>